test NC.
you need to
We have a very good friend in common. Well, I'm sorry. I'm very good friend. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, but the micro, he has to start my micro. Is it working already? Dear participants, we are about to start. May I kindly ask you to take your seat? Dear Minister Tansen, dear Chief European Prosecutor Kordu Takeleshi, dear Prosecutor Generals, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in the room and following us online. As Dean of the Faculty of Law, Economics and Finance, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you on occasion of the conference, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, one year in action towards resolving complexity and bringing added value. I am welcoming you today, not only my capacity as Dean of the Faculty, but probably even more particularly as professor of European and international criminal law and also an organizer, or better to say co-organizer, of this conference. This conference is the annual conference of the European Criminal Law Academic Network, the ECLAN Network, that we have the honor to co-organize together with the European Public Prosecutor's Office. I would like to thank to all colleagues at the EPPO and the University of Luxembourg who helped in setting up our event, in particular uh, to Ms. Tina Holwold at the EPPO and to my assistant, Mr. Panayotis Konstantinidis, who coordinated the work respectively at the two institutions. I would also like to express my gratitude to Minister Tansen, Minister of Justice of Luxembourg, for having accepted to give the opening remarks today and to Chief European Public Prosecutor Kordu Takovashi for the opening lecture tomorrow. And finally, last but not least, it's very important, I thank to the EPPO for the very generous organizational and financial support that they gave uh, to this uh, conference, and this allows us to be at this fantastic, prestigious venue today and tomorrow. Before I start with some introductory remarks, I would like to give some technical advices. This event is streamed and it is also recorded uh, at the EPPO's YouTube channel. So those of you who cannot follow the entire event today or tomorrow will have a chance uh, to look at uh, the YouTube channel of the EPPO if you wish so. You have a microphone in, uh, in your tables. Please be careful to switch off the microphone. It, it is now switched off. It will be activated for the Q&A section. Normally, if you push the button, it goes green. And once it's authorized for use, it goes red. So don't be disturbed by it's red. When it's red, it means that it's on. So it goes from green, red, and off. Our conference is a scientific event, two days to celebrate the first anniversary of this new European judicial body. The conference program will allow us to focus our reflections and discussions on pertaining issues to the operations and the impact of the EPPO. We all know that it took nearly 25 years of continuous work of the European Commission to set up this new judicial body. Some 25 years ago, when Professor Delma Smarty started her introduction to the Corpus Juris, she acclaimed, a poor simova, and yet it moves. Her enthusiasm was for the possibility of restructuring judicial cooperation in the EU upon a harmonized set of material, substantive, and procedural criminal law rules, 
and thereby rendering tangible the concept of an espace judiciaire européen. Indeed, the Corpus Juris was visionary and certainly ahead of its time, proclaiming the principle of European territoriality, a concept in which the national territories of the member state constituted a single legal area accompanied by uniform laws and a specialized central enforcement system, the European Public Prosecutor. The paradigm change it represented by moving away from traditional, horizontal, intergovernmental, cooperative systems towards vertical integration fueled a lot of resistance among the member states. These fears related to giving up, or rather sharing enforcement powers in the criminal justice domain were still very tangible during the negotiations of the EPPO regulation and considerably influenced the final outcome. In today's introduction, I would like to pick up in particular three aspects of the scholarly and the policy debate and put it in context of the first year of operations of the EPPO. These three aspects are the necessity, the complexity of the regulatory framework, and the impact of it on the criminal justice systems. I start by the first element, necessity of the EPPO. A very prominent argument 25, in the past 25 years of this question questioned the need for the European Public Prosecutor's Office, or even more fundamentally, the problem whether there is a true problem of detecting, investigating, and prosecuting EU fraud. Through the administrative investigations of OLAF, there was certainly awareness and also evidence of the problem of prosecuting EU fraud and also other offenses to the detriment of the EU budget. But it was actually very difficult to put reliable numbers to measure the size of the problem. The impact assessment of the study which preceded setting up the EPPO regulation gave certain estimates. In light of the first year of operation of the EPPO, we know today that all past estimates were actually modest. The first, years, the first activity report of the EPPO states, and I quote, in the first seven months of operations, the EPPO processed 2,832 crime reports and opened 576 investigations. By the year's end, the EPPO had 515 active investigations for an overall estimated damage close to 5.4 billion euros." Unquote. These first statistics coming from the EPPO leave no doubt that the Commission was right that the problem of detection and prosecution of EU fraud is both real and considerable. One reason that made it difficult from the very beginning to measure the size of EU fraud relates to the uneven detection of these kinds of offenses in the member states. This unevenness in the detection is still a very much existing problem, and we see it documented in the report of the EPPO. Increasing the level of detection of EU fraud is quintessential for improving the level of protection of the financial interests of the European Union. This topic is of key relevance for the EPPO and for the success, actually, of the entire project and for the success of the protection of the EU budget. As this is, and this is why we will dedicate all our discussions of the second day of the conference to this topic, how to improve the detection of EU fraud in the member states. The second element of the scholarly and policy debate that I would like to recall today relates to the structure and the procedural framework of the EPPO and its complexity. The EPPO has been envisioned from the very beginning to be an independent prosecution service having a central office and decentralized delegated prosecutors in the member states. Also, the procedural framework as set out by Article 6, Article 86 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union envisaged from the very beginning a hybrid structure containing both European and national rules. 
So it was clear throughout the discussion that both the structure and the legal framework of the EPPO will rely on a certain mix of European elements and national ones, European and national laws. It was conceivable to imagine different degrees of unification or harmonization of the pretrial procedure, as well as different degrees of centralization of the EPPO structure. And of course, the debate was about the level of harmonization and the level of centralization. The EPPO regulation as the final outcome of the discussion has been received by the large majority of scholars and a good number of practitioners as well as complex both complex in terms of structure as well as procedural framework. At a recent conference, one of the colleagues from the EPPO commented that complexity does not necessarily mean that it's complicated. Although the first year of operations of the EPPO seemed to actually prove that statement, much of the legal framework and the structures has been put in operation and is functional successfully many challenges remain. And today's conference is an opportunity to look into these challenges and to discuss potential avenues of improvement. We shall start the first panel by examining the multi-level regulatory framework of the Apple and how the different layers of EU law, national law, and soft law work together in reality and shape prosecutorial independence and accountability. The second panel will continue these reflections by looking more concretely into the operations of the EPPO and how this multi-level regulatory framework impacts efficiency of investigations and prosecutions. Even if much of the complexity has been successfully put into operation, we already know that improvements are being discussed and amendments are being reflected and considered. Finally, the third panel will show that this multi-level regulatory framework, complex or not, complicated or not, is certainly incomplete. The EPPO has to establish its relations with third countries and non-participating member states, and this necessitates an additional set of rules in forms of mutual legal assistance treaties, as well as working arrangements with non-participating member states. Uh, these three panels of the conference will allow us to deepen our understanding of the hybrid structure and procedural framework of the EPPO and to better assess the impacts and the complexity stemming from it. The third and final element of the scholarly and policy debate that I would like to recall today relates to the impact of the EPPO on the different participants of the criminal procedure. During the historic reflection, much analysis went into the EPPO's impact on already existing European criminal justice bodies and institutions, most particularly OLAF and Eurojust. Uh, probably a lesser level of discussion at those days uh, were devoted to the impact on national judiciary and the national setting and participants of criminal procedure. We shall examine these relationships in the final panel of our conference. I would like to close my introductory works uh, by thanking to the chairs and the speakers of the, today's conference and tomorrow's conference for having accepted uh, our invitation. My special thanks goes to Minister uh, of Justice uh, Sam Tanson for having accepted to give the opening uh, statement by having the seat of the EPPO in Luxembourg, the standing of Luxembourg as Europe's judicial capital is certainly strengthened. I would like to give the word now to Minister Tanson to give her opening remarks, and I wish to all of the participants a successful discussion today. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madame la Doyenne, Madame la Chef du Parquet européen, Monsieur le Chef adjoint du Parquet européen, Mesdames, Messieurs les professeurs, Mesdames, Messieurs, chers toutes et tous. 
First of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, the University of Luxembourg and especially the Faculty of Law for organizing this conference and for inviting me to be here today. I am quite honored to uh, give this speech um, today dedicated to an institution that is really important uh, for the European Union, but also for Luxembourg. Um, Professor Ligeti just underlined that. Um, if um, we look at it from a historical point of view, it, is, um, it has already been underlined that um, uh, the institution of the Parquet Européen uh, was quite a way that uh, has been done. Um, il y a bien plus de 20 ans, le Conseil européen de Tampere, en 1999, a décidé de renforcer la reconnaissance mutuelle des décisions judiciaires et des jugements et le rapprochement des législations afin de faciliter la coopération judiciaire dans l'Union européenne. L'une des conclusions au centre des décisions de Tampere était que l'objectif de lutter contre certaines formes de criminalité ne peut être traité uniquement au niveau national, en raison de la nature transfrontalière de ces formes de criminalité et de la nécessité d'une réponse coordonnée et pourrait éventuellement être mieux réalisée au niveau de l'Union européenne. La réalisation du projet qui est le parquet européen réalisation d'un projet de grande envergure a impliqué évidemment un aspect fondamental de la souveraineté nationale, euh, qu'elle soit transférée à une autorité européenne, et c'est précisément ce qui a rendu le processus de négociation, négociation au Conseil entre 2013 et 2017 extrêmement difficile, vous l'avez déjà souligné. Le règlement d'IEPO est finalement entré en vigueur le 12 octobre 2017, et vous le savez, il y a un an, en date du 1er juin 2021, le parquet européen a pu débuter ses opérations fonctionnelles en réunissant pour l'instant 22 États membres. Ces 20 derniers mois, le parquet européen a notablement avancé en ce qui concerne la constitution du Collège du parquet européen, le réaménagement des locaux et la mise en place de l'Office central, les négociations budgétaires, la nomination de procureurs européens délégués et les adaptations législatives dans les États membres participants. Nous avons sans aucun doute franchi une étape fondamentale et historique dans l'intégration de l'espace judiciaire européen, car le parquet européen est un organe de l'Union européenne d'un genre nouveau, adoptant une approche inédite dans la lutte contre la criminalité transfrontalière. La création de l'EPO génère en même temps de multiples attentes, allant d'un lancement plus rapide des enquêtes à une stratégie anti-fraude appliquée de manière plus cohérente au sein des États membres, en passant par un signalement en temps utile des comportements criminels et une meilleure conduite des enquêtes transfrontalières. Cela est évidemment extrêmement complexe et je suis consciente que le travail de l'EPO est constamment évalué et réévalué notamment par rapport à sa mission qui consiste à rechercher, à poursuivre et à renvoyer en jugement les auteurs d'infractions portant atteinte aux intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne. En même temps, les premiers pas opérationnels du parquet européen commencent à porter leurs fruits et sont plus qu'encourageants. Les récents renforcements budgétaires décidés en conciliation budgétaire sont importants pour que le parquet européen puisse assumer de manière efficace sa charge de travail. Je suis également consciente que la détection de la fraude au préjudice des intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne reste un sujet d'actualité. Tout débat en vue du renforcement des moyens permettant à atteindre ce but est utile et même nécessaire. Je suis en même temps confiante que la continuation des opérations de l'an futur de ce nouvel organe au niveau central et dans les différents États membres va de pair avec une croissance de la visibilité, de l'acceptation et de l'efficacité du parquet européen. Les chiffres résultant du premier rapport annuel, le professeur Ligeti en a déjà cité quelques-uns, celui de l'année 2021, sont déjà très prometteurs et euh, lorsque j'ai discuté tout à l'heure avec la chef du parquet européen, elle m'a confirmé que cette évolution se traduisait encore davantage pour les chiffres de l'année en cours et que notamment on est entre-temps à cinq fois le budget réel de l'EPO qui a été saisi. 
Ces chiffres montrent que les opérations depuis le mois de juin de l'année dernière sont fructueuses. En notre double capacité d'État participant et d'État hôte, nous allons continuer à soutenir pleinement ce nouvel organe, également dans le cadre des discussions qui ont été lancées maintenant pour justement recadrer peut-être certains problèmes ou améliorer la réglementation à la base. Alors que la détection de la fraude au préjudice des intérêts financiers de l'Union européenne reste justement un sujet d'actualité, je tiens à souligner que ce nouvel organe doit pouvoir continuer à travailler en toute indépendance. En guise de conclusion, je tiens encore à remercier et à féliciter vivement Madame la doyenne et tous les intervenants qui sont sans aucun doute un enrichissement inédit dans ce débat de haute qualité, entièrement dédié à un organe digne de l'architecture judiciaire de l'Union européenne du XXIe siècle. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Thank you very much, Katalin. Um, good morning to all of you. Uh, I eventually found uh, in the, the button that I, I had to press. Uh, it's a good start uh, for the day. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to see uh, many familiar famous faces uh, in this uh, temple of uh, European democracy. Uh, I think it's the old house of uh, the European Parliament here in Luxembourg. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and it's, it feels like a family uh, reunion a little bit, uh, with many fathers and mothers and sons of the EPPO uh, around. Uh, so it's really gr great to see uh, all of you. Uh, um, <clears throat> last week I was in, in Provence, I, mu I must admit, and I read a book by Peter Mayle uh, called One Year in Provence, uh, in which he describes uh, uh, the difficult uh, restoration of an old uh, stone house. Uh, it took uh, a year for them, uh, and well, it reminded me of, of uh, today's uh, title, which is one year of EPO uh, since it became operational. Uh, although this is not a restoration, this is building something new. Uh, it has indeed a very long history, uh, as uh, um, uh, you have reminded us, uh, uh, Katalin, and uh, um, Minister Tanson. Uh, so it's really good to see all of you. Uh, uh, good to see uh, the European Chief Prosecutor uh, in front of me uh, uh, and the Deputy European Chief Prosecutor and the prosecutors of the EPPO uh, in the ranks of this, uh, uh, of this House. Uh, it's very impressive uh, uh, for me to sit uh, uh, in front of you and to see uh, uh, the reality of the EPPO uh, after so many years. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, we all had uh, our inspirations uh, for uh, the EPPO, uh, including by Madame Delmas Marti. Uh, and I'm a student, student of hers, uh, and I'm very proud that this uh, EPPO body now exists uh, after uh, more than 30 years in the making. Uh, and indeed, it was seven years ago that the Commission submitted a proposal uh, uh, to uh, the Council. <coughs> and only to the Council, uh, because it's a Council regulation. Uh, um, and we needed the consent of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, some of us uh, had participated in the, uh, in the elaboration of that, uh, of that draft. It was a genuine adventure uh, for all of us uh, to uh, uh, construct something uh, uh, quite revolutionary uh, in this European uh, judicial area. Uh, that I think Valéry Giscard d'Estaing had uh, coined in the 1970s already uh, as a concept, uh, and it really took a long time uh, to, to become reality. Uh, and indeed, the text uh, uh, is what it is, uh, and I'm sure one day uh, we will improve it. Uh, but I think it was quite an achievement uh, at the time uh, when we finalized uh, negotiations after four years. Uh, so uh, um, I think it's, it's really great to celebrate. Um, uh, that uh, we have the EPPO and we have it now uh, not only in the books uh, but also uh, in reality. Uh, and uh, as you reminded us, uh, the, uh, uh, the annual report of the EPPO shows the uh, progress uh, that has been made uh, since uh, June 1st last year. It shows uh, the tremendous activity uh, of this uh, new body, uh, uh, which is supranational uh, by nature. I think we should uh, not shy away from uh, using that word. Uh, in the sense that uh, 
uh, it is able to uh, oversee what's happening in the 22 uh, European member states that uh, uh, compose the APPO, uh, and uh, let's hope that others will join soon. Uh, they are the weak links uh, uh, in the chain, uh, and we have great hopes that uh, Sweden will join uh, soon. Uh, but until then, uh, uh, we certainly in the Commission will encourage uh, and keep uh, pushing those member states which are not yet a part of the EPPO. Uh, so this is um, a panel that will discuss the multi-level regulatory complexity. We have uh, roughly uh, um, 70 minutes, uh, so uh, we'll have uh, three distinguished speakers uh, at that uh, table. Uh, uh, each will speak about 20 minutes, and uh, perhaps we'll have a bit of time at the end uh, for uh, questions. Uh, I'm sure all of you know uh, the uh, panelists, but I will introduce them uh, briefly. Um, uh, I will start with uh, Mr. Pasquale uh, Fimiani, uh, who is sitting at the far right uh, of the table. Uh, good morning. Uh, he's a member of the judiciary uh, since 1986 uh, as a public prosecutor. Uh, and the Deputy Prosecutor General at the Court of Cassation since 2011, uh, and Advocate General uh, of that Court of Cassation as well. Uh, and he is the head of division taking decisions on the EPPO as national authority according to the Eurojust, um, uh, so according to the EPPO regulation. Uh, uh, he teaches at several universities uh, and has written uh, on economic, uh, criminal law, and environmental law matters. Uh, and, uh, um, on that question, he's also a member of the ANPE network, uh, with which I'm quite familiar nowadays, uh, which is the European network on uh, prosecutors for environmental uh, matters, uh, since we have worked with ANPE uh, in the uh, uh, redrafting of the Directive on Environmental Crimes uh, recently, um, and still in discussion in uh, Council and in Parliament now as well. So Mr. Fimiani uh, um, uh, on the right hand, and then next to him, uh, Luca De Matteis, who is the uh, acting uh, head of legal service of the EPPO since 2020, uh, since the beginning, uh, uh, um, and worked as a judge uh, from 1999 to 2009. Uh, he was a second national expert uh, in uh, Brussels at the uh, uh, General Secretariat of the Council uh, from 2009 uh, to 2012. Uh, worked with our common friend Hans Nielsen uh, for a few years. Uh, and has uh, fond memories, uh, much as uh, I do, uh, about those, those times. Uh, and then uh, Luca worked in the Ministry of Justice for uh, uh, a year uh, before uh, coming back to Brussels as Justice Councillor for Criminal Matters, uh, and in that capacity, uh, between 2014 and 17, uh, um, he uh, uh, helped us uh, in the Council with uh, many things, including with the EPPO, uh, uh, and then uh, he switched uh, to the OLAF side, uh, and then uh, he, became, he became a team leader uh, for EPP related matters. Uh, and then we sat at the same, type, same uh, side of the table for negotiating the EPP regulation for a few years uh, together. Um, um, so Luca is really a, a brother in arms uh, <laughs> uh, from the past. Uh, and on my left hand side, uh, uh, professor Andre Klipp, um, uh, who is a full professor at the University of Maastricht, professor of criminal law, criminal procedure law, and professor of transnational aspects of criminal law, uh, all these three matters uh, in one. Uh, <laughs> uh, he is a member of the Academy of Sciences in the Netherlands um, uh, since 2016. Uh, all this is fresh information from uh, uh, Google. Uh, and a member of the scientific committee uh, of the International Association of Penal Law. Uh, uh, and uh, Andre, you are the author, well-known author of uh, many books, including the annotated uh, leading cases of international uh, criminal tribunals, uh, um, and uh, which I am very fond of nowadays, since uh, I spend uh, with my colleagues more time on repo than EPPO nowadays. Repo stands for Russian elites. Uh, proxies and oligarchs, uh, and uh, <laughs> in the last uh, 10 weeks, uh, uh, much of our life is dedicated to, uh, to war crimes uh, and uh, ensuring sanctions are implemented in our member states. Uh, coming back to Andre, uh, he is uh, also the author of a very good uh, handbook on European criminal law, which I always recommend to my students, uh, and he's also a sitting judge uh, uh, at the Court of Appeal uh, in Hertogenbosch. 
I'm, tr I'm trying my best. Huh? <laughs> so you will hear uh, um, in the following order presentations. Uh, so first, Luca uh, on the EPPO's legislative framework, navigating through EU law, national law, and soft law, uh, and that really describes the complexity uh, uh, of the EPPO. Uh, then. Uh, uh, Mr. Pasquale Fimiani uh, will speak about prosecutorial independence and accountability. Uh, and then uh, Professor Clip uh, will speak about national enforcement, uh, the arm of supranational prosecutors, and comparison between the EPPO and the ICC Office of the Prosecutor. Luca, you, would, you have the first floor. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning to all. Um, I must say that I learned this morning with great pleasure from uh, Professor Ligeti that uh, somebody at the EPO described complexity as being complex but not difficult. It may be time to have a chat, perhaps, uh, because uh, the difficulty of it all is quite apparent to me and is something that uh, makes this job challenging and, and, and quite wonderful, I have to say. Complexity is a bit uh, what uh, I would like to um, uh, offer a few questions on this morning. Uh, I have 20 minutes at my disposal in which, as I think should be always the case, as a lawyer you should have more questions uh, together, uh, try to find an answer rather than um, trying to explain things uh, which stands uh, to uh, be proven wrong by the test of time, for sure. Um, Speaking about the complexity of the EPO legal environment, uh, I think it was clear from the beginning that uh, the piece of legislation that we had to deal with, so the rough matter that was at the beginning of, of this adventure, was in itself already something quite uh, uh, exceptional. Uh, it is quite well known, probably means uh, very little from a legal point of view, but numerically it is quite impressive that the EPO regulation in a text which is relatively short uh, contains no less than 89, uh, 86 references to uh, national law uh, with several declinations of this term uh, um, between uh, the recitals and the operative part of the text in accordance with national law, under national law, as implemented by national law, etc. So it is already quite extraordinary that a piece of union law that should by its very nature be immediately and uh, applicable and self-contained uh, uh, has uh, to rely to that extent on uh, reference to national law. Uh, the fact that the EPO would have to rely heavily on uh, uh, member states uh, and their cooperation, not only in the um, setting up phase, but also in the operations of the EPO, is uh, witnessed also by the fact that, uh, for example, Article 117 of a funding regulation uh, puts on the member states a rather large burden of notifications uh, to uh, the European institutions, including the EPO, of a number of things which are absolutely indispensable for the EPO to operate, uh, making it clear that uh, uh, these preconditions are left in the hands of the member state, which of course uh, has in itself as all choices, uh, consequences in terms of affecting uh, the EPO's ability to uh, achieve on its own the aims uh, for which it was created. Uh, if this were not enough, uh, all member states that participate in the EPO have adopted laws, statutes of various nature, uh, adapting their legal systems to the coming of the EPO. We cannot call it implementation because implementation of regulation does not exist. However, uh, browsing these uh, uh, various pieces of legislation adopted uh, in the last uh, two, three years by all except one uh, participating member state, um, what is clear is that on the one hand uh, uh, there was the real need to fit uh, the EPO as a new piece in the puzzle of the administration of justice in the participating member states. On the other, there has been the uh, attempt of the member states to um, define in a way uh, perhaps more friendly uh, to what is known to them in terms of their own legal systems what the EPO should and shouldn't do. And uh, from our point of view, at the first analysis of this legislation, it is quite clear that some member states have gone beyond uh, what uh, was in their powers uh, uh, by doing so, uh, by uh, um, adopting national rules which uh, uh, are at odds with the EPO regulation, with uh, a primary law, and, and uh, with uh, the space of discretion that was left for them in this already quite complicated picture. All this we knew from the start. Uh, what we perhaps could not fully envisage was the fact that in the EPA regulation, 
uh, are more or less hidden uh, a number of other uh, uh, nooks and crannies where national law pops up or, or uh, becomes relevant or co is called into question. And I have to say that perhaps the largest portion of our activity uh, in trying to give a meaning to the legal framework under which the EPO has to operate is indeed to uh, uh, identify uh, these uh, uh, situations uh, uh, and to qualify them because the temptation in a regulation which is heavy on reference to national law is that every time there is one such reference or one such reference pops up unexpectedly is to give in and to and to fall back on the old instincts and to say well national law has been doing this uh, so far uh, the epo is new let's just do things uh, the old way and uh, my proposal to you this morning is to uh, discuss that this is not necessarily the best way um, uh, there is a balance to be struck between uh, uh, the remit of the EPO, primarily under uh, uh, the treaties, uh, and uh, the competences of the member states, and that therefore the references uh, to national law expressed or implied in the EPO regulation can be, in a very rough uh, um, uh, Peter, uh, could you give me? Sorry, because I realize that I'm not moving. Voila. And the references in the EPO regulation uh, on uh, to national law in its various forms can be roughly qualified into four different categories. There are those that are indispensable. There are those that, uh, though perhaps not indispensable, are univocal in the sense that they correspond to precise policy choices made by the legislator at the time of the drafting. There are those that are debatable by their nature in the sense that it is a matter of, of, of finding the right balance between uh, the mission of the EPO and, uh, and the competences of the member states in identifying whether or not these references are to be filled with content by union or by national law. And there are those which are downright problematic in that uh, uh, they raise uh, strong concerns in terms of compatibility with uh, primary law and the EPO regulation in terms of conservation of its useful effect. I chose arbitrarily uh, uh, one example for each of these categories. would like to put it to you, uh, hopefully uh, uh, bringing to you, contradicting whatever I have to say and, and discussing this in the length of the day today. Uh, indispensable uh, reference to the material competence of the EPO in Article 22, paragraphs 1 and 2 of the regulation, uh, where, uh, uh, as you very well know, uh, the, the competence of the EPO is defined as the f uh, crimes affecting the financial interests of the Union uh, as provided by uh, the PIF Directive as implemented by national law. Uh, this reference uh, is probably indispensable in that uh, uh, Union law does not contain uh, um, uh, the guarantees uh, that uh, allow to construct a competence uh, to adopt directly applicable uh, provisions establishing criminal offences. So for the establishment of criminal offences that are actionable in court, union law has relied and relies on national law implementing uh, 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 directives. Um, this is uh, confirmed uh, by many things. One of the references that, that I find particularly interesting in this respect is Article 49 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, that in uh, setting the principle of legality as a uh, guiding principle uh, of uh, one of the guiding principles of European criminal law, refers this uh, um, to uh, a criminal offence uh, uh, which did not, uh, sorry, acts or omissions which did not constitute a criminal offence under national law or international law at the time in which it was committed. Uh, the fact that the Charter of Fundamental Rights does not mention union law is in itself quite a telling circumstance. Now there could be a doubt to be explored whether Article 325 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which uh, uh, concerns the fight against uh, uh, fraud affecting the Union budget, changes this conclusion in any um, measure. So whether there is space in the future to change uh, this approach and to uh, identify uh, a stronger space for European uh, criminal law to intervene. Um, something for discussion and for future reflection. Um, univocal choices, uh, Article 45, Paragraph 2 of the IPA regulation uh, states that uh, for what concerns uh, uh, the rules on uh, um, uh, management of uh, uh, the case file, um, the case file shall be managed by the European Delegated Prosecutor in accordance with the law of uh, their member state. 
uh, going uh, further to state that in particular the right of access to the case file is uh, uh, regulated in accordance with the national law of that prosecutor. Now, of course, this reference in itself uh, uh, does not contradict that, which is present in another part of the regulation, in Article 41, where one of the uh, uh, directives uh, approximating uh, uh, criminal uh, procedural law in the member states concerns precisely the right of access to the case file. However, uh, in uh, um, establishing uh, this rule, uh, the legislator uh, and the commission before that has steered clear of the, uh, um, of the choice of exercising to the full extent the mandate that Article 86 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union uh, gives the European Union and the EPO in establishing procedural rules which are applicable to its work. There is no, uh, uh, there is no uh, harmonization in this respect. However, um, I still think that uh, uh, this does not exhaust the topic. Um, in particular, uh, considering that uh, although uh, regulation uh, directive 2012-13 is an approximation only instrument. Uh, it does contain a number of provisions which are uh, clear and unconditioned. And uh, uh, it is, I think, uh, uh, indispensable to check this national law, which is made reference to in Article 45, against the way that national law respects uh, the uh, obligations incumbent on the member states according to the directive on uh, uh, inf right to information and including the rules on access to the case file. More than that, I think there is a role for the EPO which is specific uh, to its nature as a European uh, body, uh, uh, which imposes on the EPO uh, the obligation under the treaties, under the Charter, uh, to ensure that in its action uh, uh, the rights of persons uh, as enshrined by the Charter and as specified in, in this case by uh, the Directive on the Rights uh, to Information are applied uh, to the full extent so that uh, uh, the EPO should promote in its action uh, at the member state level a reading of the rules uh, that is uh, uh, insofar as possible compatible with the obligations derived from the directive, be it via the mechanisms of uh, uh, vertical direct effect, be it via the mechanisms of interpretation and conformity uh, which uh, uh, should allow a reading of national rules where not uh, fully compliant with the obligations under the EU uh, procedural rights directive that is more um, conducive to a, uh, a, a strong protection of the rights of persons involved in criminal proceedings. Problematic references. Um, very quickly, Danilo Ceccarelli and Rosario Sicurella will entertain you much longer on, on these questions. Um, the definition of the competence of the EPO. And in the definition of the competence of the EPO, there are rules both concerning the material competence and on the territorial competence. Uh, um, sorry, on the uh, territorial competence and on the uh, rights to exercise that competence, uh, which contain terms which uh, uh, pose themselves on the boundary between national law and European law. Uh, the EPO is competent when an offence has been committed within the territory of a member state. What does that mean? Is that a notion under union law or do we have to make reference to rules under applicable rules of national law to establish this? Uh, Article 25.3 on the exercise of competence um, uh, links uh, the Byzantine mechanisms for comparing uh, uh, criminal offences that are bound in one uh, uh, historical conduct on the determination of an offence which is punished more or less severely. What is an offence? Uh, is, it, is it everything? Is it uh, something which is formally defined at the level of uh, 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 the criminal legislation of each member state? Um, debate is up and there are uh, huge consequences uh, uh, from the solution to this question. But again, later on this for sure. Today, uh, what I would like perhaps to spend a word on is the last type of references, which I find particularly problematic. And as an example, I've taken Article 13.1 of the regulation, uh, which defines the powers of the EPO by way of defining the powers of the EDP that, uh, as a rule, act on behalf of the EPO in the member states. Uh, they shall act in the respective member states, says the regulation, and shall have the same powers as national prosecutors in respect of investigations, prosecutions, and bringing the cases to judgment. Now, the question is, um, uh, is this rule does this pose a um, full equivalence, or is this a minimum list? Because if it is a full equivalence, we will have situations where, in different jurisdictions, the EPO will have different powers. 
because prosecutors in different member states' legal systems have different powers. And if that is the case, we have to ask ourselves whether this conclusion is compatible with the fact that not the EPO regulation, but Article 86 of the treaties, speaks of an EPO that is competent to investigate, uh, prosecute, and bring to judgment uh, 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 the authors of crimes affecting the union budget. And this uh, uh, is a list uh, which can be adapted to the realities of certain legal system, but cannot be derogated from. So legal systems in which uh, the EPO uh, representatives, the European delegated prosecutors, do not have the full powers to investigate because uh, the legal systems as they uh, stand today uh, take away parts of the responsibility for investigation by giving it to other bodies. Legal systems which prevent the European delegated prosecutors to um, prosecute the case until its conclusion, which is the fact, it's not uh, something which is undefined. Recital 31 to the regulation clearly states that the function of prosecutors in competent courts apply until the conclusion of the proceedings, understood to mean the final determination of the question whether the suspect or accused person has committed the offense, including sentencing and resolution of any remedy. So it's clear uh, in which space the action of the delegated prosecutor poses itself. What about those legal systems that prevent delegated prosecutors from participating in parts of this procedural uh, series? I think we have a problem there. I think that this is one of the cases where the reference to uh, 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 the national law applicable to the powers of the prosecutors, if interpreted restrictively and in a conservative manner, brings to a conflict with uh, the uh, useful effect of the EPO regulation and the mandate that the EPO has been given under national, under the uh, primary law and the treaties in particular. One last uh, issue, which is, uh, uh, of course, different, uh, and with, uh, with which I would like to um, leave you uh, for this morning, is the question of soft law. Now, already the, the complex uh, interaction between uh, hard law, uh, uh, European primary and secondary and national, is enough to give a headache. Let's factor in soft law into the equation. Now, um, the EPA regulation contains a number of references to the need uh, to adopt guidelines. Uh, given this power to the college, which is, uh, from this point of view, the steering body on strategic matters of the EPO. Um, the college of the EPO has gone further than that in its first year of life and has adopted guidelines also on matters which are not expressly covered by an empowerment to adopt guidelines, uh, doing so as a matter of interpretation of its uh, power to uh, um, ensure the uniformity of, of the EPO's action and the uniformity of its prosecution policy. Uh, you will find on the EPO's website, all the decisions are public, the guidelines on uh, the application of Article 31 to cross-border acquisition of evidence, uh, the guidelines on investigation policy, and uh, they're there for you to read. This is an attempt of the College to perform its mission in order to uh, ensure that the various articulations of the EPO at central and decentralized level try to follow in as far as possible the same logic in their decision. Now the question is, what is the legal effect of these guidelines? Um, a first approach is quite evident. The College of the EPO cannot take decisions affecting individual cases, so that means that the guidelines of the College cannot in themselves have a binding effect on the decisions of the delegated prosecutors and of the permanent chambers. Uh, it will be for the general oversight mission of the College to ensure that those decisions follow those guidelines and where they do not follow these guidelines there is a reason for those deviation and to adopt any corrective measure uh, when that does not happen. However, I put to you as a question that there is a, 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 an unintended perhaps effect of this uh, body of soft law, which concerns uh, uh, the remedies brought against the decisions of the EPO uh, uh, before the courts of the member states in accordance with Article 42 of the regulation. Now, leaving aside the question for the moment, which is not for now to resolve, as to whether those actions are brought against uh, the decisions of the delegated prosecutors or those of the permanent chambers, the question is that national courts uh, uh, will uh, uh, judge those remedies uh, uh, according to a dual system. If the remedy is brought against those decisions for violation of national law, the remedy is decided according to ordinary applicable national law. However, if uh, uh, the complaint concerns a violation of union law, uh, in application of the photo frost principle, which has not been derogated by the EPA regulation, national courts will have no other uh, resort than to refer the case under Article 267 of the treaty to the European Court of Justice 
to declare the invalidity of an act of a new institution for violation of union law. Now, when the courts will do that, the question is, what, how will the soft law body of guidelines that uh, uh, shape the everyday action of the EPO in an absolutely essential way uh, be used uh, by the Court of Justice? And here, of course, uh, the debate is open. One reflection which one could make is that if the body vested with a discretionary power self-limits itself in this exercise of discretion by adopting general rules concerning the exercise of that power, uh, jurisprudence concerning uh, uh, questions, of course, of administrative law, but um, the differences will have to be proven, uh, uh, implies that deviations from those rules have to be justified uh, or may be taken as symptoms of, of uh, the tournement de pouvoir. Uh, of uh, inequality of treatment. So what will happen with these rules in the future is for, uh, for the courts to decide and for us to, to look at. What is sure is that uh, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm sure there are still a lot of surprises waiting for us behind the corners of the application of this extremely intricate legal framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca, uh, for this um, very interesting and eye-opening uh, view from the inside of the EPPO, uh, describing the uh, complexity, uh, even the Byzantine uh, complexity uh, of the regulation and its interaction with uh, national law. Uh, um, indeed, uh, as you say, uh, we keep discovering things uh, about implementation, uh, and some of them uh, perhaps will need to be fixed uh, one day. Uh, and thank you very much uh, already, uh, at least from our side in the Commission, we appreciate very much uh, this insider view uh, that we get from you uh, uh, on, on these issues. Uh, uh, some of them perhaps, perhaps uh, can be fixed uh, uh, under political pressure uh, and dialogue with member states. Uh, others perhaps will need, need a legal amendment of the regulation in due course. Um, so thanks for uh, opening uh, the discussion uh, on the uh, EPP regulations issues. Uh, Let's move to the next um, presentation, which is uh, by uh, Mr. Fimiani, uh, uh, about procedural independence and accountability. Uh, again, Mr. Fimiani, we have 20 minutes, uh, and I will show you when it's time up uh, or before five minutes. Uh, okay. Please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my talk is divided into four uh, parts. In the first part, I will compare the fundamental principle affirmed by the European courts on the independence of the public prosecutors with the independence of the EPO. In the second part, I will examine two procedural rules that could have an impact on, the, on international independence, internal independence, in my opinion. In the third part, I will focus on some of the conditions for the effectiveness of the independence of the EPO. In the fourth part, I will examine the issue of accountability of the EPO. First part. The external independence of uh, the European public prosecutor was at the heart of the long process that led to the adoption of the regulation. It is widely ensured by the Article 6 and other well-known legal measures, which are the object of extensive debate also in legal literature. In identifying the specificity of the EPO independence, the regulation has in mind the indication coming from the European Courts, the Venice Commission, and the Consultative Council of European Prosecutors. Among these sources, it's useful to briefly recall the fundamental principles affirmed by the European Courts. The European Courts of Justice has clarified the concept of independence of public prosecutors in several cases, dealing on whether they can be considered as an, an independent judicial authority empowered to issue the European arrest warrant. The court held that the requirement of independence, one, is satisfied when the public prosecutor's office carries out its duties objectively, free from any instruction in a specific case from the executive, that may issue only general instruction concerning criminal justice policy to public prosecutors in order to ensure that policy is consistently applied throughout the territory. 
Two, cannot be said to be satisfied in the presence of rules allowing the executive power to issue formal instruction to the prosecutors on individual cases. Three, does not prohibit an internal instruction which may be given to public prosecutors by their hierarchical uh, superiors while public prosecutors uh, on the basis of the hierarchical relationship underpinning the functioning of the public prosecutor's office. With respect to this indication, the EPOS regulation goes further because the general decisions as issued by the college and therefore are internal to the institution. And the hierarchical structure is balanced by the collegial nature of the management body. As for the European Court of Human Rights, it's, uh, it has clearly highlighted the how the bodies of action must enjoy a high degree of independence, even if uh, this is uh, characterized in a way that does not coincide what, uh, with the ne that necessity for the judge. The independence of the prosecution is functional to ensure the impartiality of the judge. It also aims at making effective the principle of equality of citizens before the law. The EPO regulation is consistent with this approach as it provides for the principle of impartiality as one of the fundamental principles of this activity, Article 5. This principle is well explained by Recital 65, whereby the prosecution should be guided by the principle of proportionality, impartiality, and fairness towards the suspect or accused person. This includes the obligation to seek all types of evidence inculpatory as well exculpatory, either modu proprio or at the request of the defense. This statement relates directly to the principle of action as mandatory, as established by the regulation through the submission of choices on action to the legality principle, recital 66 and 81. So, both principles make independence as a necessary condition of the app. They are the legal basis of guarantee not only for the external independence of the EPO, but also for the internal independence of the EDPs, as they constitute, as they constitute a limit to the instruction issued by the permanent chambers. A second issue, internal independence. With regard to internal independence, it is a shared opinion that the hierarchical system established by the regulation does not compromise internal independence <laughs> because a check and balancing system is envisaged with the, ensures the exercise of the investigative function, impartiality, and in compliance with the principle of legality. In this regard, reference is made to the prohibition for the permanent chamber to dismiss the case if a draft decision proposes to bring a case to judgment. The possibility for the delegated prosecutor pr to propose to the permanent chamber to amend or revoke the instruction received and, in case of denial, to submit a request for review to the European chief prosecutor. The assignment, in this case, the request to a different permanent chamber. I agree with this observation, but in my opinion, two procedural rules could have an impact on internal independence. First, the internal rule of a procedure previously mentioned, whereby the ADP may oppose the binding instruction given by the permanent chamber, applies only if the EDP deems that the implementation of an instruction received by the monitoring permanent chamber would be contrary to union law, including the regulation or applicable applicable national law. This is a very restrictive provision because it does not allow the EDP to consider that the instruction, although legitimate, are however contrary to the need for an effective investigation. In my opinion, the matter should be better considered. A greater space for the autonomous evaluation of the EDP could increase it, its professionalism and encourage the exchange of experience of different origins and history. The second uh, procedural rule that could have an impact on internal independence is the derogation from the general, general criteria of allocation of cases within the permanent chambers. 
in general, random, automatic, and alternating allocation according to the order of registration of each new case. Article 19, paragraph 4 of the internal rules of procedure provides for the possibility of derogation from this criteria when it is necessary to ensure the efficient functioning of the EPO, and in such cases, the decision of the permanent chambers may provide that certain categories of cases based in particular on the type of offence under investigation or the circumstances of the offence are assigned to a specific permanent chamber. The college decision on the permanent chambers number 15 2020 does not contain such regulation. In any case, the offences and the circumstances allowing the derogation from the automatic criteria for allocation, allocating cases should be def defined in a specific and detailed way. In fact, the provision of objective and the predeterminated criteria for the allocation of cases is one of the fundamental rules for guaranteeing the internal independence of the public prosecutor. Uh, third um, issue, the effectiveness of the independence of the EP. In general, the effectiveness of the independence of prosecutors does not depend on the purity of the abstract model, but on a wide range of circumstances. In fact, even in systems where criminal prosecution is mandatory and where, therefore, it would seem that there is no room from, for discretionary assessment, prosecution is affected by larger discretionary elements, such as the organizational choices, the priority criteria, the decision on how to proceed with investigation, and the availability of resources. These elements have already been extensively investigated, the availability for the EPO of sufficient financial resources in order to fulfill its mandate, its ability to establish efficient cooperation with other institutions, uh, such as OLAF, Eurojust, and Europol the concrete consequences of the so-called double hat, and this term has a double meaning, double fidelity, because the EDPs equally belong to the national states and to the EPO, and double exercise when they have, at the same time, they function as EDPs and national prosecutors. And finally, the EDPs choice. On this last point, the effective of the, and objective independence could be affected by the choice of the numbers of ADP deriving for, from the number and gravity of pending cases relating to PIF crimes. In fact, there is a risk that a chain distorting effect will be determined. The countries that operate with more intensity in the fight against the, the, PIF, the PIF crimes could receive a much greater number of, the, of ADPs in proportion to their population or to any other parameter, compared to countries that are less effective in prosecution of PIF crimes. The situation could have uh, in, indirect effects on the objective independence, since the effectiveness of the action of the ADPs and therefore of the EPO depends on the choices made by nation states in the allocation of resources. For the accountability of the EPO, a well-established uh, principle is the close connection between independence and accountability. Recital 18 provides that strict accountability is a complement to the independence and the power granted to the EPO under this regulation. And in any democratic state, the possession of a power implies accountability for the way it is exercised. Accountability for prosecutors uh, as well for judges implies not only complies with the law and professional codes, but also a duty of transparency towards the community about the way in which they exercise the power comfort, the result achieved, the work program. Prosecutors, like judges, can gain the trust of a society if they do not operate with independence, impartiality, and efficiency. I would like to make two considerations to on the accountability ruled by Article 7 of the regulation. First, 
the obligation whereby the Apple must report the uh, general activities also to national parliaments at their request implies a double level of accountability. The first primary and the direct level is towards the European institutions as holders of the protected interest, financial resources of the Union. The second, secondary and the mediator level goes towards the, nat uh, the national parliaments, which are entitled to verify the compliance with the principle of subsidiarity as provided for by protocol number two to the Lisbon Treaty, as said uh, Luca in his uh, study uh, two years ago, as a consequence uh, of, of the transfer of sovereignty. The second remark concerned the content of the annual report. The recital uh, um, 19 states that it, it should at least contain statistical data on the work on the, of the Apple. Therefore, this provision does not exclude that some uh, information is also provided on elements other than purely statistical data. The first and recent uh, uh, 2021 report seems to contain mainly statistical data. In my opinion, in, in the future, the annual report should also give a complete account of the college's decision on strategic matters, as well as the priorities and the prosecution policy of the EPO. Moreover, this perspective would be consistent with the broad concept of accountability accepted in opinion number 13 of 2018 of the Consultative Council of the European Prosecutor, stating that for prosecutors, being accountable means, in particular, not only to provide as appropriate reports to relevant stakeholders, but also to justify decisions whether based on the principle of legality or opportunity, discretion. And the decisions on strategic matters are typically discretionary choices. Some concluding remarks. The mixed character of the EPO between collegiality and hierarchy emerges from the division between strategic and decisional choices, with a clear separation of responsibilities between bodies. This model is very innovative. It could be a starting point to achieve a balance between the need for uniformity in the exercise of prosecutor powers and the respect of their decision-making autonomy in the system, like Italy, where public prosecution is not a centralized power and is performed by non-hierarchical institutions. Furthermore, for conclusion, after, in our opinion, after an adequate period, period of, of, of experiment, experimentation, the IPO model could be extended to, to the protection of other interests of the European Union. And first, I think, to the protection of the environment from transnational offenses which are committed by criminal organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fimiani, uh, for highlighting uh, um, so well the need for independence uh, and for accountability uh, of the EPPO uh, and giving us uh, some examples of uh, how this should be done. Uh, uh, we took good note of your recommendation that the annual report, uh, which I indeed recommend to everyone to read, uh, uh, should contain also uh, an account uh, of uh, the strategic decisions taken by the, by the College uh, to establish uh, the EPPO's prosecutorial policy. Uh, that's something uh, I'm sure uh, the EPPO colleagues will reflect upon uh, here in the room. Um, um, and uh, in particular, I think, thank you for highlighting that the independence needs to be uh, jealously guarded not only vis-a-vis -vis the external world, but also within the EPPO itself, uh, and also vis-a-vis -vis the EU institutions, such as the Commission, by the way. Uh, um, um, unless uh, it really brings you uh, more budget uh, there, I think uh, <laughs> you should be indulgent with us. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we move to the next speaker, that is uh, Andre Klipp, uh, who will speak from the podium uh, down here. Uh, 
uh, and as I introduced Andre, uh, uh, he's a great mind uh, that reminds us of uh, uh, the need to, to uh, change DPP regulation from time to time, including uh, notifications about uh, some countries joining DPPO. Andre was the one who noticed that there was an error uh, uh, in the uh, Dutch language version of the uh, decision uh, to uh, let Malta in. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, Andre, with a bit of delay. Uh, uh, you, you amended uh, EU law uh, uh, just out of hand uh, like this. Thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, I just gave you another suggestion for amendment, uh, but that relates to the regulation itself. Uh, uh, but that is also, maybe that's not such a minor issue as the, uh, as the other one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to be here with you. Uh, I thank uh, especially Professor Kathleen Ligeti for inviting me uh, and all the other organizers. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, complex issues, complicating uh, constructions uh, and uh, whatever other troubles uh, that are ahead of uh, the, the uh, European Public Prosecutor's Office. Uh, I don't think it, it, everything is that, that difficult. Uh, I think the, the, the challenges that are ahead of the EPO are not much different from the challenges that were, were and are ahead of international criminal tribunals prosecutors. And that is the comparison that I would like to make. Um, and if this works, it does not work, but I would like to have the next slide. Uh, um, and maybe somebody else uh, uh, can uh, do that behind my back. It's the green, it's the green yes. This, this is green. It says next, and then it does not flip up. Um, but I, I, the, the, uh, I would like to, um, uh, to compare uh, uh, with uh, uh, the experience of the, um, uh, uh, of the International Criminal Tribunal prosecutors. Um, now it goes far too far. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, there we are. Uh, I could not recognize in the regulation any trace of uh, making use of the experiences of the international criminal tribunals when drafting the uh, regulation. Uh, that might still be so, uh, uh, but I couldn't uh, uh, see it. And I think there are quite some similarities when it comes to what the prosecutor for Europe has to do uh, as a prosecutor at the ICC or the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal. Uh, the reason to establish tribunal, uh, the reason to establish the uh, prosecutor are more or less the same. It is inertia of uh, inactivity of states that have competence, states that have competence without any doubt, uh, and they don't do anything because they say, well, we, uh, we could do it, but somebody else could also do it. And you know there is a saying, uh, uh, everyone's uh, job is a, a no man's job because there is a bystander effect in international practice. Why should I do all the efforts if somebody else can do it? That was one of the reasons to establish uh, uh, the ICC. It was also one of the reasons to establish the European Public Prosecutor's Office. There's a transnational dimension. It has a very solid treaty or now regulation base uh, uh, to have the construct of the European public prosecutor. And we also saw that the nomination of, of the chief prosecutor, but also of the other prosecutors, is a very, very sensitive issue. So it is, so it was uh, with the ICC. There are also differences. Differences in the type of crimes, of course. No casualties, uh, uh, and no uh, large-scale armed conflict, no ongoing armed conflict, which is quite a problem for the ICC prosecutor, I can tell you, even if he stands up in the very week that a new conflict breaks out that triggers his jurisdiction and he stands up, please, uh, 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 parties, remind yourself of the fact that there is a court and a prosecutor court competent to deal with your offences. That is not the case. No involvement of the United Nations Security Council, uh, but the EU has something else. The EU has the area of freedom, security and justice. Um, so differences, but also many similarities. I will focus now in my talk on three challenges that I see uh, where we can draw some comparisons. And one of the challenges, I think, is that the influx of cases, 
uh, uh, one relates to the unity of the law. Previous speakers already addressed that as well. And uh, a third one relates to the cooperation uh, with states. And there are all kinds of different types of states that uh, we need to address. I think one of the most important challenges is how to keep the number of cases manageable. Um, the EPA regulation works with a legality principle, which means, at least that is my understanding of a legality principle, that all cases that come to the knowledge of the EPO and are within the jurisdiction must be prosecuted or must be uh, uh, transferred to national authorities to do that. Well, it would not surprise me if that would be uh, um, a much more work than you can do uh, uh, on a regular working day. Um, uh, so the number of offences may be huge. The number of situation states, member states involved will also be quite complex because I would say almost by definition most EU fraud cases will, uh, will be on the basis of a multiple jurisdiction of member states. So decisions must be made on that as well. Um, and then we may see something, at least we saw at the ICC, we saw states using other people will say abusing the jurisdiction of the ICC to get rid of unwanted cases, to get rid of political opponents. I refer to the Gbagbo case and the Ivory case where the successor uh, uh, of President Gbagbo handed over his political opponent to the ICC to get rid of him and referred uh, uh, cases to uh, uh, the ICC to, uh, uh, to have him prosecuted. This may happen as well for the EPO. Um, we may also see that the EPO will have limited deterrent effect. The ICC, well, what is the deterrent effect of the ICC if you look now what is happening in Ukraine? Um, that may be similar to, uh, uh, to EPO as well. The legality principle will pose many challenges to uh, uh, make decisions on which cases you can handle and which cases should go to uh, uh, the national authorities. Um, does legality require to prosecute all offences of the accused? Uh, this is a question I raised because in, at the Yugoslav Tribunal we saw a situation concerning President Milosevic in which the prosecutor wanted to charge him for all offences that he had committed. That led to a trial that was huge. That did not only, only relate to war crimes, the crimes against humanity, the genocide, but also made the trial complex and very, very time consuming and so huge that in the end President Milosevic passed away before the trial had ended. If legality forces uh, the EPO to charge everything that is on the table, it may lead to long and lengthy trials. The IC the International Criminal Tribunals went for the big fish. And they went for the big fish because in the context of international criminal law, uh, presidents, generals, ministers uh, 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 of other states are very unlikely to stand trial before a national court of another state. So in that sense, there is a reason to go for the big fish. Is that also what the Apple wants? Uh, if the EPO starts going after big fish, it may create the effect that national member states, that member states will no longer go after big fish because they think or they see demonstrated in practice that the big fish are for the, for the, for the EPO. What I think is it was a missed opportunity in international criminal uh, a law is that the tribunals did not give a representative selection of legal issues in the choice of their accused. If you only go for big fish, you only discuss the legal problems that are attached to big fish. And these are different problems than to the low ranking officials. So, in that sense, I think Apple would do wise to go for all kinds of accused very high ranking, but also small fish to have all the legal issues on the table. 
Um, the unity of the law on the EPO, that is quite an issue. And it was already mentioned that the regulation refers to national substantive criminal law. So accused will stand trial on the national implemented provision of the directive on EU fraud. And that completely follows the rules of, uh, uh, of division of power and also the place that the regulation has in European criminal law. If we were to have a directly applicable provision uh, uh, in a regulation, we would also have direct enforcement uh, of European criminal uh, law. And we're not that far yet, and it is questionable whether uh, the union wants to get there. So that is, uh, uh, I think, a logical consequence, but one of the consequences of that is that the provisions will be diverging. They will not only be diverging on the formulation of the provision as such, but they will also be divergent because of the fact that all general part elements that relate to that provision will be different. And there's not a single provision yet in EU law that harmonizes anything relating to general part. Is that problematic? Well, maybe not that much as, uh, as, as you may think, unless you want to have everything completely harmonized but then you shouldn't go for, the, for this construction. The regulation is only, uh, uh, only creates the powers of the EPO, but it does not uh, say anything about substantive criminal law. Um, there is a competence for EPO on inextricably linked offenses. And of course, nobody knows exactly what those offenses are. However, there is case law of the Court of Justice on exactly this formulation, inextricably linked, and that is the case law on the Neighbours in Eden provisions. And there, the court focuses on the same set of material facts, so th uh, uh, facts that took place at the same moment, relating to the same conditions, and all of that. That is the notion uh, uh, that was applied uh, uh, there. So there are some challenges here, uh, but there are uh, uh, also, uh, I think, some things that are simply uh, um, uh, there because of the fact that the substantive criminal law provision comes via a directive. There is more uniform or harmonized uh, a law when it comes to procedural matters because the regulation has many procedural issues uh, and some of the things uh, uh, that uh, uh, are, are still uh, questionable are, for instance, the admissibility of evidence. The regulation doesn't say a lot about that. It is for national law to determine what, what evidence is admissible, uh, and we do know that admissibility of evidence has been uh, in dispute among the member states of the EU. That will continue to be so. Uh, because admissibility relates to how the evidence has been collected. And admissibility is directly linked to the evaluation of the evidence uh, and to regulate that all at once uh, uh, will be very difficult. It will be difficult because everything you do on EPO cases has consequences for other admissibility issues. So in that sense, the EPO will become a laboratory, a forerunner, frontrunner, for further developments in the, on the larger plane uh, of admissibility and evidentiary matters. Uh, I think that is something that is very easy to, uh, to predict. How exactly it will play out, that is uh, uh, for, uh, for us to, uh, uh, to see. National courts have a very important task, as always in every criminal case, but now they must also interpret the regulation. Uh, they must give an expression of what exactly it means in their specific case, and they must combine that with their national procedural law. Will they give a more national interpretation? Uh, or will they, for instance, refer to the Court of Justice? They might do so. Uh, because uh, there are many provisions in the regulations that are ambiguous, that ask questions. We already saw that uh, the previous speakers referred to that. Um, 
I may refer to one specific provision, and that relates uh, to Article 42 of the regulation. Uh, 42 that uh, uh, um, uh, asks for references relating to the validity of acts of the EPO. That's a very interesting provision, especially uh, uh, read in combination with Article 276, not 267, but 276 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. Article 276 rules out the competence of the court to say anything about the validity uh, and uh, proportionality of operations by the police and law enforcement agencies of the member states. So here we have a very clear, explicit jurisdiction of the court to make such an assessment of what the EPO does and a very clear uh, 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 no to, a to such a jurisdiction uh, when it comes to the validity and proportionality uh, of what member states authorities do. But now we have these double-headed uh, uh, European delegated pro uh, uh, prosecutor. Is he now with the EPO jurisdiction or is he with the national uh, 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 law enforcement agencies. I wouldn't be able to tell this. Uh, but this requires, I think, uh, uh, some explanation. I think uh, uh, um, I no longer see, honestly, uh, a reason to have Article 20, uh, 276, but it is a very explicit rule. It's there in the treaty, uh, and this is something you cannot simply amend by uh, uh, changing it in the uh, official journal. So there's mo more work to do there. Will national courts refer? That is a, a very intriguing question. I'm currently conducting a study on, 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 on how and why uh, uh, national courts refer in criminal matters. And I, I see a couple of things already popping up, but I've, I've, I've only started. Uh, and I see that, that lower courts are often reluctant to pose questions because they may say it is for the Supreme Court to do so. And Supreme Courts are often reluctant because they say if we do that, we may lose our power as a Supreme Court. Uh, there are some, many Supreme Courts in the, in, in, in the member states that do not refer because it also flags that they're no longer the Supreme Court. And Supreme Courts even give instructions uh, uh, to lower courts not to raise preliminary references. Of course that is not allowed. And that does not only apply to member states that have open problems with the rule of law. It applies to other member states as well. Some courts do refer, and they do that because they want to bypass their Supreme Court, or they want to bypass unwanted national legislation. That, I think, is one of the triggering mechanisms for courts to, uh, uh, to do so. Uh, and that is very, very interesting. Um, some lower courts do refer because they would like to give a certain interpretation of the directive, the regulation, or whatever, of which they know that it is disputed. And if they do that on their own, they do not have the, 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 the authority. So therefore, they may use the court, uh, which I think is a very, uh, um, a, a very good way and a very uh, a proportionate way to invite the court to, uh, to give a ruling on it. Um, but we also saw, I think, in, especially in European arrest warrant cases, that if you ask the court to give a certain interpretation, you may not only get an answer to your question, but you may get something else uh, uh, on top of that. Uh, I don't think that uh, any one of us could have predicted that the first question on uh, is a police authority an authority uh, uh, to uh, request uh, European arrest warrants would end it up uh, uh, with the case law that we have now. So the case law that may come uh, 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 may come as a as a snowball, an unexpected snowball uh, with many different uh, aspects. I do see that many courts have less hesitation in referring uh, uh, references when it comes to international cooperation related matters. And I thought, why is this? Why do courts more often refer when it relates to the European arrest warrant or, uh, or the European investigation order? We also see now questions coming up. 
And my explanation is, but I may be wrong, that uh, um, if the interpretation of the court comes back, it often relates to the national law of the issuing member state, not of the execution member state. So the damage is not where, uh, with the execution uh, uh, authority, executing authority, but the damage back home is with the issuing authority. And that makes it easier. That makes it easier. And uh, I do see that reflected also in the case law of my uh, uh, country. I come from the Netherlands, that is the member state uh, 200 kilometers up north. Uh, you may know that the Amsterdam District Court has sent many requests uh, on, uh, on the European arrest warrant, also concerning the question whether a summons uh, to the grandfather of the accused who promises to uh, uh, to deliver it to his grandson is a summons that is in line with the demands of the uh, uh, framework decision. And the court said, no, it is not, because there is no positive sign that he has knowledge of it. What does the Supreme Court of the Netherlands say? Well, that is a rule that is applicable in EAW cases only. So it does not apply to Dutch summons. So we continue to have summonses uh, sent to grandfathers uh, uh, of accused without any positive knowledge uh, uh, of confirmation uh, of its receipt. Um, cooperation with states. There are three types of states when it comes to the EPO. We have EPO participating states. We have uh, uh, we have non-participating member states and we have third states. For member states, there is a general obligation in Article 24. Uh, for not participating member states, that's, that's a very difficult formulation. I didn't want to look at uh, that. Uh, uh, no, uh, 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 I can't read it. Um, Non-participating member states, uh, uh, there is a provision in one of them four, and basically they fall back to the sincere cooperation. Unwilling states has been a continuing problem with uh, uh, the ICC. Also, with states party to the ICC. So that is something I would not expect will be different uh, uh, for the EPO. And that is because of the fact that many of the offences relate to political offences. We cannot rule out that EU fraud relates to corruption, uh, relates to state authorities that also have the power to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, um, uh, um, respond or not respond to the uh, uh, request. States not recognizing the EPO as a requesting authority may spe specifically a problem with third states. Third states with whom we have bilateral treaties, uh, bilateral treaties that of course do not provide, uh, um, do not make any reference to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the EPO. I know, with the multilateral uh, treaties, member states have made declaration, please also now read EPO for all the requests that come. Yes, you may declare, declare that, but a third state may have an entirely different view on that. And for sure, the defense in a third state will uh, uh, make an argument uh, uh, about it. It will create uh, uh, further problems initially, initially. Uh, and also that, uh, um, I think I should come to a conclusion uh, to, uh, to maintain friendly relations with, my, uh, uh, with the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, as with all new institutions, uh, uh, the, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And of course the drafters may have anticipated many of the issues, uh, but I think the ICC examples, International Criminal Tribunals examples, show us uh, that there are also unaccepted, un unexpected uh, uh, things that may, uh, uh, may, may happen. I think we could look more often to what the practice there offers to us. There are several challenges ahead. I mentioned only three, uh, but I think there are many more. And I think one of the issues that may also, at a certain point, uh, uh, is, uh, is to come uh, and to think ahead of a further development of the EPO. And I think I said that before, uh, uh, also in the, the presence of our chair, but when um, uh, uh, Schengen was, this, uh, was, was concluded, my students wrote their master thesis on a European FBI. 
when Europol was concluded, my students wrote about the European Public Prosecutor. And when the European Public Prosecutor was concluded, my students write about a European Criminal Court. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you for uh, respecting the time. Uh, as you know, I'm very keen on upholding European law, and uh, non-discrimination is uh, one of these fundamental principles in EU law. Uh, professors don't get more time than uh, civil servants <laughs> uh, or uh, judges of uh, the Italian Supreme Court. Um, uh, thank you for, for uh, drawing this very useful comparison uh, between the EPPO and uh, international courts. Uh, uh, indeed, we, we got inspired uh, by uh, the uh, uh, Rome Statute uh, uh, and some of the fundamental elements of uh, competence between uh, uh, national authorities and uh, international courts. Uh, indeed, you can find it in the in the EPPO regulation. Uh, uh, and the three points that you mentioned, the influx of cases, the unity of law, um, and cooperation with third states, um, uh, including with the unwilling uh, member states of the uh, EU, uh, are issues uh, uh, on which further work is needed. Uh, some of them, uh, some of these issues can be fixed by infringement cases. Uh, and I may inform you here that uh, we have 17 infringement cases for the PIF directive uh, currently uh, running, uh, and three more are coming. Uh, in the next few weeks, uh, that will uh, make a total of 20 out of uh, 27. Uh, uh, and I'm sure there will be sooner or later infringement cases for the EPPO regulation as well. And that's one way of uh, fixing the problems. Another one, indeed, uh, uh, is uh, by uh, running cases to the Court of Justice from national courts. Uh, but that takes uh, uh, a bit of a courage. Um, uh, so we are waiting uh, for the first uh, referral uh, from a national court. Uh, uh, and, of course, that requires that uh, EPPO prosecutors uh, do their best as well uh, to convince national courts uh, that uh, the matter should be referred uh, to the Court of Justice for, for guidance. Uh, uh, and you're right that you never know what we'll get out of it. <laughs> Sometimes they are really surprising judgments, uh, um, not responding at all uh, to the questions which are raised. Um, on this uh, note, we have three minutes left. Thank you very much to all. Uh, the uh, excellent panelists uh, for their very enlightening uh, speeches uh, uh, and uh, uh, pointing out issues that uh, will need to be addressed uh, in practice, in law, uh, in the future, uh, or even now. Uh, uh, we have uh, some time for questions, uh, a few minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Katalin. Uh, so uh, I turn to you, to the audience. Uh, and I will do what Mrs. Metzola would do in the European Parliament in Brussels, which is referring to the number of the seats uh, where you're seated. Uh, so, uh, Mrs. 152, please. Good morning to everyone, and thank you for the presentation and your time here. Uh, my question was especially referred to Mr. De Matteis, but it's open to everyone, because uh, when we talk about criminal law, uh, specifically about the Italian system, there's this rule according to which no one can be punished if that act or omission is not considered as a crime by the law. And with law, we usually consider the parliamentary law. So talking about the material competence of the EPPO, because we have to refer to a directive that is the PIF directive, so that's okay because it has been approved by the Parliament in national law, but if we want to go forward, does the provision from the treaties or maybe a regulation be in contrast with this Italian provision or maybe there's something similar in other states? Because in that case, the Parliament would not have a prominent role. Thank you. Well, what is clear is that uh, as Professor Klipp rightly said, any uh, temptation to move forward and to give the European Union the possibility to directly, uh, by way of statute, uh, create uh, criminal offences uh, would require uh, possibly a treaty amendment as well as the systemic integration in European law of a number of things. Uh, you mentioned a, a system of enforcement, but even before that, we have to remember that a criminal offence is another provision that lives in a vacuum. It is inserted in a system, including uh, systems of, of 
extenuating circumstances, aggravating circumstances, statute of limitation, uh, ability to receive a punishment. So it's not uh, a means to an end. It is part of a whole system. So if that were to be one day replicated at union level, the modifications would have to be profound. When that happens, those modifications, by the nature of union law, will prevail uh, over uh, uh, those of uh, national law of whatever rank, uh, taking into account that if ever this happens, the European Union does not subtract it to applicable instruments of international law in this respect, where the principle of legality is clearly stated out. And I think we can probably state with confidence that the principle of, of uh, parliamentary scrutiny would uh, be part of the interpretation of that principle of legality if ever the EU were given this competence. So, to be seen. Thank you very much. Any further questions or comments? Hans Holger, please. Good to see you. 150, yes. <laughs> well, but he's, uh... Uh, I have actually, uh, or I would have comments to a number of the interesting uh, statements that were made. I want to speak only on one point, though, that Luca raised. Uh, Luca, I, I thought it was very interesting, your analysis of where there are difficulties with references to national law. What I would what I had, had not expected, however, is to have you say that Article 13.1 is one of the most difficult cases. I think the reference to national law in Article 30, paragraph 1, was actually included with good intentions. Maybe not well thought through, but with good intentions. And that is related to the concept of the double hat, the idea being that the EDPs should exercise the same powers uh, as prosecutors under national law. What we perhaps did not sufficiently take into account, however, is that prosecutors in member states have different uh, roles, as you rightly said. And that is a problem. But Article 13.1 also says uh, the same powers as national prosecutors in addition and subject to the status provided under this regulation. And I think there is sufficient evidence in the regulation to clarify that there is a specific concept of a prosecutor which the EDP should fulfill in all the member states. So it is not a full reference to national law. And this concept of a prosecutor is a prosecutor who is leading the investigation from A to Z. So it is neither a, a concept where the, the police actually undertakes investigation, nor a concept where a, uh, an investigating judge is uh, undertaking the investigation. It's the prosecutor who does that. I think that is clear from Article 28, Paragraph 1, and other pr provisions in there. So that, why, that is why I would agree with you that Article 13, Paragraph 1 may be worded uh, perhaps problematic, but if you take it, read it in the context, uh, uh, in the further context, it is pretty clear that certain concepts of prosecutors' roles that member states have are not fully compliant with the EPA regulation. Thank you. Nothing to add. I completely agree with you. Uh, I'm sorry if I slammed down unnecessarily on the poor Article 13.1, which, as you said, probably was well meant to establish the, the, um, um, the minimum content, uh, uh, then to be integrated into the system where, as you rightly say, other provision can be interpreted. Of course, the problem is that what we have today on our hands is a situation where this gray space on top of the minimum line has been filled with different contents in different member states. And therefore, that there is a problem of interpretation where this reference to the national law has indeed been pushed to an extent which, and there I agree with you, is currently problematic. Thank you very much indeed. We know uh, why uh, uh, indeed uh, the text contains a number of references to national law is because we avoided uh, harmonization uh, uh, in many instances. Uh, for one, uh, this is uh, a provision where the Commission itself uh, had proposed uh, a reference to national law. Uh, Hans Roger is right on that specific point. I uh, fully agree. Any further questions, comments? I don't see any. That brings us to the end of the first panel. Uh, thank you very much to all panelists uh, uh, and to the uh, podium uh, for the questions and comments raised. Uh, um, that takes us to the coffee break uh, uh, until 11.40, uh, and then session two uh, will start uh, with uh, Zlata uh, as chair. Thank you very much. Uh, see you later.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you can go to your seat so we can start the second session of the EPO conference. So the title of this session is Variable uh, Geometries of the EPPO Operations. Uh, I'm, it's really my pleasure and I'm so honored uh, that the Dean of the University of Luxembourg, Katalin Ligeti, uh, invited me to chair this session uh, in this wonderful building of the European, all European uh, Parliament and in the presence of the digitaries of uh, the European criminal law world, which includes the authors of the Corpus Juris, uh, like a Professor John Ravale, who is here with us, but also the European Chief Prosecutor, Laura Koveshi, and uh, her deputies and uh, other European prosecutors who are here. Uh, we probably all know, probably it was mentioned yesterday, uh, but I was not here due to some problems with airplanes. The day that the EPO started operation just a year ago. So uh, tomorrow will be one year, so the 1st of June in 2001 is that the uh, EPO start its operation. Its first case was in Croatia, actually just a month uh, and a half after it started the work, it started first investigation in Croatia. It was against the uh, leader of the one of the project and the farmer. However, I would like just to tell you what happened next in Croatia with regard to EPO operations. So uh, the EPO started the investigation against the former minister of EU funds and the director of the central finance and contracting agencies. Uh, it was a great scandal in Croatia, not because uh, these persons have been prosecutor, prosecuted, but because of the work of our National Prosecutor Office. Everybody was asking why they did not start the prosecutions of the, pro, the position of the uh, National Chief Prosecutor was a compromise. And that actually, uh, we all believe, resulted in the February of this year that the Croatian Office for the Suppression of Corruption uh, an organized crime arrested the sitting minister of construction and the sitting deputy prime minister uh, and two other high level officials in Croatia. So this was the first time in Croatia actually that the sitting minister was prosecuted on subsidy fraud, of course. So uh, these developments can really show us that the EPPO was not only or is not only the promising institution, but it's competing with the European Court of Justice for the post of the most important rule of law institution in the European Union. So EPPO is not just a supervisor of the national prosecutions uh, with its own legal framework, but it promotes and make them move from the politics, stick to the rule of law, and really do the prosecution in accordance with the national uh, criminal law uh, legislation and also the European one. Um, I'm really honored also to, pr uh, to uh, present you uh, and to introduce you the members of this uh, session here. I will start with my dear colleague, Professor Rosaria Sicurella. Uh, she is a full professor of criminal law at the University of Catania since 2010, and she is teaching criminal law and European criminal law. Uh, she has run many, many projects, but maybe just to mention two uh, Jean Monnet programs on uh, European penal area. She was a Maria Curie the most prestigious uh, fellowship uh, fellow uh, on Pantheon Sorbonne University. She holds, of course, numerous presentations, like numerous projects, and her list of publication is really long and impressive. We are also right now participating in one of the projects together on e 
uh, EU uh, law, particularly uh, European trainings of uh, European public prosecutor um, work, uh, which includes five countries. And the leader of this uh, project and the scientific uh, prosecutor, uh, and, sorry, scientific uh, coordinator is uh, Rosaria Sicurella. So, Sicurella, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zlata, for this very, very nice uh, presentation. I wish, to, I wish to really thank the uh, ECLAN organization, the, uh, I mean, Catalina Ligeti, who invited me, and all the ECLAN staff who has uh, been working very, very hardly to, I mean, to, uh, to make this conference a success, and especially, uh, and especially Panos Pan uh, and Constantinis, who really was uh, in contact with me even on Sunday evening about presentation, etc. So uh, thanks for your passions, actually. So um, I am a bit vintage, so I um, normally should just the, the white to start. Oh, okay. So oh no, I thought I was uh, I could see there. Okay, that's great. So I know what I'm talking about. Okay. So, I think that uh, um, it is worth uh, starting, I mean, talking about the, the present situation of the uh, EPO competence legal framework by stressing the fact that the, actually the main uh, content of the provision that now I just uh, remind here in the, in the first, uh, first slide. So the, the provision which is now enshrined in Article 22, especially the provision in Article 22, Paragraph 1 of the EPO regulation, has not changed since the proposal put by the Commission in 2013. So this means that despite, and uh, Luca De Matteis was referring also to that, despite the more significant readings that were proposed about Article 86 of the, of the treaty, allowing for a much more, I would say, penetrating definition of the scope of the, of the EPO, either in the same regulation with some problem, actually, of the legal basis of this competence, but or in, I mean, through a, a reference to a more detailed directive. So the Commission, despite all that, the Commission has considered that the choice for a dynamic reference to the new PIF directive was the only viable, I mean, way also in order to get, I mean, the approval by the Council. And this even basing the directive, which is, was the case for the proposal of directive, not on Article 83, but on Article 325, which allows a much wider, I mean, uh, scope for harmonizing, uh, harmonizing legisl national legislation. And so even that case, this was mainly, this dynamic reference was already the method that was chosen by the, uh, the Commission. So actually, this, uh, the present situation, the legal landscape on the EPO, in some sense, is a kind of genetical shortcoming of the, of the overall project. This is a matter of fact, and Zlata was stressing that, that the material scope of the, of the EPO finally depends on national provisions implementing the directive, so depends on the different forms and level of such implementation. The, as I will try to, I mean, to, 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 I mean, to an analyze in my presentation is that the reference that you see in Article 22, uh, Paragraph 1 to the PIF directive as implemented by national law results in a still very heterogeneous legal landscape for the action of the EPO, giving rise to a competence following a variable geometry, which is very difficult indeed to justify with respect to the action of the first European investigative body and above all, um, above all which risks to clash with fundamental requirements of the principle of certainty of law, of the principle of legality and also the principle of equal uh, treatment of EU um, citizens. Um, in order to, I mean, to uh, fully understand, in my opinion, the crucial issues at stake, I think it's uh, useful to have in mind, to, to remind actually, which is the, the rationale, which is the mission of the of the of the apple. 
according, I mean, actually, uh, uh, the mission of the EPO, if we look at the, uh, all the, uh, also the preparatory works, etc., the goal of the EPO is centralizing investigation and prosecution about PIF offenses in the view of guaranteeing an effective protection of youth funds, or at least significantly improving it, through a unified or homogeneous reaction against the most serious offenses to the EU budget. And something that also Zlata were, I mean, stressing, the EPO is not merely a new layer to improve the coordination of national authorities, but is a EU body embedded in national judiciary and a systemic component of the rule of law in the EU. According to this, I mean, following this uh, main idea, uh, obviously, the persistent lack of homogeneity of internal legislation in this field would represent, and indeed represents, an evident a kill heel uh, of the overall system conceived by the EPO uh, legal framework, and the inadequacy of the legal context may have a significant impact on the work of the EPO, and especially it risks to hinder the EPO in effectively performing its duty as an authority charged with more than cooperation and coordination duties. Obviously, when we look at the, I would say, applicable law by the questions concerning the applicable law by the European uh, uh, Public Prosecutor Office, and especially the applicable law with concerning, I mean, the core of the competence of the app, that is to say the PIF offences, obviously the main uh, tool, the main instrument to look at is the report on implementation of the PIF directive, which uh, was issued by the Commission in September 2021. And here, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the outputs of this report uh, are that first, and I, I, I said that all the member states have transposed the main provisions of the directive, but there are still outstanding uh, conformity issues risking to seriously affect effective in investigations and prosecution by the EPO. This is really the crucial point in this, I mean, uh, in this respect. But as I mentioned, I, I will try to, I mean, to to clarify, before uh, I mean addressing the, the conformity issues of national legislation with respect to provisions in the PIF directive, I think that it is necessary to look at the inherent weaknesses of the legal context because these are the primary origins, I would say, of some deficiencies of the present legal uh, context. Uh, some, some of them were also stressed by Luca de Matteis, and I think that this uh, probably this inherent weakness should, I mean, should lead probably in the near future to an amendment, to a desirable amendment of uh, legal, of legal text. So I listed here just very briefly, I mean, the three main, I would say, uh, weaknesses of the EPO legal framework. Uh, first of all, obviously, this is uh, the one uh, I will essentially base my presentation, the definition of the EPO's material scope by a dynamic reference to the PIF directive, and the same uh, applies also concerning the framework decision uh, of uh, 2008 on organized crime as implemented by uh, national law. This is actually the main feature, as I told before, uh, of, the, of the, the directive. I must say that this uh, choice of the Commission was not just an original one, the sense that there was a precedent uh, concerning this dynamic reference, which was in, um, in 2013, concerning regulation 2000, uh, sorry, 1024, Confer significant controlling powers to the European Central Bank on uh, credit institutions. However, I must say that in the context, I mean, this approach, this method, in the context of the EPO regulation, I mean, is quite crucial since the boundaries of the uh, material scope of the EPO, so the material scope of an EU investigative authority, EU investigative body, depend on the directive as implemented by uh, national law. And this solution actually raised uh, very sensitive issues. I, I, I can, I mean, uh, refer to three main critical uh, issues. First of all, the um, first of all, the uh, the first crucial uh, issue is 
the link between the applicable law by the EPO and the crucial choice of the competent prosecutor or judge by the EPO itself. Because the fact that the applicable law is the result of the directive as implemented by national law, the choice of the EP, and in particular the choice from the permanent chambers about the member states where operating, opening, sorry, the investigation finally also implies the choice of the applicable law by the, by the EP. And this is a, an extremely sensitive point, an extremely sensitive question with respect to the principle of the natural judge, which is established as a fundamental uh, right in many of the participants' uh, member states. We know that Article 20 uh, sorry, 26 of the EPO regulation establishes uh, general criteria in order to, I mean, identify according to objective criteria, which is, I mean, the competent member states, so the competent uh, prosecutor, focusing on the focus on the territory, the member state, where the focus of criminal activity is, or where the bulk of the offences has been committed. But there are actually, again, as uh, Luca De Matesi was stressing, these expressions, uh, criminal activity, offences, are not, is not, I mean, are not clarified in, in, the, in the regulation, so there are no indication about how this situation must be assessed according only to objective criteria, for example, the number of offences, or mixing with some, I would say, uh, qualitative assessment, for example, concerning the uh, position of the accused or the relevance of the criminal organization to which the fraudulent behaviors can be uh, imputed. Moreover, Article 26, 26 uh, I mean, uh, uh, provides for derogation to this, uh, to this criteria, looking at the place of where the suspects or the accused as a habitual residence or the nationality or the main financial damage. Again, these uh, concepts, the notion, are not uh, defined by the regulation. And again, the permanent chamber can also decide to reallocate the case or to merge or split the cases and, for each case, choose the European delegated prosecutor handing the, 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 the case. If these decisions, I mean, is in the general interest of the justice. So any of this choice uh, significantly affects and may be evident, evident, uh, evidently uh, prejudicial to the accused person and his or her right to defense because obviously the defense strategy will depend on the applicable law according to the case. A second problematic issues, I mean, flowing from the, I mean, the, 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 this uh, uh, dynamic reference, is the difficult task, is the difficult task uh, for the uh, European public, uh, for the, the European public prosecutor, the delegated prosecutor, to correctly identify the national provisions which are to be considered as implementing directive, uh, implementing the PIF, I mean, the PIF directive. Um, the reason why this is a quite delicate issues is that we have to consider that most of the offences which are, uh, I mean, provided for in the directive were the object of previous harmonisation procedures. That means that most of them uh, are or should be already implemented in the legal system. And in this case, very often, the national, I mean, uh, I mean this, uh, the government does not need, does not feel that there is the need for a full draft full uh, new draft of law concerning the implementation of the directive. So this means that for the delegated prosecutor, there is, um, he will miss, I would say, a reference point, a reference test in order to ide correctly identify all the national provisions falling in the competence on the EPO. Because we have to consider, okay, that we have uh, uh, the um, the European, uh, European law establishes that there is need, we need, there is a formal notification to the Commission about the provisions that will, uh, will uh, give the boundaries of the, uh, of the competence of the EPO, but we, we, we need to stress that, uh, I mean, this competence is not defined only according to fundamental provisions, so provisions establishing the, the offences, but also 
many other provisions, provisions of the general part concerning, for example, aggravating circumstances, concerning, for example, other uh, general, I would say, clauses concerning extending the responsibility, the responsibility, um, the, I would say, the scope of application of a certain, of a certain um, offence. And then there is a third problematic uh, situation, that is to say the situation that a uh, uh, delegated prosecutor has to face when facing, uh, I mean, when, I mean, um, facing a non-conformity of his or her uh, national law implementing the PIF, the PIF directive. So, because, for example, one of the offences provided for in the directive is not established or is not established anymore in the uh, national in the national system or if he i mean he, he or she realizes that uh, there is a non full compliance of the league of the national law about the uh, concerning i mean the provisions in the directive I indicated in the presentation, for sure, there is the principle of consistent, uh, consistent uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, con the principle of consistent interpretation is not uh, just binding, I mean, the, the, the judge during, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the procedure, but also uh, the, uh, the prosecutors and especially European prosecutors. But we need to stress the limits that in criminal law this principle uh, this principle meets. Uh, there is the Court of Justice in its uh, quite, I mean, uh, very old, very, very well established jurisprudence since the, maybe the 80s. Uh, the Court of Justice states that according to the principle of legality that nowadays is enshrined in Article 49 of the, of the Charter, actually a directive cannot have the effect itself without an implementing law to establish new grounds of responsi criminal responsibility or even extend existing grounds of, of uh, responsibility. So it can happen that the uh, European delegated prosecutor, prosecutor can be somehow paralyzed if there is a non-fully compliance of the national law with respect to the provisions in the directive. We can imagine that there is a possibility for him or her as part of the European Public Prosecutor Office to notify to the Commission, to ask the Commission to start the procedure of in, an infringement procedure. Uh, but obviously this will take, this is okay, the good side I would say of the fact that the competence is established through a directive, but anyways it will uh, imply a certain, uh, I would say, uh, problem in the effectiveness of the action of the, of the, of the Apple. Okay, the second, I will just uh, go very, very, very fast on that. The second, I would say, main uh, inherent weakness of the Apple legal framework is, uh, I mean, depends on the fact that the, there was the choice to, for a minimum harmonization, not a very in-depth harmonization. I just put this, uh, uh, the reference of the two legal bases that were at stake concerning the, the directive, the PIF directive, Article 83, that was fin the final basis after the, during the negotiation, and also Article 325, which was the legal basis that was provided for the beginning from the, uh, by the Commission in its, uh, in its proposal. The fact that the choice was for a minimum harmonization implied uh, uh, that, uh, uh, I would say, the set of offences in the directive are quite limited. There is no autonomous offences with respect to procurement procedure. This, for example, an autonomous offence was provided for was provided for in the proposal of the Commission. But then, I mean, what remains, uh, I mean, there were a lot of criticism also, some very well-established criticism concerning the precision of the provision. And so what remains now is uh, the procurement procedure, the, the, uh, the, the only possibility is a form of fraudulent behavior in the frame of procurement procedures. No term of offenses with respect to violation of secret of office. Again, no common definitions of notions such as incitement, aid and abating, or attempt. And again, no provision providing criminal sanction other than imprisonment, no minimum threshold of sanction, very limited provisions on limitation periods, and non-complete EU model of responsibility of legal entities for criminal uh, offences. 
The other point, and I will really skip it, uh, of weakness uh, of the legal context uh, for app action is the, I mean, the, the, the change, the, import, the other important change that has been made during negotiation, that is to say the change from an exclusive competence into a shared competence with investigation authorities. This, I mean, made all the, uh, all the uh, mechanism much more uh, complex. There are a lot of very unclear criteria that should, uh, on, on which should rely this distribution of competence, and some of them also very, I would say, incoherent because they're referring to the level of sanctions at national uh, at level, and get very, very ambiguous concepts that can risk to give rise to numerous conflicts of jurisdiction that could impact, finally, on credibility uh, in addition to effectiveness of the EPO's actions. And then I go to, uh, I mean, once, uh, once uh, having done, I mean, having given somehow, somehow uh, I mean, an overview of these inherent uh, weaknesses, I come to the, I mean, the, the conformity issues in the strict sense. I mean, if we look at this report of the Commission, we can see that the uh, conformity issue mostly, but not exclusively, concern deficiency in national legislation transposing criminal definition of offences in Article 3, 4 and 5, that is to say in mean, all the set of offences, can, it can be striking that still we have problem of conformity with, with respect to the definition of fraud and about half of the member states actually uh, do not cover in this definition false, incorrect or incomplete statements or documents uh, when it is not written documents or for example they do not include non-disclosure of information or again, again concerning I mean, money laundering Thief offences sometimes are not established as predicate offences as required by the directive, or concerning corruption, I mean, the breach of duty is still a fundamental element in the definition. We have to, I, I need to stress that the uh, disappearance, uh, the fact that it was erased from the definition, the directive of uh, uh, corruption covering also the breach or requiring a breach of duty was one of the, I would say, one of the uh, improvement of the definition in in the, in the directory. So this is quite a sensitive point. And again, there is another point that was an improvement of the directive with respect to the previous third pillar instruments, is the definition of public official covering also uh, official from other member state, uh, sorry, from um, official from a third uh, member state, and also the de facto uh, public, the de facto public, uh, public, uh, public official. And then there is another limit, with concern, I mean, concerning the incitement, aiding and abating, that is not covering the criminalization of this conduct. And on this point, I think it's, uh, I, I, must, I, must, I must say, this is not just a problem of not fulfilling with the obligation of criminalization of the directive. Very often, this also impacts on precise choices of criminal policy at national level. This was, for example, the case concerning Italian legislation. The amending, I mean, the implementing legislation in Italy needed to actually to put implementing the directive to put actually a derogation to the general rule concerning the, I mean, the, uh, the exemption, I would say, the exemption uh, of, from punishment in, punishment in case of attempt of offences of fraudulent declaration by means of invoice in case of non-existent uh, transaction, transactions and also there was a, there were, the Italian legislature put an exception concerning in the area of custom offences, so the smuggling offences, to the uh, general rule of decriminalisation for offences punishable just with, uh, just with uh, fine. I conclude saying that, uh, I mean, as a conclude, I would say, uh, remarks. Uh, what appears is that um, it can be striking. The protection of the European budget remains still fragmented. And is, this is uh, um, the exact scope of the competence of the European investigating and prosecuting authority finally emerges from national legislation. And this is, of course, something that radically affects the idea of protecting supranational, uh, supranational uh, interest. Uh, but I want to finish with a, a kind of a more positive perspective, that is to say that anyway, this legal 
instruments actually uh, uh, um, triggered a new dynamic of integration of the member states' legal, uh, legal systems. And obviously, the main achievement was the fact that the all third pillars were actually changed, were replaced by a uh, first pillar instrument. Now, there is not anymore the difference between the first pillar, but by a directive, enabling the Court of Justice to assess member states' compliance with their implementing obligations. But now there is, in my opinion, a, a crucial point. Uh, everything that was not uh, solved uh, in the main taxes, that was the, actually the result of a compromise, of political compromise, then will put, I mean, will uh, tend to be the burden on the, on the, on the, on the shield, I mean, all the prosecutors, or the peer prosecutors, and probably also of the Court of Justice. Uh, in the sense that we can imagine that when assessing the non-compliance were concluded for non-compliance of national legislation, the Court of Justice could really contribute to solve some of the uh, problems in the wording of the legal text. This means that we cannot know, but uh, the Court of Justice could be in place of, I mean, uh, um, giving a definition, a first common definition about concepts, ambiguous concepts in the legal test. So, for example, just establishing autonomous concept. But uh, the, the question that I, I want to, I mean, to draw your attention, and probably there is a presentation from the the, the judge also at the end of the day, the judge from the Court of Justice, is, I mean, the Court of Justice well prepared to deal with all this kind of affairs, and we look also about, uh, uh, on the, uh, the, also the composition of the Court of Justice. And also, are we, are the member states prepared for such an evolution, this, for accepting that the Court of Justice staked a clear position on notions that were intentionally left ambiguous for political compromise? However, now the EPO is in place and the challenge is uh, nowadays to make it work properly and I really think that you cannot miss it. Thank you. Uh, I would like really to thank to Professor um, Sicurella for sticking to time, but also for this positive uh, perspective at the end which she gave. Because when reading the title of her presentation about IPO material competence and non-conformity of the national implementation, uh, uh, I thought that we are in a vicious circle because I really remember that uh, uh, from 90s, so from the convention, PIF convention in, in 1995, we are recycling this subject over and over and still we have a great problems with the uh, uh, implementation of the convention and now with the directive and uh, certainly uh, in the discussion part uh, we can discuss that because uh, some country actually uh, thought that the that implementation of the directive is uh, done with the uh, implementing legislation of the convention. <laughs> so as in Croatia and probably some other countries. Uh, but I will follow the structure of the session uh, which Peter introduced and I give the, will give the floor to our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Danilo Ceccarelli. He is a Deputy European Chief uh, Prosecutor of the European Public Prosecutor Office. He has been Italian uh, magistrate since 1995 and specialized in the prosecution of financial crime, tax fraud, corruption, organized crime, and money laundering, which will probably led him to this position where he is now. From uh, uh, 2013 to 2018, he was an international prosecutor uh, with the EU mission EULEX in Kosovo. And uh, from uh, 2018 to 2020, he was a prosecutor in Milan, of course, in the Department of Transnational Financial Crime and Corruption and International Cooperation. He was also Italian member uh, in the working group of uh, Financial Action Task Force. And since July last year, he is European prosecutor. And in November last year, or 2020, he was appointed the deputy uh, European chief prosecutor. So Mr. Ciaccarelli, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Professor uh, Djurjevic, for, uh, for the presentation. I don't have slides, so <laughs> I'm not going to, going to use this. Uh, right, um, it, was, it was very interesting for me uh, hearing a couple of uh, speakers today, especially Professor Sicurella. Actually, I think I'm going to give a speech, a speech that 
uh, is going to give some concrete examples of what happened uh, to the APO within the EPPO in this year of operational activity, uh, just, just to highlight how, in fact, the, the issues that Professor Sicurella uh, tried to point out, uh, in fact, materialized uh, in some very specific cases. And that's exactly like that. And that's, I mean, this, the name of this conference is Variable Geometries, and that's actually what we are talking about. And variable geometries depend uh, mostly uh, from the fact that the regulation, in the regulation, autonomous EU law and national legislation overlap. Uh, and, that's, and that is a problem. Why that is a problem now? It, it's always been a problem to some extent, but since the EPO started its operation, this is becoming a much bigger problem. Well, uh, what is really revolutionary within the PPO, uh, within the nature of the PPO, within the structure, is, is its, its, its powers, right? That's, that's what the Treaty on Functional European Union states. It's a, it's a body responsible for investigating, prosecution, prosecuting, and bringing to judgment, and exercise the function of prosecutor in the competent courts of the member states. So this is not an agency. This is actually not even a body. This is a judicial authority. You can call it as you wish. You can put it in the part of the treaty that you want. But this is a judicial authority. And it is supranational. So this is a, a different beast altogether. This is something unprecedented within the European Union. And, and the regulation states repeatedly that we operate as a single office. And in order to operate as a single office in the territory of 22 member states, you need consistent rules. Rules that are applicable in the same way or to a larger extent in the same way in the 22 member states. Otherwise, you have a problem. And we do have a problem. Although I have to say, uh, one year of operations by the EPPO is quite a success. What we have been able to do, what we are doing, uh, the size of the investigation, I mean, I was about to say complexity, but it seems today <laughs> it's not a fashionable word, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and and, and the, 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 the money we already recovered, the freezings and everything. You will hear some updated numbers tomorrow from the European Chief Prosecutor. We know that uh, the regulation didn't go as far as or the treaty as establishing something that was called, that was supposed to be called single legal territory. It's true, there is nothing like that, officially, formally. But in fact, we are operating in a very similar way. Because we have direct powers. We have direct powers within our investigation, and especially when it's cross-border investigation. This is really unprecedented. We don't need joint investigation team. We don't need mutual legal cooperation, we don't need uh, mutual recognition, we just take action, right? And whatever is legal operational issue is, is sorted out within the office, always in the, within the logic of the single office. So what we need is consistency. We strive for consistency. We've been really trying to achieve cons consistency throughout this year, but even before when we established the internal rules of procedure and and guidelines, like why, why do we have all these guidelines? Luca this morning showed you how many guidelines we have. You can find them on our website, actually. There's a lot of documents, but guidelines are really important. Uh, because we strive for consistency. Where do we find consistency? In the treaty, in the regulation, not so much. There's a lot of gaps, but it's normal. We understand how it was uh, negotiated, the compromise solutions that were found. And it was necessary, otherwise we wouldn't start. And we needed to start. And it's, it's, otherwise it's an endless negotiation that, in, that fails, that's doomed to failure. So we are, we are okay with that. We are very happy that we started, that we are operational, that we, we, have, we have our powers, and we opened our first investigation, and we are about to open our investigation number 1,000 in a few days. So uh, still, we are really looking forward to having more consistency, as, more, as much as possible. And that's why we addressed already the Commission and the Parliament with requests to fix 
the most urgent issues. The, let's say, the, 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 the fact that uh, these overlap of different legislations as an operational impact is, of course, very important for us, but as Professor Sicurella reminded you, it's also very important for everyone, for the citizens, for the parties to the case, for the suspect, for the victim, for anyone involved. Uh, don't forget that mostly we protect uh, collective interests of the, of the communities, of the states, of the union. And, and, and if we don't have a predictable and clear legal framework, uh, we violate principles, prin principle of legal certainty, you know, predictability, and that's a problem. That's a problem for us and for, for anyone else, for the system, I would say, for the citizens and for, for anyone who is involved. So, on competence, right? This is one of the things that we are flagging up all the time. Uh, it's important we are able to exercise competence in a way that it is understood from the outside. It shouldn't be so complex, and I need to use this word now, it, should, it shouldn't be so tangled Article 22, 25. You shouldn't have all these exceptions, rules and exceptions and sub-exceptions, because this is not understandable. And then again, you start reading the first article, which was already discussed uh, by Luca and by Professor Ciparella, and you read uh, something like that, that we are responsible for investigating and prosecuting uh, PIF, let's call it like that, uh, criminal offenses. So that's a concept. Offenses, criminal offenses, as implemented by national law. OK, right? So there are references national law. But then, <laughs> the Article 22 goes ahead and says, irrespective of whether the same criminal conduct, now it's a criminal conduct. It's not an offense. It's not a criminal offense. It's a criminal conduct. Is it the same thing? Well, I don't think so. And irrespective of whether the same criminal conduct could be classified as another type of offense under national law. So you have a rule, you apply national law, but you don't at the same time. You don't apply it in, in, respect, in respect to the, not to the criminal offense, but to the criminal conduct. It makes a huge difference. When you go and read Article 25, it changes the whole scenario. If you use the concept of Offense, criminal offense, single offense, or more offenses changes the whole scenario. So when, when are we able to exercise our competence, and where, especially? So criminal conduct is used, again, as a concept in the regulation, repeatedly. It, it, there is no reference to the, to the national law there. The reference to the national law is uh, in, in respect of PIF offenses, offenses, criminal offenses. Criminal conduct seems something else. It seems an autonomous concept of EU law that is throughout the regulation uh, very often. So we have to understand what it is. And we don't have a case law, of course, because we just started. There are there, there's other concepts. I mean, this morning was it was already mentioned uh, the allocation rule, for example, Article 26, and there they talk about the focus. Well, okay. Very happy about that. This is a new concept again, <laughs> because international legislations is very different, and and of course each nation legislation has a different criteria, a different rule, right? The most serious offense, the first offense, whatever it is. Uh, here we have the focus, and of course we cannot take in, uh, take on board national legislations here because we need to make one decision, and and this is when we have jurisdiction of two or more member states. So we cannot apply either one or the other. We need to apply a, a, a distinct and independent concept. And also, the, the focus is a word that is used in Article 22.2 uh, when the EPPO has to decide whether to exercise the competence for organized crime, which is like very important, obviously, for us because it encompasses a lot of very serious criminal activities, and for us, it's a priority. So again, we have the concept of focus, which is different from the, the concepts that are in Article 25, uh, because either we look at organized crime or we look at 
underlying offenses. So again, here we have two issue guidelines, and then the, the legal value of guidelines, Luca already discussed, it's there for you to consider, but of course, there are guidelines. So <laughs> uh, it's something that, yeah, we, we might call it soft law, but maybe not even that, because it's internal to the prosecutor's office. So the first judge or the first national authority that doesn't, doesn't agree, it's gone. No? They give their own interpretation. And, and, and there's, there's also a cultural, a cultural approach that, that I would like to point out. Uh, using national law is a kind of defense that's almost uh, automatic. Uh, it's, it, it's also within the PPO, uh, colleagues from, including me, from different member states, we have often the tendency to say, but my national legislation states this and that, and we have to apply that. Uh, we should put it the other way around, maybe. It's first EU legislation, then, if it's the case, national legislation, if compatible. Uh, and, and, and it is even more true from the national authorities, prosecutors' offices, judges, law enforcement agencies, custom agencies, whatever. We have this fight ongoing forever. It's a it's big fight. You know of all the issues and the judgments of the Court of Justice in respect of these, and, and as regards some specific member states, but not only them. This is a very general issue. It's, it's, it's across the table. It's across the board. Uh, so what, what really happens when we exercise the competence? We have a few very uh, difficult uh, concepts to, to, to focus on. And, and of course, the first one is uh, the concept of inextricably linked offenses, which it was discussed by Professor Clip this morning, and, and uh, he was right. Uh, uh, but uh, in recalling the jurisprudence and the case law of the Court of Justice mm, about the European Nebisinidem, let's call it like that. Uh, uh, but that is, Nebisinidem is a tool, is a legal tool to protect the rights of the defendant, of the suspect. And here it is used as an operational criteria for exercising the competence of a prosecutor's office. How different is that? It's, it's, in, it's on a different planet altogether. And this idea of inextricably linked offenses for exercising the competence, it's not consistent with any national legislation. Where? Because we exercise the competence and we keep together investigations for connected offenses, connected criminal conducts even if not inextricably, because this concept of inextricably was elaborated with a different purpose, with a totally different purpose. So this is the first problem. And then we have even uh, additional exceptions. For example, 22.4 states that this rule does not apply to national direct taxes. Why not? <laughs> What's wrong with that? Any other offense? OK, but national direct tax is not. And this is, this is creating problems. Uh, there's, and the first asymmetry. So we can exercise competence in some member states where this is not a problem. But in other member states where this is a problem, we cannot. Because in some member states, direct ta taxes are dealt with on an administrative level. So there's no problem for us. Other member states, it's criminal. So we cannot take the case. But often these cases have cross-border dimension, well, most of them, I would say. So how can we work exercising the competence in one member state but not in the other one when the criminal conduct is carried out in both the member states? This is the first asymmetry. So then we have different criteria in Article 25. Criterion of higher punishment, interleaked offenses. Uh, but then this is regulated differently in different member states. Uh, for example, we have member states where exactly the same criminal conduct, again, criminal conduct, different concept, is described in two different offices, where the only difference is that one office is committed to the detriment of the European Union and one office is committed to the detriment of the national budget. But it's exactly the same criminal conduct. So can we exercise the competence or not there? The punishment is the same. Let's assume that. And so we cannot. But in the neighborhood country, yes, we can. Because they have just one offense 
where the criminal conduct is described and the victim can be either or. So it doesn't change really nothing, anything at all. But we can not exercise the competence. So asymmetry, uh, higher damage. Case of smuggling, the criterion is higher damage. Uh, again, this is different in different member states. We know we have custom fees, duties, uh, VAT, excises, and then again, depending on the specific national legislation, we can either exercise the competence or not. But these offenses have all a cross-border dimension. There are transnational crimes, and very often there is organized criminal group. Can we really uh, investigate in one member state and not in the other? So what happens there? And, and there's, we, we have policies, we have interpretation. It's different. Sometimes PIF directive seems implemented, but then you look at the way it is interpreted, and it's different, and it's not consistent. And then we have policy. For example, tobacco smuggling in a few member states, they don't think it's a crime. It's, a, it's not a PIF crime at all. So we don't even receive information. What can we do there? We exercise the competence in one member state, two, or maybe three, but not in other one, two, three, or four. And these cases go to the national prosecutors, and sometimes to more than one. We have cases where we have to, we have to talk to three different national prosecutors from the same member state. And we have to do that through the mechanism of Article 31, which means through our European delegated prosecutors from another member state. How complicated that is. That's, that's really a problem. But also it affects, as I said, the suspect. They would like to understand who is prosecuting. Just one counterpart. Understanding who is competent, who is doing what, so that I can go to talk and talk to one person, to one authority. So is this, I don't know, selective justice maybe, because there is no predictability, no consistency. There is a huge operational problem in cross-border cases, and there is this huge necessity to keep coordination mechanism with national prosecutor, which in the regulation is not foreseen at all. Because we are supposed to work as a single office, which we do, but either we exercise the competence or the national authorities, not a split situation like, like it is now. So what we need is an urgent fix something that really fixes this asymmetry. We need a system, I don't know what, but it has to be thought after very carefully, where we are able to act consistency. The response can be yes or no. You exercise the competence or you don't, but it has to be consistent in all the member states. Otherwise, this is going to be a problem. And this kind of problem allocation rule, competence, and everything should be referred to the, to the Court of Justice as soon as possible, because national case law is very shaky when it comes to these kind of things. Consider that we had two conflicts of competence with national authorities where these issues were at stake, and both the national authorities refused to refer the issue to the Court of Justice, although we told them, look, you have to do that. It's not only 267, it's also a recital 88 of the regulation that puts this burden, this obligation, on, on the courts of the member state. And they refused because they think that their interpretation was right, was correct, there was no problem, there was no doubt, right? Fortunately, an, a court from Austria uh, recently did it, referred the issue to the to the Court of Justice, but not on competence, on cross-border investigation. So we, and, and we put pressure on them in order to do that, because we need a consistent case law, right? So that's what we, we are looking forward. Thanks. I would like to thank the Mr. Ciccarelli for his uh, excellent presentation, where he uh, emphasized that uh, EPO is single office, and it is a supranational without the border, but the problems are not at the border. There are no more these legal or physical uh, problems at the border, but the problems are in the national uh, justice systems. Uh, and we have here this uh, traditional conflict between the efficiency of uh, prosecution and the human rights on the, on the other side. 
uh, one part of these problems is unsurmountable. So we cannot overcome it without changes in the national criminal justice system, and this is the principle of legality. In the criminal law, as we all know, uh, it's uh, the absolute and non-derogable human right, and without uh, correct implementation, which uh, Professor Rosaria said, of the, the PIF directive, the EPO cannot function properly. Uh, however, there is the other side of the problem, which is the procedural one and defense rights, uh, which we are going to address in, I believe, in our next presentation uh, by Professor Dr. Uh, Dominic Borodevsky. I would like to introduce him. So he is a junior professor of criminal law and criminal procedure law at the Sandral University. Uh, by his accomplishments, I wouldn't say that he is a junior professor. <laughs> Uh, he is teaching criminal law. He specializes in criminal law and digitalization, uh, especially in the European, international, constitutional, and interdisciplinary context. He is a very prolific writer. He has a long list of publications in the field, especially European criminal law. And particularly, I would like to point out that he is one of the co author uh, with here present Hans Holger Henfeld and Christoph Burhardt of the EPPO commentary article by article, which I believe is the most comprehensive and elaborated commentary, which is of great help to all of us, not only in the practice, but in the uh, academia also. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Borodovsky, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and also many thanks to Katalin and to Panos for organizing this conference and inviting me to this outstanding conference. Dear distinguished participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, now we are right before lunch and I guess some of you already will, uh, will feel quite hungry. To those I have to apologize for increasing your hunger, not only because of the next 20 minutes you will have to listen to me, but also because I will relate to this fear. Um, somehow the slides do not work. The fear that, well, you should see now a piece of um, the fear that this piece of chocolate, which shall resemble a piece of evidence in my presentation, the fear that this piece of chocolate becomes inaccessible or inadmissible. And in European criminal justice, it truly seems that there is a long-standing worry or even fear that evidence once obtained in one jurisdiction is inadmissible as evidence in another jurisdiction. This was already highlighted in the Tampere conclusions which compared evidence wrongly to marketable products, but evidence is not a chocolate bar. As was demanded back then, EU primary law now allows for the creation of a directive on the mutual admissibility of evidence between member states. But we do not yet have such a directive. And the EPO regulation did not create a European rulebook on criminal procedure, but only contains fragmentary rules on evidence gathering and the admissibility of evidence. Is this a worrisome lacuna? Is the question of admissibility of evidence especially problematic in EPO proceedings and warrants urgent action by the European legislature? Or do we fear too much and there will be sufficient chocolate or other food available for everyone at lunch and sufficient um, evidence available and admissible in EPO proceedings. These are the main questions I will address in my presentation. And as many distinguished authors have already published on this topic, some of those are present here today, I will try to take a different perspective and not start with the admissibility of evidence but with its opposite, the inadmissibility of evidence. And this few points rests on the basis that it is the admission of evidence which requires justification. 
and that it is not a problem as such if evidence is inadmissible in a criminal prosecution or in a trial. Instead, there are a number of highly legitimate reasons why criminal justice systems around Europe and the globe place limits on the admissibility of evidence. First of all, some evidence may be too unreliable. Just think of the hearsay rule in the US or that a report on a um, witness statement just written by, by the police may be um, considered, at least in some jurisdictions, to be less reliable compared to a witness statement in court. Some evidence may be protected by privileges and immunities. The use of other evidence may be disproportionate and run afoul of the purpose limitation principle. Some areas, such as the core area of private conduct of life, are off limits to the state. Last but not least, to preserve and protect the rule of law in the gathering of evidence, it may be justified or even required to declare evidence obtained illegally to be unavailable for investigation and prosecution. However, there are situations when the inadmissibility of evidence is not based on a legitimate reason. For example, if that is based merely on the foreign origin of um, evidence, then it would constitute evidence xenophobia to declare it inadmissible merely on that ground. In a similar vein, the violation of mere formalities without effect on the reliability of evidence and without effect on the human and fundamental rights protection should not lead to evidence becoming inadmissible. The problem, which is perceived as largest, are incompatibilities between different legal systems leading to evidence becoming inadmissible. Such as if evidence is obtained in one member state according to its rules, the lex loci, but incompatible to the rules of the member state where the trial takes place, the lex fori. Yet which rules should prevail? Here lies the heart of the problem. Those who call for easier admissibility of evidence mistrust the laws on the use of evidence in the forum state. Those who refer to the protection offered in the forum state mistrust the laws on evidence gathering in the other state. Is it also a problem if there are overly excessive rules on inadmissibility of evidence? Certainly, but that viewpoint is too one-sided. As there are legitimate reasons for evidence becoming inadmissible, both too restrictive and too permissive rules on the admissibility of evidence are a problem. We must look at both sides and both boundaries and their sources in EU primary law and national constitutions. In between these two bounds, the configuration of criminal justice systems may differ based on legitimate legislative choices. Turning now to the specifics in EPA proceedings, it is important to note that the question of admissibility of evidence is, to a very large extent, not addressed by the regulation. Instead, Per the scope of the EPA regulation, it is the national law of the forum state which determines which evidence it is admissible and which is not. For example, for prosecutions in Germany, the same lenient rules on the admissibility and non-use of evidence as in national proceedings continue to apply and allow to admit even most evidence which was taken in violation of the rule of law. Moreover, German courts are very reluctant to review the legality of foreign evidence taking and only tend to consider violations of the Ordre Public. And therefore, German courts have no problem, for example, to admit and use the EncroChat evidence in prosecutions of tra trafficking. However, the German legal order pays at least some attention to protect privileges and immunities and to preserve the proportionality principle as well of the purpose limitation of data. Yet, 
as mentioned earlier, such grounds are well legitimized and do not pose a problem even in light of the need for an effective prosecution of PIF offenses. This approach taken by the European legislature preserves coherence within the national criminal justice systems in the member states and allows for a more or less easy integration of the EPO into these national criminal justice systems. It also means that prosecutors and courts can refer to existing legislation and case law to determine the admissibility of evidence. However, and this is important, in the context of EPO proceedings, these national rules on the admissibility of evidence are bound by the Charter of Fundamental Rights on the one hand, and Article 325 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and the requirement of effective prosecution of PIF offences on the other hand. And therefore, these rules on the admissibility of evidence must not deviate too much from an European consensus. Nonetheless, a consequence of this approach of coherence within national criminal justice systems is that the long-standing questions of cross-border admissibility of evidence remains largely unsolved. An alternative to this approach was clearly on the table. However, with academic proposals such as from Henning Ratzke in 2005, and then later on this large study on EPO model rules um, led uh, this project led by Katalin Ligeti. They suggest creating an EPO-specific legal order on criminal investigations across Europe. That would indeed help to harmonize the investigation and ease the cross-border admissibility of evidence. However, such an alternative approach would also cause high tension with national criminal justice systems. The EPO and its investigations would remain a stronger and out, a stranger and outlier in national courts. Moreover, such a harmonized approach would only have to help for investigations solely within this highly specialized EPO order. Evidence obtained in other national investigations and then transferred to the EPO would still be subject to the same or even to larger problems as we know today. And therefore, I think that the approach taken in the regulation is actually of advantage and better seats the current state of European integ integration in particular as the regulation and the European criminal justice do not remain at the status quo ante, but contain some elements to strengthen the admissibility of cross-border evidence. The first and most prominent such element is Article 37 of the regulation, and particularly its paragraph 1. It declares that evidence presented by the prosecutors of the EPO or the defendant must not be denied admission on the mere ground that the evidence was gathered in another member state or in accordance with the law of another member state. As my colleague Christoph Burchardt explained in the commentary, this wording must not be read literally. Instead, it extends also to other participants in the criminal trial, to other faces, of the investigation and prosecution and to all provisions limiting the use of evidence. However, what to make out of the phrase mere ground? Silvia Allegrezza and Anna Mosner pointed out that the potential to deny admission of evidence on the ground that it was gathered abroad persists as long as there is one additional reason to do so besides its foreign origin. I would go beyond that. While Article 37, Paragraph 1, accepts that there may be legitimate grounds to declare evidence inadmissible, it sets out a standard of non-discrimination. Evidence must not be discriminated against because of its foreign origin. And any ground to declare evidence inadmissible must be legitimate in particular in light of Article 325 and the primary law requirement of effective investigation and prosecution of PIF offences. For instance, the ECJ reiterated in 2019 in its CISWEF judgment 
that member states must ensure that the rules of criminal procedure permit effective investigations and prosecution of PIF offenses. And that national courts may have to disapply national provisions, I add also national provisions on the inadmissibility of evidence, to, which prevent the applica application of evidence and deterrent penalties to counter fraud affecting the financial interests of the mm -hmm. Union. But in the same judgment, the ECJ accepted that evidence gathered by the interception of telecommunication may be inadmissible if a lawful judicial wiretap order is missing, even if that runs counter to an effective prosecution of PIF offenses. And yet another point is important. Article 37 does not set out a requirement to trial courts to review the legality of the evidence gathering, in particular in cross-border situations. That means that, for example, German courts may continue to refuse to review the legality in such cross-border situations. A second element strengthening the admissibility of cross-border evidence are Articles 31 and 32 of the regulation which govern cross-border investigations, as well as Article 30 on investigation measures. These pro provisions do neither follow a mutual recognition model nor a single legal area model, but instead provide for a very specific, complex, complicated mechanisms. But three features stand out in relation to the present topic. Firstly, Article 31 addresses the question of differing or multiple requirements for judicial authorization of an investigation measure. And that issue can lead to concerns regarding the admissibility of evidence, as was highlighted by Katalin de Gitti and others in an article in Eukrim. To resolve this specific issue, the EPO regulation clearly states that one judicial authorization is sufficient in cross-border situations, and that this should be obtained in the member state where the investigation measure is executed, unless only the law of the handling EDP requires judicial authorization. Then, Article 32 sets out the same three-step approach known from the European investigation order regarding the uh, locus rigid actum or forum rigid actum dispute. As a starting point, investigation measures are executed based on the law of the executing or assisting member state. However, formalities and procedures expressly indicated by the handling EDP must be complied with unless, and that is the third step, unless those are contrary to the fundamental principles of law of the assisting member state. As long as the forum remains the same between the investigation and the trial, and that, of course, is a problem here, this approach allows to mitigate any risks of inadmissible evidence. Last but not least, paragraphs 1 to 3 of Article 30 should be taken into account. These require a partial harmonization of national criminal procedure with regard at least to some investigations measures which have to be available to EDPs in EPO investigations. And although that harmonization is quite limited and far away from a single legal area, it still can reduce tensions between the legal orders in the participating member states and therefore strengthen the admissibility of evidence. A third element strengthening the admissibility of cross-border evidence is more procedural in nature. Any declaration of cross-border evidence to be inadmissible must be balanced with the, with the requirement of European primary law that there must be sufficient tools available for an effective investigation and prosecution of PIF offenses. At the same time, the protection of procedural rights is also a requirement of EU primary law, and Article 41 of the regulation calls upon the EPO to carry out its activities in full compliance with the Charter. To verify that these two boundaries found in EU primary law are met, that the national laws on admissibility of evidence are neither too restrictive nor too permissive, we will likely see and need to see more jurisprudence by the ECJ in future, building upon that CVEF judgment in 2019. 
What is more, such case law more pro may provide for further insights into the real scope of the problem of admissibility of evidence. We will see, then see whether the worries by Silvia Allegretza and Anna Mosner become true that the non-admission of cross-border evidence will be a highly probable result, a worry also shared by Adrian Sandru and others. My interpretation is, for the time being, a bit different. For the current state of European integration, a more far-reaching harmonization of criminal procedure was and is not feasible. But the regulation and EU primary law provide for sufficient steps towards being united in diversity. For the time being, we should trust in the national rules on the admissibility of evidence and that they are well balanced between the requirements of efficient prosecutions and the legitimate grounds restricting the admissibility of evidence. And if they are not well balanced and not within these boundaries of EU primary law, the ECJ will have to step in. So let's trust for the time being in enough evidence being admissible and enough chocolate being available. Oops. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to thank to Dr. Brodowski for his really insightful and clear presentation in this very, very complex field. And despite this chocolate on the screen, which certainly invites you to have a chocolate on your plates, I would now invite you to give your observations and questions to our excellent speakers. Uh, Yes, please. One eight nine. Mine is red. I think. Oh, okay, please. <laughs> I suppose I can speak. Um, thank you, uh, Zlata, and to the uh, uh, members of the panel for their presentations. I have a, a question to, uh, to my friend Danilo. Um, um, you and you yourself on various occasions and in the EPPO as an institution have been advocating the quick fix, uh, which probably sounds easier than it will be in practice. Um, I refer to the six-point letter that you have sent to the ministers and according to rumors to the commission as well a while ago. Um, if it were actually to come to that, um, would you, I wonder, equally appreciate having a wider margin of appreciation to, to, to decide on things like the opening of investigations, on, on not prosecuting in certain cases, on transferring cases to national authorities, or perhaps dismiss cases based on the operational practice that you have so far. Thank you. Uh, easy, easy question is we need consistency and whatever you, whatever they decide, <laughs> we, will, we will accept it. So that's the most important thing. Having said that, of course, it's a political choice from, from, the, from the legislator side to decide to which extent uh, the role of the EPO and the principle of subsidiarity, which recital 12 of the regulation expresses so well, explains so well, uh, is, is really important. So what the role of the EPO is supposed to be, because they say in recital 12 that the financial interest of the union and I would add also of the member states when it's actually really linked to that are not have not been protected in the right way. So that's why, allegedly, they established the EPPO. So it's, it's really up to them. But for us, I repeat, the most important thing is to have a set of rules that ensure consistency in all the member states. So if the decision is, that, is to take off or to have us to refer cases to the national authorities or to dismiss them, let's see, uh, well, it's fine anyway. The important thing is uh, consistency. Thank you, Nicholas, for your question. Madam, would you like to pose uh, a question? Thank you. 
Um, I also have a question for Dr. Danilo Seccarelli. And first of all, uh, congratulations for your interesting presentation. Um, could you please uh, share your opinion as why to Article 22, paragraph 4, excludes direct taxation from the EPO intervention? And uh, could it be related to the lack of harmonization in direct taxation? Could it be related to the type of own resources of the European Union? Thank you very much. Oh, well, here you have a lot of people who were there when the negotiations were carried out. Hans Volger, Luca, I mean, like, they can tell you something more. I was not there when the negotiations were, was, was carried out and when someone on a certain day drafted that, <laughs> all right? But I assume that, I mean, as, I, as far as I understand, but then if someone else wants to add something, uh, that there was quite a discussion uh, and heated debate about the borders. To, to which extent the competence of the PPO is supposed to include offenses or conducts that do not affect the financial interest of the union. And so they put boundaries, boundaries. And this one was like apparently like a no-no, <laughs> like not even if it's inextricably linked. Uh, I understand that, but. 153. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, now, now yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I have two questions for two panelists, uh, for Dr. Danilo Ceccarelli and for the Professor uh, Rosaria Sicurella. And all mm, these two questions start from the consideration that there are some uh, elements of inconsistency in the regulation, the EPPO regulation, which can come from something said in the regulation and something unsaid, which is not, uh, uh, which where, where, where that are not considered in the regulations. So some element of inconsistency coming from the silence of the regulation. And about this last point, I want to refer to Danilo Ceccarelli, the, this question. The regulation does not consider, does not impose to the PPO to follow a mandatory principle like in the Italian Constitution in the Article 112. Do you think that this silence can be overcome uh, thanks to a specific interpretation of some rules and some recitals of the regulation. And so do you think that the EPPO, according to this interpretation of these rules and these uh, recitals of the regulation, is imposed by, uh, to the, uh, on, uh, to the uh, EPPO, even though in silence? And on the other side, uh, for Professor uh, um, Sicurella, um, there are other elements of inconsistency coming from the norms regulating the competence, the material competence of the EPPO, as you uh, talked about before. Um, my question is about the role of the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. And maybe you understood the question. Uh, the role of the Court of Justice in, in interpreting the, these rules and above all the articles 22 and 25 of the regulation after a referral um, made by the national authorities empowered to solve the conflicts of competence. Because if we look at our, uh, the, the Italian legal system, we have uh, uh, um, national authorities which will have the competence to solve these conflicts, which is the, uh, general, uh, pro, uh, the general prosecutor office at the Court of Cassation, that will have this power. But according to the ECJ jurisprudence, these uh, authorities is not uh, an authority is empowered to make a referral to the uh, ECJ to solve the uh, problem, the, the problems uh, related to the interpretations of the Article 22 and 25 of the regulations um, uh, as the regulation uh, allows. So I want to understand your uh, answers about these two uh, topics. Thanks. Uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's 
a matter of language and translation, right? What we in Italy call mandatory prosecution, which is enshrined in the Constitution, uh, very often internationally is called principle of legality as opposed to principle of opportunity. And already this morning, I think it was Professor Andre Klipp who explained that the EPO regulation is based on principle of legality, so prosecution is mandatory. That's the way we read the regulation, and in fact, colleagues that are at odds with the regulation are colleagues that come from member states where there is the principle of opportunity. So, for example, the Dutch colleague, <laughs> just to put forward an example, and, um, and so they have to change the approach, uh, because that's the way we read it. Uh, mandatory prosecution, it's quite a uh, shared view that uh, the regulation, the APPO regulation, foresees mandatory prosecution and principle of legality. It's, it's from the terminology that is used, and it's, it's a shell, shell everywhere. So it's, there's no much option. And uh, also, if you look at the cases for dismissal, Article 31, which is not an exhaustive list anyway, mm -hmm. but you see that there is no space for opportunity, not at all. Uh, a different thing is the shared competence between the PPO and the national authorities. And for example, then on the same case, if we refer the case back to a national authorities, for example, to the Netherlands, they reactivate the principle of opportunity in accordance with, with their national legislation. But then it's, it's no longer an EPO case. So that's it. Just to, um, I mean, it's a quite difficult question, but was actually the, the question I was with, with which I was concluding my, my presentation. So the role that can be played by the European Court of Justice. Of sure, I mean, for sure, one of the, uh, I stress, one of the improvements in the actual legal context is the fact that now we are, I mean, basing, I mean, the, the, the action of the EPO is based on a, uh, on a legal instrument such as the directive, and so you have the Court of Justice that obviously can be uh, asked to assess, you know, the, uh, the, 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 in assessing compliance of national legislation, would, would probably be in a, in a position to give, uh, I mean, a common definition of some of these concepts. I believe that this should be also the, 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 the I mean, the way towards. I think it's, it's, it's impossible to solve a problem of conformity of the directive without uh, taking a position about this concept. The question is, whether, I mean, whether the, I mean, as I was saying, um, the, the, the court can really, I mean, whether this is fully desirable that we move in this direction. So it's true that the only way would be at the beginning just through the interpretation of the European Court of Justice, but because of the principle of legality in the strict sense, so in the, in the principle of legality, this is not the most desirable way in the, as the legal framework, because also we have to know that, okay, there is a general interpretation of the European Court of Justice, but anyway is a uh, decision of the Court of Justice about a concept that were, as I said, intentionally left ambiguous. So, um, in my opinion, also maybe with the support from inside of the, of the EPO, I think that the best solution would in any case be, uh, I mean, an amendment that changes of some of these of this, uh, crucial terms in, uh, in uh, uh, defining the competence of the, of the EPO. But I, I, I really believe, because already the European Court of Justice already took in the past position about some concepts of legal instruments than then, for example, like the, 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 the serious negligent or some concepts that finally were uh, established for the very first time in the ECJ jurisprudence. Maybe the last question, if there is. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Chakrali, if I may. Because um, the problematics arising from the lack of definition uh, in a regulation were addressed, and specifically I was 
thinking about the uh, Article 22, Paragraph 2, if I'm not getting it right, wrong about the, um, the, def the, the criminal organization. So, and I was thinking about and how problematic the, the focus, the so-called focus of the criminal activity uh, is. And I was thinking about corruption, which is somehow maybe an overlooked PIF offense because of the uh, difficult, uh, difficulties in detecting such this kind of crime. So I was thinking, and specifically in light of how uh, in the Italian legal system it has been uh, built and addressed the, uh, the, the corruption in relation to mafia type organizations, I was wondering, can it be said uh, that corruption is, is somehow the focus, you know, the, the, the focus of a criminal activity uh, of a criminal and the mafia type organization or is mostly some kind of instrumental tool for mafia type organizations to uh, commit other type of crimes. So can actually the Apple assess and uh, um, apply and assess the comp is, um, its competence over uh, this, uh, this, this, this crime when criminal and mafia type of criminal organizations are related to this corruption or maybe is it necessary for the court, criminal, uh, you know, for criminal national courts to refer the question to the you know, the, the, the European Court of Justice. Thank you. And there was a short question, I believe, on in the last row there, so we can take it simultaneously, if you can. Was there a question? Yeah, please. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for the floor. I'm Peter Clement. I'm the European Prosecutor for the Czech Republic. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Sicurella for uh, the, the contribution. And uh, it's more of a comment, maybe also a question concerning that the first part of the speech concerning uh, the indication that the per that a permanent chamber could or can influence in a way uh, the member state or the place where the criminal criminal investigation takes place. So I would like to add that we should remember that uh, it also has some limits and uh, the, that member state has to have a jurisdiction over, over the criminal offence at the first place. So, uh, in fact, it's not possible to... Uh, well, actually, actually, this question brings uh, directly the, 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 the issue of uh, forum shopping. So, uh, I think it's not entirely possible to, to decide freely for the permanent chamber to uh, reallocate the case from, let's say, Italy to Finland without Finland having the jurisdiction over the criminal offence. So isn't the situation, in fact, the same as it used to be before EPO was established, before, even before it was possible to, tra to transfer criminal proceedings from one member state to another member state, let's say, on the basis of the 1972 convention or even 1959 convention. So. Isn't the whole issue a little bit uh, exaggerated? Thank you. Thank you. If we can have a short yes. answers, please. I mean, I did not actually, I did not refer to a forum shopping question. So I, I did not look at the question in that, in that, in that respect. But anyway, I mean, the fact of uh, uh, differences in the treatment of you see, I mean, you have the, the, these differences in national law implemented directive have consequences. So I'm, I, I don't think when I was stressing this, I would say, competence of the permanent chamber in attributing, uh, I was not thinking about or I was not stressing questions of forum shopping. But anyway, these decisions affect. The, 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 I mean, the person and, uh, and the, predictability, the predictability of the applicable law and all that. So uh, this, is a, this is anyway a critical point. Yeah, uh, just uh, a question about uh, organized crime and corruption. We have to change the way we see at this, we, we look at these things, right? It's not organized crime and the focus is corruption or not corruption. Actually, we are used to thinking in terms of organized crime and underlying offenses, so corruption, fraud, and drug trafficking, whatever. No, no. The focus of a criminal organization is 
in the cases that we, 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 where we exercise the competence, obtaining EU money, EU funds, or depriving you from the wrong resources. Is this done through corruption, fraud, uh, other offenses, whatever you want to call it? It does not matter. It's the focus it means the criminal activity, not you should not, we should not focus on, anymore on specific offenses, on specific counts, because then we lose the rationale behind that. So if corruption, if, if traffic of influence, if, if fraud, if, if forgery, if whatever is a tool to obtain you money or to deprive you from the wrong resources, this is within EPPO. So it includes everything. And of course, mafia style organized crime they do that. <laughs> so we are fully competent if, it's, if their focus is that one. Problem is that when the focus is that one and the other sectors, area, there is nothing in the regulation, so that's where we issued guidelines. So without any further ado, I have to invite you for the lunch, which will be served upstairs. And we are back in half an hour, so at uh, 2 o'clock for the section in the afternoon. And maybe we can just uh, thank to our excellent speakers once again. Yeah, downstairs, so not on this floor, but downstairs. I didn't say this. I thought I was having practical info, the most important part. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third session. When I arrived yesterday by train, the train was late. And after a few stops, there was an announcement, this train will not proceed till the final destination. Please get out of the train. I don't want to come into a situation like that. I think this is not an option for this panel. But I think we have to start right now. So please take a seat. And um, well, let's start. The title of session three is the EPO in the area of freedom, security, and justice, and as a global actor. So the EPO is crucially dependent upon effective cooperation fun uh, functioning cooperation mechanisms. And as we have heard in the morning sessions, we have to distinguish three groups of state in that regard. The member states participating in the EPO, the member states not participating in the EPO, and third countries, that is, non-member states. So it is an honor and pleasure to share this session with such distinguished speakers. And um, we will start with a presentation on cross-border investigations in participating member states that are subject to the most advanced cooperation framework. It goes beyond mutual recognition because the obligation to carry out the requested measure is not limited by grounds of refusal. However, it still refers to a large extent to the national law of the assisting European delegated prosecutors. And I suppose this might be one of the reasons why our first speaker raised the question whether the existing framework is advanced enough already ripe for reform. Let me introduce to you Mr. Andres Schritter. He served in various functions in the German prosecution service for 25 years. He is an expert in the law of international cooperation in criminal matters, but also with regard to economic crime. He had a two public prosecution offices in Germany, most recently as chief prosecutor at the specialized pros public prosecution office for economic crime and cybercrime in Rostock, before he joined the EPO as European public prosecutor in 2020. And in November 2020, he was appointed deputy European chief prosecutor. And uh, Mr. Ritter, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very, very kind presentation. Actually, yes, this is probably one of the reasons uh, why I wanted to join EPO in any case, because I experienced the development of uh, uh, international cooperation coming from mutual legal assistance to mutual recognition, and I'm very happy to be at the EPO right now. You talked about uh, the question whether it would be more advanced uh, than, the, than the previous forms. And my first um, assessment would be, yes, definitely it is. However, there are some problems, and I would like to share my views, uh, just a disclaimer that it, uh, what I'm going to present are mainly my views. Uh, to a certain extent, this, those are views which are agreed in the college. Uh, but the point being that we have been able to establish how this whole system is working. Uh, in any case, um, all areas of cross-border investigations of uh, the EPO, which we are going to discuss in, in, in this section, are, in my view, linked uh, by a fundamental general challenge that we have. That the EPO is not a member state authority, and it does not relate to a state as a legal subject, uh, which is well established and defined beforehand under international law, but it's a supranational prosecution office of the European Union. And this makes, of course, quite a difference. The challenge is, I think, very, very obvious when we are talking about uh, what the, the estimated colleagues were, we will be talking about. It's very obvious when we are talking about uh, non-participating member states, third countries. But um, even if it's not so obvious, it is also a problem which we established in the 22 participating member states. Um, in their decentralized action, the EDPs, the European Delegated Prosecutors, are just as dependent on structures and procedures 
um, that have developed first from the mutual legal assistance and then from the mutual recognition between states. And those structures and procedures, they are still embodied in the national legal orders. So the challenge which arises is that we have to fit a supranational institution for which a new set of rules apply into the established procedural orders in the participating member states, which additionally differ from each other. So talking about this, and as you all know, and it has been uh, mentioned several times during the, the conference already, uh, we do not have a code of criminal procedure for the other. And on cross-border investigations, it largely refers to the national law for the substantive requirements and the procedures for ordering investigative or other measures. So to put it in a nutshell, um, although the regulation in its Article 8 uh, 1 proclaims the EPO as the single office, which we are all very proud of, um, it does not overcome the territorial application of national law. It does not overcome the territorial limits of the competences of national authorities. So against this background, of course, it was necessary to create, um, to regulate uh, who is competent to all the cross-border investigative measures of the EAPO and which is the applicable national law, which has been done in Article 31. And talking about Article 31 uh, and on the difficulties to create this new order of cross-border cooperation, I would like to quote hans Holger Hernfeld, uh, with his permission since he's here, um, on his assessment of Article 31 of the, of the EAPO regulation in his um, commentary article by article of the EPO regulation. So I quote, the negotiations in the Council Working Group on the rules on cross-border investigations were particularly difficult. After lengthy discussions, some improvements have been achieved as compared to the original Commission proposal, but the resulting Article 31 is one of the weaker points of the regulation. While attempting to provide for a mechanism of cross-border investigations within the EPO territory that is in line with the concept of a single office and more European than mutual recognition, especially the provisions of Article 31, Paragraph 3, on the division of competence for judicial authorization are rather complicated and might prove difficult to apply in practice, which quite a lot is prophetic, as I might say. I will come back on this, on this uh, reasons um, why it is so complicated um, and why we all agree with this assessment of uh, Hans Holger uh, later on. But um, I would like to highlight on two things first. First of all, that there has been a consensus, as far as I understood it, uh, from, from uh, Hans Holger, who was president, that, uh, obviously, at the negotiations that the EPO should be able to function over the borders of the participating member states without having recourse to the mutual legal assistance or to, to the mutual recognition. And on the other hand, that the cross-border cooperation within the EPO should be even easier and more effective than the cross-border cooperation between the member states' judicial authorities. So this is, I think, uh, the principal finding we should take over from, from, from this consensus that, it was, that we were looking for, for a system which is more effective and easier to use as it would be with uh, the traditional systems. But before I come, to, come back to those weak points, um, what I would like to give you is a brief overview how it has been functioning so far and uh, for what reasons it has been functioning so far. Um, as Daniel said before, we just take action. And this, is, this is probably the main point why it is functioning so well. And Daniel was talking about uh, main theme, consistency. Uh, I would say, yes, effectiveness is the positive side of it. Uh, the negative side of it, to which I will come later, is the question of legal clarity and uh, legal certainty. So, Going back to our experiences we have had so far. Um, Article 31 intends to go beyond mutual recognition and uh, beyond mutual legal assistance. 
And in our first months of operation, I think that we have demonstrated that the cooperation between the EDPs is much faster and effective than between the prosecutors from different member states. Um, moreover, this cooperation is much more intense than it would have been before. Um, and I can tell you that after seven months of operation, uh, by end of December 2021, the handling EDPs had already sent almost uh, 300 assistance requests to assisting EDPs in other member states. Uh, within their cases and concerning both investigation measures and also confiscation and freezing measures. So for the whole scope, we were taking action. And altogether, the number, the type, and the extent of those measures have corresponded to every high expectation you would have had on the effectiveness of cross-border cooperation. As a matter of fact, some of my prosecutors who were very well experienced in mutual legal assistance and mutual recognition were really astonished and uh, amazingly surprised of how good this cooperation worked together. And the reasons for that success are mainly very practical ones. You know the colleague who is going to perform it. You work together in a single office. You have the channel of communications and the means for being in close contact all the time. And this makes, for very practical reason, a whole world of a difference. Uh, it doesn't take, as it was before, months, or, uh, or it may be very cumbersome for an assistance request, for a mutual legal assistance request, to be corresponded in another member state. You deal with it immediately. And um, there are two more aspects I would like to highlight. The first one being that by this close cooperation, we have been able to establish links between cases, which up to then were being handled separately at member states. So there were parallel investigations on cases, not the one member state or the authority of one member state being aware of the case in another member state. So this is already quite an important added value that comes from this cooperation according to Article 31. And the second aspect is that we have been able at the central office to organize uh, this cooperation between the EDPs to have coordination meetings to organize action days and do it in a time frame which even within a JIT would not have seen possible. So this is really a huge exploit which comes from what Danilo has rightly said, so we just take action. So having said that and um, having talked about the acceleration which comes with uh, our special and advanced form of cooperation, um, I would say that there is also another aspect which is very important to it. And this is that this integration and acceleration uh, also enhances the protection of the rights of the defendants, in my view, uh, since we are considering the charges in their entirety, establishing links and uh, thus also allowing defense to focus on charges raised in its entirety and not subsequently into several individual proceedings. Um, there is one point which I would like to highlight still as a positive one from the regulation, and that's the consultation mechanism that's established in Article 31, Para 5 of the, of the regulation because I think it gives additional guarantees that you have this close consultation between EDPs that things, to put it bluntly, that things are done the way they should be done in the different member states. And that uh, concerns regarding a certain measure are raised immediately and very directly to the, to, to the handling EDP and that a solution can be found for that. And well, ultimately, um, there is no possibility to recuse the execution of an assistance request, as you well know, but there is the supervision of the permanent chamber, so we are talking about three European prosecutors from other member states who would also be looking into that in case of disagreement. So those are the points which are working well, but then we come to the legal issues. And those legal issues are mainly stemming from the particular construction of Article 31 of the regulation, which 
might well affect both the efficiency of investigations as well as the due protection of the rights of defendants. And one very important aspect, aspect is that uh, the EPPO works uh, working regime where it differs from traditional judicial cooperation is the judicial authorization for an investigatory measure. We all know, talking about traditional ways, you would have the main judicial authorization coming from the requesting state, and then you would have a review of uh, a measure on its uh, proportionality, on, on, on the way it was executed in the assisting member states, to put it in equitable terms. So, let's go then to the regulation. Um, within the year, the handling EDP assigns an investigatory measure to an assisting EDP in another member state. And in order to streamline uh, this procedure on the judicial side, Article 31, Para 2, uh, establishes the principle that justification and adoption of the measures is governed by the law of the member state where the case is being handled. So Article 31.2 says this is the law to be respected or to be which would have primacy. And this principle seems to mirror by all means the principle that, that, that the substantive reasons and conditions for adopting any intra-community or intra-EU cross-border measures are governed by the law of the issuing state and can be challenged only in that state. And in our view, and now I'm talking about the college view, in our view this should definitely be considered as part of the key communautaire and has, has to be interpreted as a principle that governs the application of the whole Article 31 of the regulation. However, if we look into the regulation in Article 70, in the Recital 72, the regulation it talks about the single judicial authorization, where uh, when this judicial authorization would be needed in the assisting member state, only in the assisting member state, or both in the requesting or in the handling member state and in the assisting uh, member state, the judicial authorization would fall abroad and uh, would fall to the, to the competence of the judge of the member state of the assisting EDP. And this confronts us with some tough legal, legal questions to which the regulation at its best uh, gives indications and no clear answers. And just to name those, uh, some of those questions, shall the judge be provided with a full case file? Even if the EDP, EDP presenting the case to the judge is only assistant and does not manage the case himself? Shall this case file, which uh, the handling European delegated prosecutor manages in his or her own language, be sent and fully translated into for the judge in the other member state? And if the judicial, the justification and the adoption of the cross-border measure shall be governed by the law of the member state of the handling European delegated prosecutor, 31 para 2. Um, will the judge in the other member states actually have to apply foreign law? Namely, the law of the member state in which the case is being handled? So there is obviously a contradiction between 31 para 2 and 31 para 3, where it says that the single judicial authorization should be issued then in the assisting state. Um, in addition, the regulation does not answer the question what will be the consequence of diverging uh, judicial decisions. If a handling EDP assigns uh, essentially the same measure to different member states, and in some member states the measure is accepted, in the other ones it's rejected, what would be the consequences of it? I mean, it is clear from the regulation that if a court order is not issued, you have to uh, take back the request. So what would be the consequences? But besides those aspects, and more and more importantly, though, um, investigative measures ordered uh, under Article 31 of the regulation are 
usually um, procedural acts of the airport which have a legal effect vis-a-vis -vis third parties. So what does it mean that it has a legal effect vis-a-vis -vis third parties? Of course, that there must be effective legal remedies against that. So we have talked about uh, Recital 88. We have talked about the role of uh, the European Court of Justice. Uh, but I would still like to highlight that the right to an effective remedy in respect to decisions that produce these legal effects vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis third parties is a fundamental right. And it is enshrined in Article uh, 47 of the EU Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights and referred to in Article 41 of the regulation. So this should be a departing point for every decision which is taken. And this right to an effective remedy has been upheld very recently by the Court of Justice of the European Union in the Governance of Two judgment from uh, November 2021, 11 November 2021, in relation to the EIO directive. So just to recall it, that the court clarified that the persons affected by an EIO involving search and seizure measures are fully entitled to legal remedies against the investigative measure in the member state that issued the EIO. And the court specified that the legal remedies which must be available should allow the interested person to challenge the necessity and the legality of the EIO in respect for its substantive reasons. Very clear. Um, point being that it is doubtful whether this would be possible under the EPO regulation in the same way. In my view, there is no reason why these arguments would not apply to all situations of a person facing investigation measures in a state different of that in which the case is being led. So the person involved in an EPO case faces a situation which is identical in nature to the cases in which we are talking about in EIO, meaning that, in my view, that due defense and uh, the right to seek effective legal remedies is linked, Article 31.2 again, to the law and to the court of the issuing member state. So, Having said that, uh, is that what is, foreseen, what is foreseen in the EPO regulation? Not entirely, because the EPO regulation does not say anything about legal remedies. It does not really clearly state where it would be reviewed. It does not give a clear answer to the question where the, when the judicial authorization has been given, what, the legal, what uh, the legal scope would be, and it doesn't really clarify what the scope of the review of measures would be. And I think that this is a main problem uh, which has to be solved for giving these rights. And uh, just, just to finish uh, with uh, one remark on, on, on what um, Dominic has, has been addressing and also Professor Kribble had been addressing, the question that there is also relation with the admissibility of evidence which has to be taken into account. As we all know, Article 37 does not say a lot about admissibility of evidence. And in my view, Article 31 gives, uh, para 2 gives a hint of what would be the best option. And in my view, the best option would be to have uh, a clear set of rules which rely upon the legal review in the, in, in the handling, in the state of the handling EDP, in the case, in the state in which the case is being led because this would also allow and clarify and make things easier for the further trial and would then, then it would be able to, uh, we would be able to apply the same set of rules uh, for, the, for the court proceedings as we would do for the, for the cross-border measures. So all in all, what is needed is legal clarity and legal certainty because the danger, the, the danger we see at hand it has not materialized yet, not really. But we then, with the danger we see it is the danger of uh, divergent jurisprudence, which would then create a whole fragmentation when we are talking about the legal protection also of the defendants and would be a big hindrance for the efficiency of EPPL. So looking for this clarity and certainty, I think this is a matter to, to, to take into account and which would, should guide 
uh, a clarification at least, if not an amendment of the regulation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Ritter, for this very clear presentation. We have heard in the morning session about the tension between efficiency and legal certainty and the rule of law. I think your presentation has made clear that there is not necessarily a tension between those two, that efficiency or more efficiency might not always go at the cost of legal certainty, but you very clearly raised or, and described the problems we have with regard to this concept of the single judicial authorization, that the procedural safeguard should be construed in a manner that provides effective protection and, of course, is in conformity with the principle of legal certainty. Let's move now to the cooperation between the EPO and third countries, where neither the internal cooperation regime nor mutual recognition instruments apply. Instead, the EPO has to rely on the traditional framework of mutual legal assistance, as the Union cannot unilaterally change the international treaty framework. It has to rely on the willingness of third states to accept the EPO as requesting authority that is as a cooperation partner. Let me introduce to you our second speaker of this panel. Valsamis Mitzilegas is Professor of European Criminal Law and Global Security and Director of the Criminal Justice Center at Queen Mary University in London. His research interests and expertise lie in the fields of European criminal law, but also migration, asylum and borders, security and human rights, and legal responses to transnational criminal law. And last but not least, the EPO as well. Of course, he has published several articles on the EPO and the rule of law and judicial protection. And, well, he has a leading role in a number of transnational research networks and research projects, and he is a regular advisor to parliaments, governments, and EU institutions as well. I'm glad to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Chair for this kind introduction. Thank you to Kathleen, friend and colleague, for inviting me here at this wonderful conference. Congratulations, uh, and thank you to everyone who has helped organize it. And it's great for me to share this panel uh, and uh, to talk about the external dimension of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Um, we cannot talk about the external dimension without really reflecting on the internal dimension, of course, and this is what we have been doing uh, so far. And as a general thought, uh, I just, as someone also who always sees the glasses half full, uh, and in the occasion of the anniversary of the EPPO, I think the establishment of the EPPO is a turning point in European criminal law and in EU law more broadly. It generates a number of questions and challenges, I think, which are fundamental questions uh, of, on the rule of law and the relationship between the citizen and the state. And I think, you know, we will have uh, the chance to, for the questions to be fleshed out in detail before national courts and before the Court of Justice, I think, the next few years. Uh, but what we have seen, I think, uh, is a high degree of complexity uh, in the internal legal framework of the EPPO. Many, many questions uh, regarding its uh, status and applicable law. And applicable law and the uncertainty perhaps in applicable law is a key uh, rule of law challenge. Um, if you take this uh, approach and you project externally, the situation becomes even more complicated, I think, in view of the fact that there is an additional complication uh, on EU external relations law. So, you know, if you take the EPPO out of it and look at how the EU uh, is operating in the global scene, you know uh, that uh, this is uh, underlined by a high degree of complexity uh, in terms of European constitutional law about the powers of the European Union externally and its relationship with the member states. Uh, and this complexity, I think, is transposed, if you like, in terms of the, the future of the, of the EPPO externally, because, as was mentioned by the earlier speaker, uh, it is very hard to fit a supranational uh, body within the, the suit 
uh, of national authority, which underpins not only internal uh, cooperation within the EU, but also, importantly, external relations. Because we have multilateral conventions that are drafted largely with states in mind. This is changing gradually with regard to the EU, uh, but still as regards the operating authorities, this is very much drafted with states in mind. And uh, the same applies uh, in terms of the uh, relations with, uh, with third countries. So what I want to do uh, now is really to focus on two elements of the EPPO external action, uh, the uh, element of cooperation with third states and the element of participation in multilateral uh, treaties on, on criminal matters. And I think that's where uh, the bread and butter challenges will arise uh, in the future. So the first uh, uh, issue, the cooperation with third states, um, and a final introductory point, if you like, I think that uh, in both these areas, the uh, development of the PPO presents uh, the European Union more broadly uh, with an opportunity to emerge as a stronger global actor in the field of criminal and in the field of security. So, you know, the EPPO can act really as a catalyst for the European Union as a whole to have a stronger role uh, as a global criminal justice actor. And it provides a unique opportunity in this context because for the very first time internally we have a supranational uh, body uh, in the field of fraud against the EU budget. So in terms of relations with third countries, I, I must uh, confess that I have written a bit about you know, the internal structure of the EPPO and the EPPO and the rule of law, uh, as you know, and I hadn't really focused on external relations that much. I don't know why, maybe I was thinking that let's sort out the internal first and then you know, we look at the external. And then I was surprised to bump into the EPPO, actually, uh, when I was researching Brexit. So when I was reading the uh, trade and cooperation agreement between the United Kingdom and the, uh, and the EU and skipping the Northern Ireland Protocol and looking at the criminal law uh, provisions and what happens after Brexit, I bumped into these provisions on mutual legal assistance and on criminal records uh, where it was stated that the EU uh, could notify the EPPO uh, as an authority for the purposes uh, of the implementation of the TCA. And I thought, hang on a second, you know, we have Brexit, which is supposed to be bad for European integration, yet in the field of external relations, Brexit gives the EU the opportunity to go further than it has ever done in its own internal, uh, you know, in its pre-Brexit relations with third states, because now we have an agreement with the third state which really puts the EPPO center stage. And uh, uh, the, the practitioners will tell us about uh, you know, practice. I don't know whether there, has, there have been any MLA uh, requests between the UK and the, the EPPO. That would be interesting for me to know. But I think in terms of precedent, I, I found that this was very important. So, you know, so we have, for the first time, uh, a supranational EU body acting as the representative of the European Union externally in its relations with third countries. And I think that then I started reflecting and I thought, what happens with the existing EU agreements with third states on mutual legal assistance? So, you know, we know there are agreements with Norway and Iceland, there are agreements with uh, Japan and, the, and with the United States. And there, uh, I think uh, uh, EU lawyers in the audience know that uh, these agreements, the structure of these agreements, reflect the tortuous passage from the third pillar to the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, if you take a step back, you can think of, for example, the EU-USA Extradition and Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, where still you have today member states arguing that this is only essentially bilateral treaties between member states and the US. <laughs> that this was a third pillar agreement, that states had to sign their own agreements with the US, and, that, and this is really always bilateral. And then, of course, the, the, the Lisbon brought changes in that regard. And I, I started thinking, what is the place of the EPPO in this? So, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, so the legal question, I guess, and there are experts in the room, uh, I think, who have thought of this, is whether these agreements could include the EPPO or whether they should be expressly reopened in order for the European Union to, uh, to try to replicate, if you like, the TCA 
and look and use the Brexit precedent uh, in order uh, to expressly provide the European Public Prosecutor's Office uh, will uh, be notified for the purposes of mutual legal assistance. And of course, there is a question of extradition as well, but you know, we, can, we can discuss this. Um, uh, the issue of extradition brings together a whole lot of baggage as well, as the, the chair mentions, mentioned as well. Uh, the, the, the baggage in a good way from the internal mutual recognition, a key uh, with safeguards of independent judicial authority and with the scrutiny of fundamental rights. So this is something I think that needs to be considered with regard to the EPPO. What generates, has generated greater action, I understand, on behalf of the European Commission uh, uh, is the participation, the, um, the positioning of the EPPO in multilateral treaties, uh, both at the level of the Council of Europe and at the level of the United Nations. Now there, I think, the legal, one legal complication that is worth thinking about is uh, uh, before you think of the European Public Prosecutor's Office is to reflect on the legal position of the European Union in the first place with regard to each of these treaties, because this is not uniform. So in the Council of Europe, we have the treaties such as the 1959 Convention that you all know about, where the EU is not a party and it is not envisaged for the European Union to be a party. And I understand, but Fabio will correct me if I'm wrong, that what uh, the, the line that has been followed so far is that mem EU member states have declared on a member state capacity and basis uh, the EPPO as a competent authority for the purposes of the convention. Um, and someone in the morning mentioned very diplomatically that this will also depend, of course, by third state's acceptance, and we know there has been a relative controversy mm -hmm. regarding uh, the acceptance by Switzerland uh, of uh, the EPPO as an authority under the, the 1959 uh, convention. Um, so this is one way of action, but again it highlights the tension between the supranational and the old intergovernmental model. Uh, not only do we have this tension within the EU, but externally you have these conventions that were really drafted with states in mind. And I think it's really a, a challenge to see how you can move it forward if you want to have a, a centralized EU notification at some point. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the, uh, uh, a slightly different situation arises in Council of Europe conventions which are negotiated uh, by the Commission on behalf of member states. I understand that this has happened in the negotiations of the additional protocol on digital evidence to the cybercrime, to the Budapest Convention, where uh, again, uh, you have member state notification, but you have a more coordinated stance by the European uh, Commission. Somewhere where it might be a bit easier for the EU, paradoxically, is not within Europe, but globally, when you look at the UN conventions, the big ones, the Palermo Convention and UNCAC. And why is that? Because the EU is a party. These are more modern conventions. You know, they were adopted in the 2000s. Uh, and uh, I understand that now the EU is trying to uh, revise the already very complicated uh, declarations of competence uh, uh, participation in these conventions. You know, you remember that in UNCAC, uh, in, in, uh, in Antok, we had uh, two different pillars in 2000. So, you know, we have a very complex declaration of competence on behalf of the European uh, community and the European Union. And now uh, this is being revised as we speak in order, and it includes a specific provision uh, for the EPPO. So, you know, so I think that is very interesting to see how, whether the EPPO can act as a representative uh, for the European Union at the global stage in relation to these uh, conventions. Um, I will highlight three challenges, I think, before I close, which, uh, which I find uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, the first big challenge, I think, is uh, what I have already mentioned, which is how to frame the EPPO as a global actor within the highly complex constitutional framework of EU external relations in the first place, especially when we talk about uh, multilateral. Uh, treaties. So, you know, this is really uh, a, a, a framework that uh, in international law it has been conceived as, a, as an intergovernmental international law framework, and now we have um, a supranational body by a supranational organization which wants to be ambitious and act globally. So I think we can have a number of, uh, of, of interesting challenges there. The second aspect which uh, is worth uh, mentioning expressly 
uh, is the role of the EPPO, perhaps the transformation, uh, Martin mentioned that perhaps uh, we shouldn't talk about uh, efficient, effectiveness against fundamental rights, but I think, if anything, in external relations, the fundamental rights role of the EPPO will appear very prominently. And why is that? Because we know that both the European Union and the member states individually, when they implement European Union law, are under a constitutional duty not only to respect, but also to promote European values globally. And I think here we're not talking about cooperation within the EU, where you can assume that countries meet a certain level of standards, although there are consensus, we know, but we're talking about global action uh, and cooperation with countries which may not meet the EU standards. And I think there uh, we need to take uh, the fundamental rights scrutiny and monitoring role and responsibility of the EPPO very seriously. And we need really to think very carefully about the duties of the EPPO to scrutinize compliance with fundamental rights in international cooperation on mutual legal assistance, on extradition, and so on and so forth. The third uh, element that will finish with that, and I'm very pleased with myself about it because it gives a wonderful bridge uh, to uh, Dr. Zufrida, <laughs> is what happens uh, with member states who do not participate in the EPPO in the context of uh, external relations. I was agonizing over this. Um, you know, when I was uh, reflecting on my presentation. So, okay, the EPPO is notified. Uh, does it represent the EU as a whole? Uh, does it represent only the participating member states internally? There is a legal dimension to this question, a constitutional, but there's also a practical dimension. I was thinking, and uh, probably there will be comments on that. Okay, the EU notifies the EPPO for the purposes of ANCAC, for example, or, you know, or for the purpose of the TCA. Will third countries, uh, via an international organization or through a, an agreement with the EU, with, uh, 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 always remember which member states are party to the EPPO and which are not? If, even if you accept that Poland is not uh, bound by the EPPO notification, will country X, when they have a, a request that they need to be processed speedily, remember that not to send it to the EPPO if it, in, if it involves only Poland? for example, you know. So I think there are also some practical issues that uh, would be interesting to see how they will pan out in, uh, as we go along. And also, and I think this is the same problem as other, uh, has arisen internally, and that was mentioned in the earlier presentation, I think, beautifully, what happens when we have the elephant in the room, when we have cross-border cases or cases involving both participating and non-participating member states. When you have an MLA request for a money laundering case involving Poland and Germany, you know, what mm -hmm. is the situation there? Uh, we think as we go along, and I think practice will throw us the need to give some answers to that, uh, but I think that uh, the external dimension will become increasingly more important and will test many of the internal questions uh, in a much more focused way. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to listening to Fabio's presentation. Thank you very much for this concise analysis of the status quo, of, and I think the um, United Kingdom and the new treaty is an interesting precedent in that respect, um, but also for um, presenting us the challenges with regard to the cooperation with third countries, beginning with her fundamental rights, but also, well, the different or the problems arising from cooperation between supranational um, entities like the EPO and uh, within an international intergovernmental framework. But also, and that's where we come to the final presentation, on the role of non-participating member states. And here we have a situation on the one hand where cooperation seems less problematic because it is governed by EU law, but on the other hand, we have non-participating countries that are not bound by the regulation and therefore we might run into similar problems as regards the cooperation with third states. I have no doubt that our third speaker will shed some light on these questions and other issues related to cooperation with non-participating member states, as he is an expert in vertical cooperation uh, 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 under EU law and the EPO in particular. Dr. Fabio Giuffrida obtained his PhD from the School of Law at the Queen Mary University of London in 2019 with a thesis on the EPO. 
and after that he was postdoctoral researcher at the University at Luxembourg before he joined the European Commission in June 2020, where he is currently a policy officer and the Director General for Justice and Consumers. Please, we are looking forward to your presentation. You have the floor. Yes, so th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Martin, and good afternoon to, to all of you. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, Professor Ligeti for the uh, invitation. It is um, very nice to be back uh, here in Luxembourg after two years now, and it's very nice to meet so many uh, friendly and uh, familiar faces. And thank you very much also to Panos for his unrelenting efforts for the organization of this conference and his patience as well. Um, Indeed, my um, uh, presentation will uh, focus on the relations between the uh, EPPO and the non-participating member states. So, in a way, it's uh, in between uh, the two presentations so far. So, uh, we are now looking at the European Union as a whole, the 27 member states. And uh, as you know, uh, for the moment, five member states do not participate in the EPPO. And those are Ireland, Denmark, Poland, Hungary and uh, Sweden. We refer to them as non-participating member states, but uh, the reason why they did not join are different uh, for each of them, uh, because as you know, Denmark enjoys a permanent opt-out from measures concerning the area of freedom, security and justice. Uh, Ireland participated in the negotiations and could have joined uh, the EPA regulation, but decided not to. Um, whereas for Poland, Hungary and Sweden, it is a deliberate political choice not to participate uh, in the uh, EPPO. Although uh, we are aware that uh, apparently uh, Sweden will join uh, at the end of this year or most probably next uh, year, so it will be 23 participating member states. Uh, of course, already uh, the, uh, the treaty, so Article 86 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, somehow envisaged the possibility that the EPO would have been established by means of enhanced cooperation. Uh, so it provided for, uh, let's say, an, ex um, an accelerated procedure to set up uh, the enhanced cooperation. But apart from that, the ordinary rules of the enhanced cooperation uh, apply. Um, I was uh, looking at the EPO annual report, so uh, perhaps the EPO colleagues can give a bit more updated information, but uh, I read there that last year, so in the first seven months of activities of the EPPO, 48 uh, cases concerned uh, non-participating member states, so it means about one out of 10 or a one out of 11 uh, cases of the EPPO concern non-participating member states. So the question is there, so how does the EPPO cooperate with non-participating member states? And the answers uh, are, or perhaps should be, uh, in Article 105 of the uh, EPO regulation, which is uh, the uh, main, provisions of the, main provision of the EPO regulation concerning the cooperation between the EPPO and non-participating member states. Uh, the first paragraph of um, Article 105 um, simply provides that the EPPO can conclude uh, working arrangements with uh, the competent authorities of non-participating member states. And uh, to my knowledge, this has been the case with one non-participating member state so far. So the EPPO concluded a working arrangement with the General Prosecutor Office of uh, Hungary. Whereas for the moment, the EPPO has not concluded uh, working arrangements with the competent authorities of other non participating member states. Uh, but the uh, working arrangements of the uh, EPPO are not, uh, let's say, the main instruments that regulate the cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member states because uh, the uh, working arrangements are meant uh, to, uh, let's say, simplify uh, the uh, cooperation or to lay down rules on the exchange of strategic information, but the rules on the judicial cooperation between the EPPO and non-participating member states are to be found uh, elsewhere. And this is why uh, the provision of article, uh, the rule of article 105, paragraph 3, it's um, crucial in this context and I would like to discuss it with you uh, because it poses a number of uh, challenges and uh, questions that uh, concern the functioning of the EPPO and are related to what uh, Balsamis was saying, that the EPPO is really uh, a turning point in EU law uh, and it's something completely new. It's something in between a national and a supranational authority it's actually a supranational authority with a strong national dimension, so it poses new uh, questions for uh, the uh, European Union as such. 
Article 105, paragraph 3, uh, provides two, uh, let's say, main avenues of cooperation between the EPPO and non-participating member states. The first one would be a legal instrument relating to the cooperation between the EPPO and non-participating member states. So uh, 105 paragraph 3 uh, makes a reference to a possible uh, future instrument on the uh, ad hoc legal instrument on the cooperation between the EPPO and the uh, non-participating uh, member states. Uh, perhaps with, with a bit of a spoiler, I can tell you that for the moment there is no uh, plan uh, to uh, present such instrument, but this is something that uh, we understand has been uh, discussed during the negotiations and something that has also been requested at times by non-participating member states. But if we think uh, for a moment about this uh, possible future instrument on the cooperation between the uh, EPPO and non-participating member states, one might wonder, uh, first of all, what would be the legal basis? of such a new instrument on the cooperation between the uh, EPPO and non-participating member states. And this is, for the moment, an open question. And uh, one option could be, for example, Article 325, Paragraph 4, because, uh, as was said before in some presentation, Article 325 is the provision concerning the uh, protection of the financial interests of the European Union. And Paragraph 4 refers to the possibility to adopt measures concerning the fight against uh, fraud. Uh, and by the way, the reference to measures could cover, in principle, both a regulation or um, a, a regulation and a directive. Of course, the advantage of Article 325 would be that being a provision that is not in the title of the treaty concerning the area of freedom, security, and justice, it would be binding also on Ireland and uh, Denmark. On the other hand, uh, a possible instrument on the basis of 3 to 5 might be problematic in the long run if, uh, for example, the competence of the EPPO would be extended to uh, other crimes. Would Article 3 to 5 remain a sound legal basis, considering that Article 3 to 5 only concerns the protection of the financial interests of the European Union? So, well, I don't have an answer to that, but just uh, one of the main questions that arise concerning the cooperation of the EPPO with non-participating member states. And on the other hand, uh, this was mentioned by Professor Sicurella in, uh, in the morning, uh, those of you who are familiar with the negotiation of the uh, PIF Directive uh, know that, art that actually Article 325 was the original legal basis suggested by the Commission, but then the Council and the Parliament actually moved the legal basis to Article 83, Paragraph 2. So it might be the case that Article 325, Paragraph 4 would not fly for this instrument either. But then we could, for example, think about Article 82, which is, of course, the main provision of the treaty concerning uh, judicial cooperation. And there, this possible instrument would be based, could be based, for example, on Article 82, Paragraph 1, which, again, refers to possible measures that aim to the uh, facilitation of cooperation between judicial authorities. But there again, we would have uh, one problem, which would be indeed the, uh, so to say, geographical um, place of this provision, because being part of the uh, provisions of the, uh, on the areas of freedom, security, and justice, it would not bind Denmark, and uh, uh, Ireland should, sh uh, should choose to opt in to be bound by this, uh, by this new instrument. And on the other hand, Article 82, Paragraph 1, letter, uh, letter D, refers to the cooperation between judicial or equivalent authorities of the member states. Is the EPA judicial authority of the member states? I would say no. It is a judicial authority in the member states, uh, but it is not a judicial authority of the member states, at least not only of the member states, so to say. So this would, might require some uh, uh, creative or dynamic interpretation of the uh, treaty. But then uh, what about, for example, Article 82, Paragraph 2? Would it be another option for the uh, regulation of the EPO relation with non-participating member states? I mean, Article 82, Paragraph 2 refers not only to measures to facilitate mutual recognition, but also to measures concerning uh, the facilitation of judicial cooperation in criminal matters. But there it would be a case only for directives, so contrary to Article 82, Paragraph 1, Article 82, Paragraph 2 only refers to directives. 
And then the problem is that in the list of issues that might be subject to harmonization in Article 82, Paragraph 2, we do not really find something that might be related to the cooperation between the APPO and non-participating member states, because we find a reference to the mutual admissibility of evidence, so it would, it would need to be a very specific uh, instrument or we find a reference to any other specific aspects of criminal procedure, which, by the way, would need to be identified by the Council. But I personally, I don't think that when the drafters of the treaty thought of specific aspects of criminal procedure, they were thinking about cooperation with the APPO. It seems to me something more like um, preventive detention, detention or other issue of uh, criminal procedure. A fourth option for this possible new instrument would be uh, Article 86, as such, on uh, the uh, EPPO. But there, again, uh, if you read Article 86, you don't really find a reference to this uh, cooperation between the EPPO and non-participating member states. So again, it would require some creative uh, interpretation. So uh, this is just to say that for the moment, indeed, there is no, uh, let's say, plan to present such an instrument. But even when such a plan will be, let's say, in our rather it will pose a number of uh, questions. But then Article 105, Paragraph 3, perhaps uh, was already aware of this lack of willingness to uh, walk this path. So it provides that in the absence of such a specific legal instrument on the cooperation between the EPPO and no participating member states, there is another way for, to ensure the cooperation with the non-participating member states. And this is the, again, notification of the EPPO by the member states, so by the participating member states, uh, the notification of the EPPO as a competent authority for the purpose of the existing instruments of judicial cooperation. So it means that in accordance with Article 105, Paragraph 3, the Member States have the obligation, because actually the, uh, the provision is couched by reference with the shall, so the Member States shall notify the EPPO as a competent authority for the purpose of the existing uh, instruments. So what happened during the uh, German uh, presidency and uh, in the context of the uh, Council Working Group on uh, um, uh, um, Judicial Cooperation in Criminal Matters, the Member States discussed how actually the existing instruments of judicial cooperation, such as the European Investigation Order, the European Arrest Warrant, the regulation on the mutual recognition of freezing orders, so all these instruments, how they could, be apply, how they could apply to the EPPO. Because here again, as Valsamis was saying with regard to the conventions concerning third countries, these instruments have not been thought for the APPO. These instruments have been thought for the cooperation between national authorities, but now they should apply to the cooperation between the APPO and other national uh, authorities. So the uh, reflections of the uh, member states under the lead of the, of the German presidency are then included in a very interesting document which was endorsed, uh, endorsed as a report of the uh, German presidency in December uh, 2020, where there is uh, an analysis of, this, uh, of the existing legal instruments explaining how these instruments can apply to the uh, EPPO. Just to give you an example, most of these instruments, or some of these instruments, for example, make a reference to competent authority of the issuing state. So as such, this definition would not work for the APPO. However, what we find in the uh, presidency report is that actually this reference can be understood as, a, um, as an equivalent to uh, issuing authority. So in this case, it would apply also to the APPO, provided that the member states make the uh, notification. The presidency report, therefore, contains all the, uh, let's say, a model for the notifications that the member state can do. And by now, almost all member states have done such notifications which allow or should allow the EPPO to exchange, for example, European investigation order, European arrest warrants with the uh, non-participating member states. And um, here uh, it is interesting to see that from what we uh, understood, but again, I would be very curious to hear from the EPPO colleagues, uh, this, um, uh, this avenue of the notification is actually working within the European Union with one exception 
which is uh, Poland. Because uh, the uh, EPPO actually informed the uh, Commission back in February that the EPPO, uh, sorry, that Poland is currently refusing to uh, cooperate with the EPPO in accordance with the notifications made by the uh, member states which is, of course, uh, very concerning, not least because uh, the EPPO has the highest number of cases with non-participating member states with Poland. So it was 23 cases concerning Poland, which do not have, uh, or at least by February 2022, did not have any follow-up in uh, practice. Of course, this also raises a number of um, what I find very interesting um, questions about the nature of this notification, but also about the obligations for the member states that do not participate in the APPO. Because, of course, they make a choice not to be bound by deregulation, and that's fine. But our view would be that they are still bound, at least by the principle of sincere cooperation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EPPO. And the principle of sincere cooperation is enshrined in the treaty. It's a binding, uh, or it's actually one of the main principles according to which the European Union works. And um, the um, this authority should, uh, should not, uh, sorry, this, um, the non-participating member states should not impede the implementation of the enhanced cooperation by the other member states. Of course, these might be uh, theoretical or uh, constitutional points, but those are quite interesting because, of course, at the end of the day, it is a problem if the EPPO is not in a position to cooperate with one of the non-participating uh, member states. And uh, here I think my time is almost uh, over, so I would just say one more uh, thing before drawing some conclusions. And um, I would like to make a reference to another provision of the EPO regulation, which I think it's quite interesting when it comes to the cooperation with the non-participating member states, which is Article 100 of the EPO regulation, which concerns the uh, relations between the EPO and uh, Eurojust. Because the way uh, the uh, regulation is uh, thought is that Eurojust could uh, still play a key role when it comes to the uh, cooperation between the EPPO or facilitate at least the cooperation between the EPPO and the uh, non-participating member states. And it is therefore not surprising that actually with the support of Eurojust, the first joint investigation team of the EPPO between Sweden and uh, the French European Delegated Prosecutors was uh, set up. So perhaps to conclude, um, I think that the uh, issue of the cooperation of the EPPO uh, with the non-participating member states is uh, extremely interesting, uh, but also extremely important for at least, I would say, four reasons. The first one is an operational one, because indeed, if one out of 10 or one out of 11 cases of the APPO concern, um, uh, concerns uh, cooperation with the non-participating member states, it means that these member states still have something to say and still have something to do when it comes to the functioning of the APPO. The second reason is a legal one, uh, as you have seen with the discussion on the possible future legal instrument, the cooperation with the non-participating member states raises quite interesting and new legal problems that will have to be tackled in the um, years uh, to come and of course pose new um, questions for the European Union as such. Uh, then, uh, as a third point, I think it's uh, the relation of the uh, EPPO with non-participating member states is very interesting under a, so to say, structural or architectural uh, point of view, so to say, because indeed it uh, brings to the fore, for example, issues such as the cooperation between the EPPO and other bodies of the European Union, such as, for example, Eurojust. So it will, we will have to see how this cooperation will evolve uh, in the years to come, also when it comes to the cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member states. Uh, but it is also interesting because uh, the uh, cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member states might also be um, relevant under a point of view that is not strictly related to judicial cooperation, but also more broadly with regard to the rule of law, as Valsamis was saying. Because when I mentioned before the letter by uh, the EPPO to the European Commission on the cooperation with Poland, it was a letter that actually the EPPO sent to the European Commission under the framework of the rule of law regulation. Mm -hmm. So the EPPO told us that the uh, in Poland, that the non-cooperation with Poland might be one of the reasons that might justify the adoption of measures under the so-called rule of law conditionality regulation vis-a-vis -vis Poland. 
because even though Poland is not obliged to cooperate, so to say, with the EPPO, the fact that Poland does not cooperate with the EPPO has an impact on the effective fight, on the effective fight against fraud. And this is one of the reasons to be taken into account by the Commission and the Council when deciding on the adoption of possible measures for under the conditionality and rule of law uh, regulations. And last but not least, the uh, relation between uh, the EPPO and non-participating member states, uh, I think it's interesting under a broader, let's say, political and constitutional uh, perspective, because we have not mentioned it uh, so far, but the other elephant in the room, there are many elephants in the room, it seems today, uh, the other elephant in the room is that can we accept on the constitutional level that some member states do not participate in the body that is meant to protect the union budget of which all the member states benefit, and some of them even more than others. Is this tenable in the long term under a constitutional and political perspective? We will have to see. But of course, it also creates um, constitutional issues such as, indeed, what are the boundaries and to what extent can we bring forward, for example, the principle of sincere cooperation? Can we, see, can we say that the principle of sincere cooperation obliges member states not participating in the, in the EPPO at least to cooperate with the EPPO? So all these, let's say, questions, and I'm afraid I probably gave more questions uh, than answer, but all these questions show how the uh, issue of the cooperation between the EPPO and the non-participating member states is important, uh, but also uh, very problematic. And I would stop here and thank you very much uh, again for the floor. Thank you very much for this very clear and inspiring presentation showing us the different options to put into place a framework for cooperation with non-participating member states, the regulatory options, the different potential treaty bases to be applied, but also the options laid down in the regulation itself, especially Article 105. Maybe even Eurojust is an option. I think that has to be taken into account as well. And I found particularly interesting the link to the rule of law mechanism based at least in part on the obligation to sincere cooperation as well. So I think we have enough or more than enough food for thought and discussion and the floor is yours. Who would like to start? Please, Mr. Hanfeld. Thank you very much. I didn't necessarily want to start but I would be happy to make one remark. Coming back to what uh, Andres just said about Article 31, uh, I think the way the, uh, the provision of Paragraph 3 is drafted, where it says that uh, the justification, or oh, sorry, the, the assisting EDP has to obtain judicial authorization in accordance with the law of that member state. Uh, that needs to be interpreted to refer not only to the procedure of obtaining judicial authorization, but also to, let's say, the, the frame of law under which the court would give judicial authorization. So, in other words, if a German EDP requests an EDP in France to obtain judicial authorization for a telephone interception, the French court would have to see whether it is possible under French law to give authorization to a, a telephone interception. I don't think it would be sufficient to say, uh, as a French judge, uh, well, the, the EDP in Germany has already decided that it is good enough to do this under German law, so therefore I can limit my scope of uh, analysis to what I would do in the case of an EIO coming from Germany and, uh, and refrain from any further uh, considerations of the justification. I think that would be staying short of what the, uh, we would need to say in the regulation in terms of the uh, protecting the rights of the uh, persons involved. Uh, of course, it is a different situation if the EPO uh, then says, well, it's different from what the regulation says, we will always obtain a judicial authorization in the handling EDP member state, because then you have a clear basis, and then one can apply the EIO principle. But uh, I think that as an interim solution, one can perhaps do this. 
but um, it is not, my interpretation would be that that was not the intention of the legislator. Uh, during the negotiations, we actually did have a, a proposal on the table which said exactly that, that it is always the handling EDP that obtains judicial authorization in his or her member state. And then the court in the assisting EDP would only uh, uh, review that decision uh, with very limited grounds for refusal. And if there is any subsequent judicial review, it would be again the court of the handling EDP member state that would be in charge of, uh, of, uh, of giving that. Um, but this was a proposal during the negotiations, but it was not accepted by the majority in the Council. So therefore, Article 31 is what it currently is, and uh, I fully understand the difficulties that the EPO now has with it, and I hope that the legislator will find a way of solving that. Thank you. Will you react immediately? Yeah, yeah uh, thank you very much. And, and Hans Kruger, whilst I agree completely with you, uh, I, I would say that more than one time we found ourselves here at the EPO uh, having this thought, what was the legislator thinking, actually? Um, because, yes, I mean, the concept itself, it's clear, but let's see it from, the, from the, the practical implications on the one hand and on the legal uncertainty it has created, it will be created. Uh, it's, it's just not by surprise that we have the first prejudicial question referred to the European Court of Justice on the scope of review of Article 31 reviews. I mean, it's clear because the regulation doesn't say anything about this. It does not really give a clear indication who does what, to put it very, very, very uh, bluntly. And um, on the other hand, we have, I'm, I'm aware of, of, of another case in which uh, a court uh, has, um, has refused to decide on, uh, on legal remedies um, in, in, the, in the assisting member state because they had said substance is only to be cleared in the, in, in, in the issuing member state. So we do not decide at all in it, uh, at it and we declare it in, inadmissible. So we are in the situation in which, as I said before, we, are in, 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 we might encounter a lot of difficulties with regard to the legal certainty, legal clarity, because the, 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 the framework set out does not really clearly give us uh, those indications which would be needed. Thanks. Other questions? Oh. It's number 349, please. <laughs> oh, Nicholas Franzen from the Dutch Ministry of Justice. Um, question to Mr. Ritter, please. Um, I, as I understand it, the, 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 the um, principle of the single judicial authorization has effectively been um, put on hold by the guidelines adopted by the college in January. Uh, could, you, could you give us some insight into the various aspects um, that um, you must have discussed before adopting those uh, guidelines and would they include any risks once such a case would actually go to trial? Thank you. I just suggest that we collect several questions. I think there were some others. Uh, yes, so I had a question for Andres Ritter. You mentioned that due to the close cooperation of the EDPs, you were able to identify parallel proceedings that otherwise are never known about. And is, do you think there is a way that national prosecutors can learn from APO about identifying parallel proceedings between the member states? Because it seems the EU really tries to prevent parallel proceedings from occurring because there's the Nabis and Edom issue. So is there any way that what EPO has learned can be translated to national prosecutors to help them identify parallel proceedings? Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, the guidelines. The guidelines are the result of discussion at the college, which was prepared for, uh, by a working group. And if, uh, because I, I'm sure that Nicholas, you know, you know, you know this college decision, and and, uh, and you see there is a disclaimer at the beginning, 
saying that it is, of course, without prejudice of court decisions, it's without prejudice of the interpretation that the Court of Justice would give to it. So we are aware that uh, we are taking a position which might not be completely in line with uh, what uh, the regulation says. One of the, of the reasons why we discussed it and, and, and why we came to these conclusions was actually this judgment in Gavanasov 2, which was not there when, we, when, when uh, the, the regulation was, was drafted and, and which, in my view, highlights this aspect of, of the necessity for, for the legal remedies and effective uh, legal remedies in the issuing state. So we're talking about the situation in which if the single, authority, single judicial authorization is giving in the assisting state, you might not have any decision in the issuing state which could be appealed. So there would be a gap, there would be a loophole in our view. This is, this is uh, a very important part of the reasoning we had on, on, on it. And if uh, you look at the guidance itself, it does not say it's uh, then we would just um, ask for the judicial of the single judicial authorization in the mem in the issuing member state. No, what we say is the, the, the regulation does not prevent from getting two judicial authorizations, getting one in the issuing member state and getting another one in the if, if feasible, of course, because the, the, it's foreseen in, in national law, and getting a second one in, in the assisting member state. So it's not saying that we won't. Uh, request it as foreseen in the regulation in, in the assisting member state. But just also very much for, for practical terms, it has made things a lot easier if a judge in the assisting member state has this confirmation that a peer has looked into it according to the national law in the issuing member in, 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 uh, yeah, in the issuing member state, in, where, the, where the assistance request was issued. So, taking everything into consideration, we uh, found that applying um, these guidelines would make, it would be legally tenable, and on the other hand, it would make our life and our cooperation much more effective, and it has proven to, do, to be so. So, uh, you could say also as well, we just took action. But in our view, it was absolutely necessary, and we would uh, highly welcome if there would be opportunity to look into it uh, again during a discussion of, 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 of the regulation. Uh, to the second question, parallel proceedings and what could national prosecution officers, law enforcement authorities learn from us? I, I, I wouldn't say, say, say really learn from us. What we are doing is, 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 is just a very basic principle. The very basic principle that the more you get an overview, the more you are able um, to get the information from different sources and, and, and check one against the other, the more you are, of course, able to establish links which exist uh, between different cases. It would happen in, in by, by normal, and, and I have seen it, of course, uh, being a prosecutor in Germany, I have seen it that from a uh, mutual legal assistance request coming in that you get aware of things which had happened in your member state and which uh, you should look into. Um, the main difference of EPPO is, of course, that we have this uh, capability of gathering the information, of gathering the, 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 the overview. So, my first, my first uh, answer would be, what can uh, National Prosecution Office learn from us? Not learn, but cooperate with us. Uh, this, is, this is the main point. Um, and and it, has been pro it has proven to be very effective in, in, in some member uh, states or in some cases in which uh, we have had, let's say, shared action. Them taking over paper pieces of, 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 of cases, of a complex of cases, uh, for which we would not be competent, and us taking, uh, taking care of the ones for which we are competent, but, hand, but, but handling the cases together. So the willingness to cooperate with EPO, I think, is, is, is always a good idea for National Prosecution Office. And uh, besides that, uh, and it's, to talk, come back to what uh, Martin said at the beginning, we might be, well, a model of how things can work in a different way because it's a more advanced way of, of integrating and, and, and creating um, this, this coordinated, integrated approach in criminal justice across Europe. 
I know that not everyone would be happy with this, um, and I know that there is a lot of questions raising from that with regard to the equality of arms, to which well, Banya will be talking afterwards. Uh, but in my view, yes, it, it's, it's a good way at, at, at the end to, to ensure both the efficiency and uh, the respect of, of the protection of the rights of defendants. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have a last call for one or two short questions. If there are any, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, thank you for the presentations. Um, I have a, sort of a general question about the uh, role of de the European delegated prosecutors. Um, as far as I remember from the wording of the regulation, they're required to be independent of their na national prosecuting authority. Um, at the same time, on a practical everyday level, you'd expect them to interact quite in different ways and to seek advice perhaps from colleagues in the national prosecution Author authority. Is this issue something that's just left to be, you know, it's, it's, an, inform, it's, it's about an informal matter of whatever relationship happens to be there? Um, so, for example, um, how active should European delegated prosecutors be in advising on possible um, errors of procedure or possible grounds for challenging um, decisions made in, 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 by, by the European prosecutor in, in national proceedings? Um, should they sort of be passive about that and let the accused or the suspect take the initiative? And if the accused or suspect doesn't say anything or do anything, then just leave it. Should they be more active in, in that respect? And should, what kind of relationship with the uh, national prosecutors is, happens or is understood or is um, expected? Thank you. Anyone else? Last chance. Oh, ah, over there. Yes, my question is for um, Professor Mitsilegas. Um, you mentioned Switzerland, uh, and then when issuing a mutual legal assistance request, to what extent do you think that the use of the double hat hinders the EPPO's legal position first at a national level, and then as a representative of the EU? And uh, second, do you think that in the future this could be a deterrent for other third countries to modify agreements made directly with the EU to recognize the EPPO as a competent authority? Thank you. I think the first question was for you. I will give you a very brief and very definite answer on your question. It is assured that EDPs are completely independent from national prosecution offices. They have the status, they have uh, the whole structure of it, and uh, they are not bound by any means than, than by national hierarchies or by, by uh, any decisions taken at the national level. So, brief, very brief answer to this and very definite about this, they are independent. Your, your microphone is... Oh. I, I meant when issuing a mutual legal assistance request to Switzerland, using the, the, the national hat, if that hinders the legal position of, as a global actor, and if that would be a deterrent for other member states to not recognize the EPPO as a competent authority to issue a mutual legal assistance request. Well, I think that was the question for you, huh? That was for me. Please <laughs> <laughs> answer. <laughs> I think it depends on the third country. I mean, I'm not sure one can generalize. I think uh, many people in this room probably are a bit spooked by the Swiss reaction. Uh, this is a bit too close for, for comfort. I think that it depends on the instrument. It depends on, on who are we talking about. I mean, my common sense, without really being a practitioner, is that for many third countries, it would be an advantage to have a single contact point in, in the European Union, uh, you know, in the EPPO uh, for certain cases. But I, uh, what I try to raise is that then there is a lot of complexity internally in EU law about how this is received in view of the fact that, you know, there are many countries which do not participate and, uh, and you know, we have this, this uh, layering between the supranational and, and, and the national, in a sense, in how the EPO operates internally. So, 
Um, I think that the decision on whether to cooperate with the EPPO in the lines that you mentioned is, is a political one, ultimately. I mean, if you, uh, if you have uh, countries that, you know, want to make life difficult, then they will not accept the EPPO. There is, there is mentioning in Article 104, I think, also about subject to the acceptance of the third country. So I think the drafters of the regulation were very conscious that this may happen, but I'm not sure that this applies to every single partner across the world. I think I see it as an opportunity, I think, for the EPPO and for the EU to project itself as a global actor and to, and to offer something to the world uh, that is simpler as regards from their perspective. So, you know, from the perspective of them sending a request to Europe, in a sense, and Europe uh, being something which has a one-stop shop and speaks with one voice with regard to very practical cooperation. Thank you very much. So it's up to me to thank the panelists again for their excellent presentations, to thank you for your questions and comments, and now we have a coffee break all together. Thank you very much.
So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So it is a real pleasure and an honor to share this last panel of the afternoon, which is devoted, as you know, to the uh, EPO and the role of participants in the criminal procedure. I would like to thank very warmly my colleague and friend, Professor Katalin Ligeti, her team, and uh, especially Panayotis for the organization of this uh, conference. So about the title of this panel, so the EPO and the role of participants in the criminal procedure, the word participants in the criminal procedure is here, of course, to be understood in the broad sense of the word, if I may say so, because our three distinguished speakers will focus on the equality of arms between prosecutor and uh, between prosecution and uh, the defense, but also on the national judiciary and um, on the Court of Justice um, of the European Union. So I will ask our three distinguished speakers to stick to um, 20 minutes time um, for their presentation, and I propose to follow the order of appearance in, uh, in the, the program. So I propose to start with uh, Professor Michiel Luchtmann from uh, Utrecht University. Michiel uh, is in charge of the share entitled Transnational Law Enforcement and Fundamental Rights. He has published extensively on EU criminal law, uh, including on the EPO, um, of course. And uh, recently, he especially published um, on the EPO in the national legal order um, of uh, the Netherlands. And he is also a contact point for the Netherlands within our ECLAN network, so our European Criminal Law Academic uh, Network. So, Michiel, you will focus your presentation on the EPO and the National Judiciary, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here in, uh, in Luxembourg, particularly to, uh, to Katalin and also to Panos for the excellent organization. Uh, and I've been, been asked to talk uh, for quite some while now for the first time online, or for life, I should say, uh, uh, on the role of the, the, the national judiciary in relation to the EPPO. And that is, of course, a tremendously broad topic. Um, we have been, we are conducting currently a, a, a project at, at Utrecht University with me and also Jos Kigrat, who talked about uh, the examining magistrates yesterday, Koen Bovendeert about the, the many different elements that are combined um, in, this, in this project. And what I would like to do now is focus on the, on the role of the, the national judge in relation to the EPPO as an indivisible body, as it says also in the regulation. Um, and more particularly, how are courts to offer uh, judicial protection in such cases? And there have been many references also already in previous uh, presentations uh, fortunately, mine is a bit different, so uh, I hope to, to give you at least two alternative visions on what could happen uh, for the years to come. Uh, when we talk about the, um, the EPPO, of course, um, there's many uh, often contradictory signals as relation, in its relation to the, to the courts and to the judges. Uh, first of all, there may be overlap, which has been non-existent previously, between the role, of, for instance, uh, the permanent chambers and the role of uh, magistrates in national preliminary investigations, uh, for instance, uh, supervising the expediency of the investigations, but also in horizontal affairs. Um, so often it is not clearly defined which of the many national courts involved is required or called upon uh, to offer, for instance, legal protection in EPPO cases. Um, and this, I think, is particularly relevant also in the case of uh, unlawfully obtained evidence. And, of course, there's a third complication, and that is that national courts have different roles to fulfill in relation to the EPPO. They may be uh, authorizing judges, they may authorize uh, uh, intrusive measures, uh, but they may also be required upon to, uh, to offer legal protection, um, as required by Article 47 of the Charter, 
Um, and of course, most importantly, they are to pass guilt on, uh, or they, pass, they are to pass judgment on guilt or innocence. Um, talking about the regulation, I hope it works. It clearly doesn't. Uh, talk about the regulation, we have a number of provisions in the, um, uh, uh, in the regulation that are, of course, of relevance for the position, of course. Can you please? Yeah. First of all, of course, there's Article 30, um, uh, in which it is stipulated that um, uh, uh, delegated prosecutors should have to their availability a certain course of measures, and if they uh, don't have those measures themselves, they can, of course, request the following measures to the competent national authorities, and those would be typically judges. And of course, we have been talking about uh, already in the previous presentations about the authorization in cross-border cases. Um, then we have Article 42. I will pay a bit more attention to that in the, in the following uh, slides, if they would like to appear, um, where, where it is say, said that um, there should be uh, legal protection for procedural acts uh, that are intended to produce legal effects vis-a-vis -vis third parties. There we go, thanks. And um, of course, uh, important also, the recitals. Uh, the regulation does not affect, as it has been uh, the main rule for the other actors, the powers of national trial courts, provided, of course, that evidence that is obtained uh, from in another uh, participating state cannot be denied its uh, admissibility on that uh, sole reason. If we talk about Article 42, uh, one of the issues that will come up, I think, in the, in, in the next uh, years or so, is that what, what is precisely meant with this article. Uh, of course, uh, the, the formulation of it very much reminds of the criteria that we see from Article 263 uh, on the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. And that would mean is that, of course, um, as was clearly intended by the drafters of the regulation, um, that this system, Article 42, replaces uh, that system of preliminary references um, that normally would go to the Court of Justice, as this is an uh, EU body, as we all know. But I think there's a second reason or a second rationale behind Article 42, and that is that it is also in, um, ensuring that remedies should be available where we have violations of rights that are protected by EU law. And there is some uh, reminder of this also in the preamble, um, which clearly says is that uh, national procedural rules um, should be in place, so to say, um, that uh, offer remedies uh, in, in terms of equivalence uh, similar to those uh, available on the national investigations, but at any rate effective, uh, meaning that uh, the exercise of rights should not be made impossible or excessively difficult. So in my view, Article 42 um, can at the very least have not a smaller scope than Article 263 of the treaty, but it can have a broader scope. And in fact, it should have a broader scope uh, in any case, in all situations where we have under EPPO investigations uh, infringements of EU law. Um, then the question is, which of the courts is to offer this protection um, because um, Article 42 quite broadly refers to competent national courts uh, without defining uh, which of those courts, many horizontal and horizontal relationships, which one uh, could be the, uh, uh, the, the court offering protection. And here uh, I want to also to look back at, at, at something that was said in, uh, in previous panels and ask the question of whether or not there is also a role for the trial courts to play in this regard. And, and of course, we are very much reminded, all of us, by the situation that we know uh, in, in, in typical transnational investigations, where we have in many uh, countries a situation where trial courts are not concerned uh, with the legality, the lawfulness of investigative action that took place in other countries. Uh, for the uh, simple reason is that um, the argument often is, is that this is not our concern. We are not responsible for what the authorities in other countries have been doing, yes or no. Um, moreover, the violations did not take place on our soil, so why are we the ones that uh, 
to, to offer remedies. And first and foremost, also, um, there should be remedies available in, in that country too, because that is provided for under the ECHR. So a similar uh, argument could be made here. So there is no role for uh, trial courts under EPPO investigations um, in line with what we know in transnational criminal law. And uh, taking account uh, of the fact is that Article 42 guarantees uh, remedies at any rate, uh, and they should be provided for in the uh, assisting state or in the gathering state, I should say. The problem, of course, with that uh, argument is that there are a number of situations where we have problems uh, if we follow this approach strictly. Uh, first and foremost, there may be uh, investigative acts in uh, abroad where the defendant's interests are not directly at stake. Uh, so in that case, he would not be open, he would not have to his availability a remedy in that state. And then later in the trial stage, courts would say, no, we don't hear your argument. Um, this may be combined with the fact that the investigations may be sometimes still covert or uh, 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 secret in the stage of the investigation. And sometimes even also, and this is not untypical as we know since uh, Gavanas of two, uh, that there may be no remedies uh, available under national law, even though it is required for by EU law. And in those situations, uh, we, we, we are facing a situation where there is um, no remedy available. In most cases, I think particularly for the defendant. And that uh, then raises the question, um, how can you remedy this or how can you reconcile this with Article 47? Because in my view, this would be a limitation of that right, the right to an effective remedy by a court, uh, and that requires a justification. Which is why I think there's also a second interpretation possible. Uh, it, it, it follows a completely, but in the end, it may not be so different approach, uh, starting from the point that um, the argument that EPO, EPPO investigations do not concern the actions in other states is a bit flawed if you think of the fact that this is an indivisible body. Uh, so we are not talking about investigations of, for instance, the Dutch uh, prosecutors on Dutch soil, um, the Dutch delegated prosecutions, uh, sorry, prosecutors, but we are talking about investigations of the EPPO as a whole. So there is no clear distinction to be made between the Dutch part of the EPPO and, for instance, the German part. It is the same single body. And that means is that there may also be a different role for national courts uh, who can no longer really confine themselves to what happens on their specific territories and may have to think of um, how, at the very least, you can coordinate your remedies with other uh, judges. Um, this, then, uh, is to be seen in, in, in light of the, the second argument, uh, which I raised before, and that is, I think, is that uh, on the EPPO investigations, if there is infringements with EU rights, particularly charter rights, uh, there should be a remedy available. And um, article, sorry, recital 80 of the, of the uh, regulation says is that indeed you cannot deny admission of evidence on the sole ground that it has been obtained abroad, but it also says in the recital um, that the court must respect the fairness of the procedures. That reminded me of a recent case which has nothing to do, or at least not directly, with the EPPO. There's a whole series of cases, as you may well know, on data retention, uh, where we now see the first cases coming from uh, mostly the Grand Chamber of the Court in Procurature, but there are others as well, saying that um, it, it, it affects the fairness of a trial if evidence, important evidence, is used in criminal procedures um, by judges without um, the defendant being able to comment effectively on those materials, on that evidence. And if they cannot do so, if they are not able to, pre to, to uh, uh, pre present this possibility to comment effectively, uh, either they have to offer the remedies themselves, would be my conclusion, or they would violate the right, the right to a fair trial if they would still use the evidence. Um, the words, a field of which the judges have no knowledge, is of course wide open to interpretation. Uh, but maybe uh, let me give you a suggestion. Uh, you could also apply this in situations where trial courts want to use evidence obtained in foreign jurisdictions. 
And then, uh, instead of a chain approach, uh, which um, has been advocated uh, uh, by many already, uh, also for EPPO investigations, it would, sorry, it would, instead of a separation approach, it would be a chain approach. Um, starting from the principle that Article 47 requires that for all violations of uh, EU rights, there must be a remedy available because this is required for under Article 47. And that means for trial courts, uh, first, that if the remedy was available for the affected parties but not used, then I would say, of, of course, then there is no position for the trial courts either as a basic rule because they could have availed themselves of the remedies elsewhere but this was not done, and then uh, that's it. Um, there may also be the situation where there was a remedy available and used by the parties that are also party in the trial. And then I think uh, it, it makes sense to use the argument of mutual trust, saying that um, this, this judgment is no longer to be affected by uh, uh, the trial court, it is to be respected. Um, and then, of course, there may be some debate on what would be the procedural consequences of such a finding of unlawfulness or not, or that it has been uh, lawful, but then also it, it, it is to be admitted as evidence per se. So the, the main difference, I think, in, in this approach would be the situations uh, where remedies um, could not be offered to the later defendant in the gathering jurisdiction, uh, but he still wants to comment effectively on the evidence. And there, I think, uh, the position of the trial courts should be is that they should hear the case. Um, also, and that is, uh, of course, the big if or the big, the, the big questions that follow, um, what do you do then? Um, which laws are to be applied? And as we have seen before, we are completely open on this uh, at the moment. So it is very good is that we do have these, these references coming up, uh, not particularly on this. Uh, but on related issues. So which laws do you apply uh, for assessing the lawfulness? Uh, can this be the laws of your own state, which would be a, a bit odd. Um, but also, of course, there's the main difficulty of applying laws of other states. But you could also have a sort of an intermediary solution saying that, well, what is not, it is not really the laws of other states that are applied, but it is the application of EU law to know the regulation the general principles of EU law, and also the charter rights. And that would mean um, is that there is a more marginal test of uh, national laws of the gathering state, which may even develop, and now I'm becoming a bit provocative, um, autonomously from the jurisdictions or the legal orders of that particular state. Um, and then the second point, of course, is uh, what is the, one more minute, what is the, the procedural uh, consequence if you uh, find a violation. Um, you could, of course, say, well, this is uh, not an issue if the action that was unlawful in, under the gathering uh, jurisdiction is lawful under our state and simply admit it. Um, but I would find that very odd, actually. Um, uh, I would say is that what would be more appropriate to do is to attach uh, the same procedural consequences to such a finding of unlawfulness or a similar fault or unlawfulness and then attach the consequences that normally would have been attached to it in a purely national case. We don't know. So this is, um, uh, I, I think, one of the, the, the issues that will come up for the, for the years to come. Um, and then I will conclude. Um, very basically, I think André Klip said at the start of, the, uh, of this conference is that where all are competent, um, no one is really responsible. I think this goes in many ways here. Um, it affects not only the, the many legal orders involved, but it also affects the, the relationships between the judiciary and the legislator. Uh, because it is high time, I would say, um, is that these um, issues are taken up, um, preferably by uh, laws, but if not, uh, it will soon be on the plate of the, of the Court of Justice. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you um, very much, uh, Mikil, um, for this uh, very clear, sometimes provocative, as you uh, uh, said uh, yourself, um, uh, speech. So thank you, and thank you also for having stick to uh, to the time. Um, so principle of effective judicial protection, right to a remedy, fair trial. I'm sure we will come back to at least some of these uh, notions with our next uh, speaker. So Vania Costa Ramos. Vania is a defense lawyer in uh, Portugal. She has a, an impressive experience in international cooperation cases in, in criminal uh, matters, and in particular in cross-border cases within the EU. She plays a crucial role in several associations and, and networks dealing with uh, defense rights, and she is especially vice chair of the European Criminal Bar Association, so uh, well-known EGBA. Uh, she has published a lot on the topic and contributes to our new journal of European criminal law, where she is an associated um, editor. And Vania, you will focus on the EPO and the equality of arms between the prosecutor and the defense. So we are looking forward to listening to you, please. Yes. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This is a difficult task to speak towards the end of a conference, so I hope that uh, I will be able to keep you awake. So thank you very much, Professor Ligeti and uh, Panayotis, for the organization of this wonderful conference, and to all the speakers and participants uh, for the excellent level of um, uh, exchanges here. So the topic that I was given is uh, huge, equality of arms and the EPPO. And I am the only defense lawyer here, which already shows a little bit maybe the structural imbalance that is typical of uh, uh, such uh, uh, criminal proceedings at European level. So maybe the first question that was provoked, I was provoked with by someone in the room was, is there equality of arms? Is this a concept that even belongs in criminal proceedings, or, or is it completely not uh, a place uh, for this principle? Of course, I disagree with this assumption, but equality of arms in criminal proceedings is not, does not have the same meaning as in purely adversarial civil cases. So we need to look into the particulars of criminal cases and to put uh, this problem in place. So w what does it entail to speak about equality of arms in a criminal case? Of course it is about to try to compensate for the structural inequality that exists when you have a, a case in which one of the parties is the state, a state that, may, that has the monopoly of force, of coercion, and has at its reach many intrusive measures that will not be available for the defense. So typically, uh, equality of arms is dealt with in criminal cases by uh, multiple, multiple approach, pronged approach, uh, namely by setting up objective safeguards. For example, it's not a prosecutor who will investigate and try a case. You have a court. This is, a, of course, a necessary safeguard if there is to be any equality of arms in a criminal case but also to empower, to give to the accused a legal status, a strong legal status, with a list of, uh, a far-reaching list of rights and possibilities to intervene in his case, to rebut the accusations against him or her, and to influence the decision of a court uh, at the end of the day. So, this structural inequality is present in any, in any criminal case, also at domestic level, and we have to acknowledge it. Uh, what is the situation in EPPO cases? So is there more inequality or is this just a, a new set of proceedings that has exactly the same issues? Uh, I would say that uh, there is an added imbalance in EPPO cases, and I, I will explain why. My, my task will be may have been made easier by, by my predecessor that already touched upon part of the issue. 
But I, I would like to draw the attention to one point, that equality of arms, it's not only about rights and objective safeguards. It's not only about finding which rights should be in place for the accused. It's also a kind of aim, a, an objective and something that is pervasive in the whole of the criminal proceedings. So when we speak about equality of arms, it's not only, in my view, about minimum rights or what is the whole, the very minimum, but aiming at setting up a procedure that overall is uh, uh, capable of giving a fair uh, trial to the accused and to create trust in society about these criminal cases. So the, how, why is there an added imbalance in EPPO cases? In my view, and certainly uh, I'm not the only one, I'm just following other scholars that have written about this. So there are two, two typical problems in uh, cross-border cases and EPPO, especially because it's still applying diverging uh, laws, as we saw, uh, does not escape uh, of this problem. And the, the two problems are this systemic flaw. The systemic flaw, and I take the words of my predecessor also, it um, basically means that even procedural uh, settings that are in compliance with the Charter, for example, or the ECHR, uh, when they are mixed with other, other systems, they will no, no longer be compliant. We had an example today, the case of police interviews, for example. Also in my jurisdiction, normally a police interview cannot be used in the trial unless there are exceptions, of course, but unless all parties agree to it, because typically it will be less reliable, it's not a verbatim uh, account of what was said, and the police officers may have less uh, training and uh, knowledge to uh, collect this evidence. Also, no lawyer was present or no, no adversarial uh, uh, questioning was made. If we export this uh, procès verbal of the witness to another member state, maybe Holland, I don't know if the, this would be the best example, but maybe then it will be used uh, just like any other piece of evidence. It will lose these limitations that it had in Portuguese law. So all systems, even if they are fair, which they are not always, they have this balance between investigative stage, trial stage, and this will be uh, disturbed when we uh, put two or three or four legal systems in context. The second problem is, and I will not uh, deal with details because uh, Michelle has touched upon this, it's this legal fragmentation of judicial protection, and there are many in the room who have written about this, once you put two legal systems in touch, you create gaps in judicial legal protection. So one would expect, of course, that seeing a single office and the single office principle that was established for the EPPO, that one would also find a kind of uh, EU-wide uh, charter of rights, uh, rights of the defendant, a kind of like def defendant bill of rights, or also that one would find a system of judicial review uh, institutional, procedural, or substantive remedies. Uh, I mean, uh, courts have a role, but uh, they will have some difficulties, as we saw today, to know what role do they have. What is the procedure? What is the type of review that should be done? And what are the consequences? So I would say uh, one single office, but no single charter of rights, no single court, no single process, and no single remedies. So this even adds more to the uh, structural imbalance. So against this backdrop, uh, what can one do to um, address these areas that uh, will require some improvement to you know, uh, put the scales at a more balanced level? I, I cannot touch all the issues, so I try to choose uh, certain issues and I will deal with it summarily and then I hope I can write about it. So uh, the first main topic is the lack of clear legislation, so lack of clear rules. And the second topic, which is uh, a broad topic, could be divided into parts, but I grouped it all in, into one, because for me, this is all connected with one of the essential rights uh, of an accused, which is the right to legal assistance. And within this right to legal assistance, we can include uh, certain features that, in my view, could be addressed, could be uh, the object of discussions and of improvements by means of clear uh, regulations in the regulation. On one hand, 
the proactive, uh, the necessity to establish a concept of legal assistance, because what does it mean, legal assistance? I will go into detail. It can mean many things. It can mean the lawyer sitting in a room and signing the paperwork and doing nothing, or it can mean a lawyer that will collect evidence on behalf of the accused. So there must be a kind of uh, attempt to establish a concept of what does this mean. Uh, further, uh, uh, the active defence participation in the case and the availability of what I will call, maybe this is not the final name, this is just the first attempt, I will call this a total defence or global defence. It's, it's no longer a dual defence because there is a kind of unique procedure, but we need a kind of total or global defense. It's a defense that will be able to deal with all the applicable laws in an EPPO case. And this must include, uh, of course, legal aid where it is necessary. Finally, two other rights that are connected to the uh, right to legal assistance and the rights of defense. It's the access to case materials. Why? I, because without that, uh, you can give all the rights and all the possibilities for legal assistance, but it will not be very effective if you don't know about the uh, evidence in the case. And finally, the problem of lack of effective remedies. That I think I will leave it out because we've already had an excellent speech about it, but again, the rights of defence and the right to legal assistance will be meaningless if there is no way to judicially make them enforceable and also to uh, uh, draw consequences in case of a violation. So the first point is lack of clear legislation and this, this is something that uh, may come, uh, for those who are not familiar with the negotiations of the regulation may be surprising because the regulation is quite long, has many recitals, many articles, but not many are devoted to uh, the rights of defence. I am used to see in criminal procedure codes, I don't know all of the 22 member states, but at least the ones I know, normally there are clear rules about uh, the position of an accused, when one becomes an accused, what rights and duties that position entails, and also separately uh, for the defence lawyer that has not only the right to exercise the rights of his client, but sometimes even his own privileges and immunities and these rights on his own. So nothing like this, not even minimalistically, is included in the uh, regulation. This could be, of course, uh, an issue I found, uh, not much, but I found an interesting case of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, an older one. I will not, I, the name is something like Koemi, but I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it well because it's Dutch or, 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 or Flemish. But it is about the lack of clarity in criminal procedure. So if, if there are no nullum judicium sine lege, so basically a procedure has to be established by law. In, in criminal cases you need clear rules. This is a basic tenet of the fair trial and also uh, of the guarantee of equality of arms. And these are not my words, these are the words of the European uh, Court of Human Rights. It was a case about a procedure at the appellate level in the Court of Cassation when it was acting as a first instance and it kind of had to create uh, uh, or adjust the criminal procedural rules because there were no specific rules in that case. And the court found a violation. So when one looks at the regulation, uh, I think and I'm clearly convinced that this is an area, should one amend the regulation, that needs to be tackled. One needs to have clear, uh, clear uh, clear rules about the essential uh, rights of defence, namely the right to legal assistance. And when I say clear rules, I'm not meaning minimum rules. <laughs> Why? Because, as I said, for me, equality of arms is an objective. And to reach this objective, and maybe uh, I think it's Dr. Henfeld in, in the commentary also says that Article 41, number one, says that the activities of the EPPO should be in full compliance with the Charter and the right to a fair trial and the rights of defence. So it seems in full compliance. It's not let's put a minimum that will allow us to be you know, charter proof, but we should aim at be as compliant as possible. So I think there should be some ambition, and this ambition is essential to make the EPPO a, an institution that will be also trusted, trusted by the public and trusted by society. Uh, since it will then respect the, the uh, fair trial. I will not uh, go into each right that should be included, of course, because there is no time, but I will uh, uh, announce or publicize the ECBA cornerstones in 2013, 
they are surprisingly uh, still uh, very uh, relevant nowadays because there was a proposal to include certain rights in the regulation, but none of them was uh, included explicitly, so I would draw your attention to read these cornerstones that are quite ambitious. So into the specifics of legal assistance and trying to, to cut it short, uh, why do I talk about this? Because if we look, for example, into the, again, the European Court of Human Rights case law, we will see, and one of my favorite cases is uh, Diana versus Turkey, where the court addresses what, what, I, what is the lawyer supposed to do? So uh, while we were discussing uh, after Saldus, well, a lawyer has to be in the interrogation, or the person has the right to have his lawyer in a custodial interrogation, then some courts of some member states were saying, well, but the lawyer can only sit there or can talk to the person before, but then not during the interrogation, or if he's in the interrogation, he's only sitting there, he cannot do anything. Uh, the court had to clarify what, what the right to legal assistance meant, and it did uh, say that uh, the uh, right to legal assistance includes a whole range of services that a lawyer should uh, make available to his client. And this whole range of service includes not only assisting a client in an interrogation, but collecting evidence for his defense, uh, preparing the case, accessing case materials, and assisting uh, the person in distress, among others. The court, uh, there, are, there is more case law uh, about the, the particulars. But when one looks at legal assistance, and there is an interesting study about this, uh, the law may not be very different, but the practice, the culture, and the ethics, and the, the statutes applicable to lawyers are not the same in all the countries. So the way that a criminal defense lawyer sees also himself or herself uh, what they are supposed to do are not the same. This is also a cultural issue. So when we talk about legal assistance in EPPO cases, we should, in my view, aim to have a far-reaching and effective legal assistance, which cannot be the one where the lawyer just sits there in the interrogation, but it should be legal assistance where the lawyer should be proactive and should be allowed also to actively participate and somehow help to collect evidence for his client. I'm not going to propose here how to do it because we know this is a discussion for another seminar, whether there should be private investigators, whether the lawyers can, can hire uh, people to collect evidence, or whether it, it should be done via the prosecutor's office, or if there should be a kind of liberties judge to whom the uh, defense lawyer could ask to obtain certain evidence, how, how will it work? But it is for sure that the model should be a model of a more proactive legal assistance. And why is this so needed? Because right now we have different systems in different member states. There are studies showing this. So in an EPPO case, we may be facing a situation where in one part of the case, the lawyer is considered to have broad rights of intervention, participation, even meeting a witness, collecting a deposition. And in other member states, this would be tampering with the evidence or interfering with the case and even creating a big problems for the defense lawyer. So I think this is one of the points that should be addressed. The second point I will address a bit more in detail is access to the case files, because this is uh, a point that is essential, as I said, for the rights of defense. And here, uh, to, to make my conflict of interest very clear, as the vice chair of the ECBA, we have been uh, vouching for uh, more clear regulations, and we are uh, currently also collecting with colleagues in all member states, practitioners, their information from law and practice of access to the case file in member states. Not only what the law says, but also how it works in practice. Do they normally get access to the case files? Can they challenge lack of access to the case file? Uh, is it a digital copy or do they have to go to the court? H how does it actually work? And it's not complete, but it already shows what we already know, that there is a, a, a wide variety of arrangements in member states, and not only in law, but also in practice, making this right completely different throughout uh, EPPO member states. So in this point, uh, what should be done, uh, of course, the, to, to regulate the right to access to um, case materials? So I think, and also in this case, the ECBA thinks that we should have a right to access to the case materials, which is complete, of course, so to the whole file. There is no, no longer this uh, assisting uh, uh, EIO executing state file, which is normally a file like this, and then the main file, and you can delay the access to the main file and give only a part of the file. It's one file. So when we talk about access to the case file, we are talking about the one case file, the EPPO case file, Article 45, I think it's clear on this. 
access should be given as early as possible and uh, what we defend is that in certain cases, detention, freezing of assets. Imagine once all assets are frozen, uh, such as in seizures or certain types of evidence gathering, it should be, uh, the EPPO proceedings should be structured in a way that the prosecutor will be prepared to open the case file and to let the accused see what is in the case file and then effectively not only challenge any procedural acts, but also contribute to the case. We need to see this not only as a contest, defense and prosecution. If an accused wants to admit his fault and, for example, try to get a cooperation agreement or a simplified procedure, which is often the case in many jurisdictions, uh, the accused needs to know about the case or his defense lawyer needs to know about the case, otherwise he will not advise him to cooperate. So it often may be very much in the interest of the uh, investigation to give access as quickly as possible to uh, the uh, defense lawyer. How can this be done? And this is the provocation that uh, I have already made in another occasion. Uh, so, of course, on one hand, the regulation should be amended and there should be clear rules about access to the case file because what we have now is a referral to national law and to the, uh, to the national law of the handling member state and to the uh, directive, which is not so specific. I will go in detail. So, what we try to vouch is for the adoption by the EPPO, if possible, of good practices, of some kind of guidelines or recommendation by exchanging views among prosecutors, of course, in, within the EPPO, because there are different cultures and ways of investigating and, and preparing to open the case file to the defense, and also exchanging views with uh, defense lawyers, namely with the CCBE, ECBA, and, and other relevant stakeholders. So uh, we think that it is the first step is the EPPO should itself establish a good practice. This would not violate the regulation. Why? Because the regulation refers to EU law also. It establishes that there will be one case file and it establishes that national law is applicable but national law is limited by the directive uh, on uh, Article 7 of Directive 2012-13. This directive in turn has some um, general concepts that will need to be specified and this is the area of discretion. We all know in each case a prosecutor may or may not grant access to the case file. There are discretionary criteria. There is not normally not a yes or no criteria. It's a discretionary judgment and it is in this margin of discretion that we believe that the EPPO could establish good practice, could establish a prosecution policy in the sense of okay we have to know that if someone is detained for example uh, we will have to give access to the case file. So we have to know that we should only detain as far as possible in the moment where we can show the case file without uh, uh, jeopardizing the investigation. So we uh, vouch for this and of course at a later stage to, to uh, uh, amend the regulation. I, I would finish because I, already, I think I already have 30 seconds too much out of my time, but I would just like to, to finish by saying that uh, I think addressing the imbalance needs to uh, be done, of course, by, by uh, two uh, actions, one in short term and the other in medium or long term, depending on how politics helps. So the first one is, of course, that the EPPO itself set, sets itself the bar high and aims at a high level of procedural safeguards to maximize the respect of equality of arms and to try to harmonize in its practice the respect for the rights of defense. In a, in a more medium term, to create this strong uh, set of procedural safeguards laid down in the regulation and addressing the specificities of EPPO cases, namely the systemic flaws and the, the fragmented le legal protection, and also the problem of having clear, effective judicial remedies, judicial review, and finally, and this is probably the hardest part, uh, to grant that there is not only effective review before the national courts, but also access to a European court, to a EU court. There cannot be equality of arms, as is today, in my view, of course, in my humble view, if the accused has no chance to bring to the EU court matters of EU law that will affect the outcome of his case. And all we have now is preliminary ruling, which is not an appeal, and there is no right to, to enforce it 
um, maybe in some countries like Germany, you can raise a constitutional complaint uh, if there is a refusal to refer, but uh, this is, I think, an exception rather than the rule. But mostly there are no remedies and there is no direct access, but there is direct access to challenge a closure of the case. So this is clearly, for me, a, a, a point of inequality. And so I finish, I have this dream, and this dream is one single office, one global defense, and one single court. So who knows if in 10 years or 20, maybe if I'm still alive, we are here discussing the single court and uh, the single defense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanya, for your very rich contribution, especially for having given concrete illustration of the current imbalance between prosecution and defense, and for the recommendations you made uh, also to well, better implement this uh, equality of arms objective, as you uh, uh, called it. So I will now switch to French to um, introduce Judge Bill Gen. Um, for those of you uh, who would have difficulties understanding uh, French, interpretation is available, and I think it's channel one uh, on the little machine. Um, donc pour clore euh, ce panel, je, je me tourne maintenant vers vous, monsieur euh, le juge Bilgen. Euh, entre 1999 et 2009, vous avez exercé divers mandats ministériels, euh, dont celui du, du ministre de la Justice, de 2009 à 2013. Donc 2009, évidemment, on en parlait juste avant le début de ce panel, quand tout a commencé, entré en vigueur, évidemment, euh, du traité sur le fonctionnement de, de, de l'Union européenne. Euh, vous êtes juge à la Cour de justice depuis 9 ans, bientôt 9 ans maintenant, donc depuis euh, octobre 2013. Et à ce titre, vous êtes évidemment euh, particulièrement bien placé pour nous parler de la question de savoir si la Cour de justice est prête à recevoir des affaires concernant le euh, parquet européen. À ce jour, si je suis bien informée, donc, il n'y a qu'un renvoi euh, préjudiciel par une juridiction euh, autrichienne dans l'affaire C281-22 euh, qui concerne les articles 31, je pense, et 32 euh, du euh, règlement, donc entre autres sur les enquêtes euh, transfrontières. Euh, et, et bien entendu, donc qu'un seul renvoi préjudiciel pour le moment, mais les débuts sont toujours euh, timides et comme vous le savez, euh, la compétence préjudicielle de la Cour de justice est limitée à divers égards par euh, le règlement lui-même. Mais nul doute que euh, le dialogue entre les cours et tribunaux nationaux et la Cour euh, de justice va aller en euh, s'intensifiant, va aller en, en s'amplifiant. Et plusieurs des orateurs de ce jour en ont d'ailleurs rappelé, ont souligné la nécessité de donner l'opportunité à la Cour de justice de clarifier et d'interpréter de nombreuses notions figurant dans, euh, dans le règlement. Voilà, monsieur le juge, nous vous écoutons. Oui. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first, I want to thank the, organi the organisa organization for this organization and especially for giving me the chance to um, make my speech in the working language of the court, which is French, but I'm, all, but I'm ready to uh, answer questions also in, in English. Uh, comme vous l'avez dit, avant de devenir juge à la Cour de justice, j'ai eu la chance de participer en tant que ministre de la Justice du Luxembourg à la mise en œuvre au sein du Conseil en matière de justice d'affaires intérieures euh, d'IJAI des nouvelles dispositions prévues par le traité de Lisbonne quant à la création du parquet européen. Je dois avouer qu'à l'époque, je ne croyais pas assister aussi vite à la naissance de cet organe et pourtant la mise en place rapide de la coopération renforcée a permis en seulement une dizaine d'années l'installation du parquet européen à Luxembourg à proximité de la Cour de justice. C'est d'ailleurs à l'occasion d'une conférence relative au parquet européen organisée à Luxembourg il y a dix ans que j'ai coopéré pour la première fois avec Cataline Ligeti qui travaillait à l'époque sur les Model Rules for the Procedure of the EPPO. Je me souviens qu'à ce moment-là, le rôle est dans les premiers textes le rôle de la Cour de justice dans les procédures était fortement controversé, voire même contesté. Si ce rôle a finalement été consacré dans le règlement, comme vous le dites, 
dans une certaine mesure, mais je dirais dans une mesure certaine, il est assez, il est assez amusant de constater aujourd'hui que c'est la capacité de la Cour de justice à recevoir les affaires du, port, du parquet européen qui peut faire débat. Même s'il faut s'attendre à ce que la Cour soit conformément à l'article 42 du règlement que nous avons déjà vu, saisie d'un certain nombre de recours directs impliquant le parquet européen, comme euh, comme ceux relatifs à une décision du parquet européen visant à classer une affaire sans suite, je crois que la Cour emploiera davantage de temps, non pas à régler ses recours directs, mais à régler euh, les affaires des renvois préjudiciels euh, qui vont constituer, à mon avis, le principal défi pour la Cour de justice. En effet, si pendant longtemps le traitement des recours en manquement introduit par la Commission contre des États membres représentait la majeure partie des affaires traitées par la Cour, ce sont désormais les renvois préjudiciels introduits par les juridictions nationales qui en constituent la partie majeure. Preuve en est que durant l'année 2021, 547 des 772 affaires dont la Cour a été saisie étaient des renvois préjudiciels. Certes, jusqu'à récemment, la Cour de justice n'a dans les affaires impliquant le parquet européen dont, la, dont elle a été saisie, qui ont d'ailleurs toutes été traitées par le tribunal, tranché que des questions relatives à la nomination de procureurs européens et de procureurs européens délégués. Toutefois, comme vous venez de le dire, le 25 avril dernier, la Cour a été saisie d'un premier envoi préjudiciel, à savoir l'affaire GK et autres C281-22. Dans le cadre de ce renvoi préjudiciel, l'Oberlandesgericht Wien a posé à la Cour des questions dont le libellé me semble symptomatique des problématiques relatives au parquet européen qui pourront à l'avenir être déférées à la Cour. Et je vous cite les trois questions. Première question. Le droit de l'Union, en particulier l'article 31, paragraphe 3, premier alinéa, et l'article 32 du règlement, euh, doit-il être interprété en ce sens que lorsque, dans des enquêtes transfrontalières, une mesure à exécuter dans l'État membre du procureur européen délégué assistant requiert une autorisation judiciaire, il y a lieu d'examiner tous les éléments de fond, à savoir les, si les faits relèvent des juridictions pénales, si les intéressés sont présumés coupables, si la mesure est nécessaire et proportionnée. Deuxième question. L'examen doit-il tenir compte du fait que l'admissibilité de la mesure a déjà été contrôlée par un juge dans l'État membre du procureur européen délégué chargé de l'affaire au regard de cet état, du droit de cet État membre Troisième question, si la première question appelle une réponse négative ou si la deuxième question appelle une réponse affirmative, quelle étendue doit avoir l'examen du juge dans l'État membre du procureur européen délégué assistant cette affaire euh, euh, concerne une enquête transfrontalière autrichienne-allemande. Alors, au-delà de la jurisprudence que la Cour de justice va développer en ce qui concerne spécifiquement la mise en œuvre du règlement, les affaires impliquant le parquet européen devraient probablement amener la Cour aussi à appliquer, voire le cas échéant, à étoffer sa jurisprudence quant au droit pénal spécial matériel notamment la directive 2017-13-71 relative à la lutte contre la fraude portant atteinte aux intérêts financiers de l'Union au moyen du droit pénal, ainsi que la directive 2014-41 concernant la décision d'enquête européenne en matière pénale, où nous avons d'ailleurs déjà un corpus de jurisprudence. Compte tenu de ces considérations, il est légitime de se demander si la Cour de justice devra ou non adapter ses procédures suite à la mise en place du parquet européen, entre autres par la création d'une chambre pénale spéciale, ce qui est souvent euh, mis en avant dans la doctrine. Si une telle innovation pourrait de prime abord apparaître nécessaire pour permettre à la Cour de travailler efficacement et rapidement sur les affaires relatives au parquet européen, je suis d'avis que les caractéristiques de la Cour ne s'y prêtent pas et que celle-ci est en réalité déjà en mesure de traiter ses affaires, si besoin, de façon rapide et efficace, alors même que de manière générale, euh, rapide et efficace ne rime pas toujours. La dernière grande réforme procédurale de la Cour, appliquée depuis 2008, à savoir la création de la PPU, procédure préjudicielle d'urgence, sur laquelle je reviendrai au cours de mon exposé, me semble d'ailleurs constituer une parfaite illustration du fait que la Cour sait mettre en balance les impératifs d'une bonne justice et d'une justice rapide. 
Afin d'exposer plus en détail mon point de vue, je commencerai par revenir sur le rôle généraliste de la Cour, puis je m'attarderai sur l'optimisation par cette dernière du traitement des affaires qui lui sont soumises. Le rôle généraliste de la Cour est d'assurer l'application et l'interprétation uniforme du droit de l'Union en assurant, si nécessaire, la primauté, l'unité et l'effectivité du droit de l'Union. Au fur et à mesure de son existence, mais aussi du développement du droit de l'Union, la Cour s'est muée en une Cour suprême de plus en plus constitutionnelle. En effet, à ses origines, elle fut plutôt une Cour administrative, mais elle a établi, suite aux arrêts Van Rentenloos et Costa Enel, et comme elle l'a encore rappelé récemment dans les affaires d'annulation de la réglementation euh, de la réglementation, dite conditionnalité euh, des fines, de, du budget, euh, affaire euh, traitée en assemblée plénière, et comme elle l'a encore rappelé dans ses affaires, elle est devenue un ordre juridique autonome basé sur les valeurs et principes inscrits dans le traité et la charte. Certes, la Cour repose, à l'instar de l'Union européenne, sur le principe de l'attribution spécifique. Mais elle applique et interprète le droit de l'Union de façon uniforme, en recourant souvent à des principes généraux du droit, comme celui de l'égalité du traitement ou celui du recours effectif, ainsi qu'à des notions autonomes du droit de l'Union, ce qu'elle a souvent fait en matière de droit pénal européen spécial. Il s'agit donc bien d'une Cour généraliste. Le comité 255, qui doit rendre un avis sur l'appropriation des candidats au poste des juges à la Cour, proposé par les États membres, souligne d'ailleurs dans son rapport d'activité que les juges de la Cour ne doivent pas nécessairement être spécialisés dans un domaine particulier du droit de l'Union, mais sont plutôt des généralistes aptes à impliquer les principes du droit de l'Union à toutes les questions lui soumises et son application dans les ordres juridiques nationaux. La Cour veille aussi à ce que l'ensemble de ses membres soient informés du contentieux dont elle est saisie, de manière à garantir et à cimenter leurs compétences généralistes, notamment dans, durant la réunion générale qui, tous les mardis à 17h30, donc bientôt, rassemble les 27 juges et les 11 avocats généraux de la Cour. Ceux-ci approuvent, sur base d'un rapport préalable établi par les juges rapporteurs, en concertation avec l'avocat général en charge de l'affaire, la formation du jugement à laquelle cette affaire sera soumise et la nécessité ou non d'une audience, de conclusion de l'avocat général ou encore de mesures provisoires. Cette réunion générale garantit en outre la cohérence et l'unité de la jurisprudence de la Cour. Il me semble également important de souligner que c'est justement le souci d'assurer l'unité et la cohérence de la jurisprudence qui a mené la Cour à proposer, face à la croissance du volume d'affaires devant le tribunal, une augmentation du nombre des juges de cette dernière plutôt que d'envisager en application de l'article 157 TFUE la création de tribunaux spécialisés adjoints au tribunal. En tout état de cause, j'estime que la création d'une chambre spécialisée, notamment en matière de droit pénal spécial, n'est pas nécessaire pour permettre à la Cour de traiter de manière efficace les affaires relatives au parquet européen, puisqu'elle procède en réalité déjà en son sein et une certaine spécialisation fonctionnelle, qu'elle soit informelle ou formelle. La spécialisation informelle se fait lorsque le président désigne le juge rapporteur qui sera amené à traiter une affaire pendant devant la Cour. En effet, la compétence généraliste des juges de la Cour n'empêche pas que, pour assurer le développement de la jurisprudence, de l'unité et la cohérence, et pour respecter un délai de traitement raisonnable, le président de la Cour confie, dans la mesure du possible, à un juge rapporteur les affaires relatives à une manière dans laquelle il a déjà officié, en se basant sur la fiche de pré-examen établie par la division de recherche et de documentation qui relate notamment les affaires clôturées et pendantes voisines, ce qui se fait entre autres en matière de droit pénal spécial. Puis il y a aussi la spécialisation formelle. En effet, la Cour a créé, suite à un appel de la part des chefs d'État et de gouvernement en 2004, elle a créé, à compter du 1er mars 2008, dans une forme très particulière, une chambre spécialisée dans le cadre de la procédure préjudicielle d'urgence, dite PPU, qui traite uniquement les affaires concernant les domaines visés au titre 5 de la troisième partie du traité, relatif à l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice, 
pour autant qu'il y ait urgence. Les affaires relatives au parquet européen, et plus particulièrement au droit pénal spécial, sont donc en principe susceptibles de relever de cette procédure. Ce n'est que le traité de Lisbonne, entré en vigueur le 1er décembre 2009, qui en communautarisation l'espace de liberté et de sécurité et de justice, a conféré à terme une compétence juridictionnelle à la Cour de justice en cette matière, s'y explique aussi que la, la jurisprudence est récente, mais elle est quand même consistante et elle est en train de s'étoffer tous les jours. Ceci dit, la Cour veille aussi à effectuer une optimisation du traitement des affaires lui soumises. Il ne faut en effet pas nier que la Cour est victime de son propre succès. Comme en attestent les statistiques pour l'année 2021, Loin sont les temps où, assis à la ville à Vauban, dans le parc de la ville de Luxembourg, les membres de la Cour attendaient impatiemment d'être saisis. Jusqu'à la date du 24 mai, la Cour a été saisie de 340 nouvelles affaires, dont 240 renvois préjudiciels, dont également 4 PPU. Les craintes certains de voir, suite à la mise en place du parquet européen, la Cour de justice confrontée à un volume d'affaires tellement élevé qu'il ne lui sera pas permis d'en assurer soit un traitement efficace, soit un traitement soutenu, soit ni l'un ni l'autre, sont donc compréhensibles. Il faut cependant souligner qu'en plus des contraintes temporelles dues, notamment à la traduction des demandes de décisions préjudicielles soumises à la Cour dans chacune des langues officielles de l'Union, 24, à leur envoi pour observation aux parties concernées, aux institutions européennes et aux États membres, ainsi qu'à la traduction dans ces mêmes langues de l'arrêt rendu par la Cour, la durée de traitement des renvois préjudiciels est susceptible de s'allonger lorsque l'affaire concernée nécessite de tenir une audience ou des conclusions de l'avocat général. Pour autant, depuis quelques années, la durée moyenne du traitement des renvois préjudiciels est en moyenne de 15 à 16 mois, ce qui est quand même absolument appréciable. S'il ne semble donc guère possible pour la Cour de réduire de manière drastique ses délais, euh, elle s'attache cependant à les maintenir. Pour ce faire, la Cour a d'une part procédé à un certain nombre d'aménagements dans ses procédures afin d'éviter que des affaires qui ne soulèvent pas compte au fond des problématiques complexes monopolisent les ressources de la Cour, notamment des cabinets et des services de la traduction. Ainsi, la Cour peut traiter certaines affaires par voie d'ordonnance. Il y a par exemple les ordonnances spécifiques permettant à la Cour de ne pas avoir à se prononcer sur le fond de l'affaire et à délester un certain nombre de services, notamment la traduction. Ceci est lorsque un, un, un renvoi est manifestement irrecevable ou manifestement ou un pourvoi manifestement euh, non fondé. Il y a aussi, en ce qui concerne les pourvois contre des arrêts de la Cour, une procédure d'admission spéciale concernant des affaires dans lesquelles le tribunal a été précédé par une chambre de recours indépendante d'un de quatre offices et agences de l'Union expressément mentionnés. Il y a aussi, et ça c'est encore plus important, les ordonnances spécifiques permettant à la Cour de se prononcer sur le fond de l'affaire de manière plus concise et rapide. Un des moyens dont dispose la Cour pour prêter plus rapidement un renvoi préjudiciel et le plus souvent sans notification de la décision de renvoi est de statuer sur proposition du juge rapporteur l'avocat général entendu par voie d'ordonnance motivée, notamment quand il s'agit d'appliquer une disposition du droit de l'Union déjà interprétée par la jurisprudence. Ceci s'appelle la procédure 99 selon l'article 99 du règlement de procédure et concerne les affaires euh, où la Cour a déjà statué sur une question ou lorsque la réponse peut être clairement déduite de la jurisprudence ou euh, des textes soumis. En vue de maintenir ces délais de traitement, la Cour a d'autre part prévu des procédures spéciales lui permettant de traiter plus rapidement certaines affaires. Alors, ces procédures rapides spéciales sont d'une part les procédures dites prioritaires et accélérées, sur lesquelles je ne m'étendrai pas, mais ces procédures euh, concernent euh, toutes les sortes d'affaires, et pas seulement les affaires de l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice, et d'ailleurs, quelquefois, des affaires euh, pénales qui ne peuvent pas être soumises 
à une procédure PPU sont néanmoins soumises à une procédure euh, prioritaire ou accélérée. Mais surtout, et je terminerai sur cette procédure, c'est la procédure préjudicielle d'urgence PPU qui constitue l'avancée la plus spectaculaire en matière de procédure euh, rapide parce qu'elle permet un traitement extrêmement rapide des renvois préjudiciels. Alors, les caractéristiques essentielles de cette procédure sont de deux sortes. Premièrement, il y a une distinction entre les différents acteurs de la procédure. Seules les parties au litige au principal, l'État membre dont relève la juridiction de renvoi et la Commission, le cas échéant aussi le Conseil, voire le Parlement, sont en principe autorisés à présenter des observations écrites. Les autres intéressés sont uniquement invités à participer à l'audience, dont la tenue est cependant obligatoire. Deuxièmement, la différenciation dans la procédure interne à la Cour chaque année, la Cour nomme pour la période allant d'octobre à octobre deux chambres, parmi ces cinq chambres à cinq juges, qui sont chargées de traiter les affaires soumises à la PPU. Ces chambres assurent une permanence constante, même pendant les semaines blanches, où ces chambres peuvent même euh, travailler par voie euh, de visioconférence, euh, si on se trouve par exemple au mois d'août, euh, et traite ces affaires en priorité absolue, tout en continuant à travailler sur toutes les autres affaires leur soumises. Si après sa mise en place en 2008, la PPU n'a été sollicitée par les juridictions nationales que de façon parcimonieuse, elle est dorénavant devenue très populaire. La raison de ce succès s'explique, à mon avis, en grande partie par le fait que les juridictions nationales ont compris qu'il était dans leur propre intérêt d'enclencher cette procédure, en ce qu'elle leur permet de statuer dans des, dans des délais relativement courts, malgré le fait que la saisine de la Cour entraîne automatiquement la suspension de la procédure nationale pendant devant la juridiction. Il faut d'ailleurs souligner que cet engouement des juridictions nationales à solliciter l'enclenchement de la PPU n'est pas toujours justifié puisque sur les 162 demandes qui ont été pr présentées jusqu'au 31 décembre 2021, seules 83 ont effectivement été soumises à cette procédure, d'autres à d'autres procédures. J'en profite pour énumérer les raisons pour lesquelles la Cour peut refuser d'enclencher la PPU, qui sont de trois sortes. Premièrement, l'affaire échappe au champ d'application rationnel et matériel. Seules sont admissibles à cette procédure les affaires concernant les domaines visés au titre 5, la troisième partie du TFU, relatif à l'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice. Deuxièmement, l'absence d'urgence. Seules les affaires dans lesquelles la réponse aux questions posées par la juridiction de renvoi est susceptible d'influer sur la détention ou la privation de liberté d'une personne, ou dans lesquelles une procédure trop longue risque de nuire à la relation de l'enfant avec l'un de ses parents, ou à son intégration dans son environnement social et familial, peuvent être soumises à cette procédure. Troisième, dans des cas plus particuliers, où les conditions précédentes sont certes remplies, la Cour peut cependant décider de soumettre l'affaire à une procédure prioritaire ou accélérée pour bénéficier d'une procédure et d'un examen plus complet, comme par exemple dans l'affaire Aragnosi, qui cependant a été couplée à l'affaire Caldararu, qui était une affaire PPU. Il est possible, au regard des statistiques relatives à l'année 2021, dont il ressort que la durée moyenne de la procédure PPU était de 3,7 mois, d'affirmer que la Cour a pleinement répondu au vœu des chefs d'État et de gouvernement de 2004 de traiter, je cite, « rapidement et correctement » les questions d'urgence qui lui sont soumises en matière d'espace de liberté, de sécurité et de justice. On peut d'ailleurs se féliciter que cette efficacité ne soit pas faite au détriment de la qualité, puisque de nombreuses affaires PPU se sont révélées extrêmement importantes pour le développement du droit de l'Union en général. Je n'ai qu'à citer de nombreuses affaires de mandat d'arrêt européen où la Cour a avant tout, euh, avant tout euh, cimenté le rôle de pierre angulaire du mandat d'arrêt européen en tant que procédure rapide, simple, de confiance mutuelle entre les juridictions nationales comme principe, qui ne souffre que des exceptions très précises, mais parmi ces exceptions, euh, la Cour a quand même justifié au fur et à mesure la protection de droits fondamentaux, euh, notamment quand également 
l'indépendance de la justice. Et d'ailleurs, la Cour a aussi, dans un certain nombre d'arrêts, précisé la notion d'indépendance du procureur national, non pas en tant que tel, mais en tant qu'autorité d'émission d'un mandat d'arrêt au peur. Ceci m'amène à ma conclusion où je dirais que les changements d'ores et déjà opérés par la Cour durant les dernières années démontrent, à mon avis, que celle-ci sait faire preuve d'une grande capacité d'adaptation et est toujours prête à répondre aux défis que l'avenir lui réserve, même si cela implique, le cas échéant, de modifier ses procédures, sa composition ou encore la répartition de ses compétences entre différents organes qui la composent. La Cour est donc prête pour les affaires concernant le parquet européen. Ce qu'il nous faut, ce sont des renvois préjudiciels intéressants. Bien sûr, cela dépend des juridictions nationales. Mais, cher Vania, mm -hmm. il importe aussi que les avocats amènent les juridictions nationales à nous soumettre les bons renvois préjudiciels qui nous amèneront à créer également une jurisprudence cohérente sur l'application et l'interprétation du règlement sur le parquet européen. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Un tout, tout grand merci, monsieur euh, le juge, pour, euh, pour votre exposé, de nous avoir, entre autres, rappelé tous les mécanismes, tous les outils euh, dont s'est équipée équipé la Cour de justice euh, pour être prête à recevoir donc, ces affaires qui lui seront soumises. Merci aussi, évidemment, pour votre appel euh, au dialogue avec euh, les juridictions euh, nationales. Euh, donc, il est maintenant 17h22, donc nous avons 8 minutes... Je propose qu'on prenne huit minutes euh, pour ne pas trop être trop en retard. Donc, so eight minutes for questions to our speakers. So I see one question here in front of me, please. You have to, yeah. Bon après-midi. Je vais essayer de parler en français. Si j'ai commis des fautes, je demande pardon en avance. Donc, ma question, c'est pour M. le juge Blinchan, Mme Vania Costa-Ramos, si je peux, parce qu'en écoutant vos deux euh, expositions, euh, je, me suis, je me suis posé une question que c'est comme ça. Euh, le mandat d'arrêt européen, euh, il a permis de euh, commencer à regarder les droits euh, des personnes qui ont été euh, convictées. Euh, donc, il y a aussi les, les droits dans, euh, dans les prisons, euh, dans les cas des de mandats d'arrêt européen. Donc, je me demandais si dans les cas du parquet européen, quand une personne sera convictée, euh, il sera convicté euh, euh, sur la base des de droits européens. Donc, euh, même si, sa personne, si cette personne euh, ne doit pas changer de pays. Euh, ces droits qui ont été développés euh, avec les mandats d'arrêt européen pourraient euh, s'appliquer aussi dans un cas qui reste national. national. Merci. Allez-y. Okay. 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 I can try. <laughs> So, uh, if, I, if I understood the question, um, the question is whether the case law developed by the Court of Justice in the field of uh, European arrest warrant would apply in domestic cases if, if the EBVO case is a, a merely domestic case. Uh, I think it's difficult to, to just uh, re reply yes or no. So, so uh, the, the, in EPPO proceedings as such, EU law is applicable. We are in the field of application of EU law, so the charter, the regulation will, will be applicable. And uh, therefore making, uh, let's say, the acquis of EU law applicable. So uh, even if some of the details of European arrest warrant may not be relevant in, in um, domestic cases, some others may become quite relevant. I think we had 
maybe one example today um, referring to EIO and also there is a lot of case law in EAW proceedings about the right to a access to a court in the case of detention, for example, uh, that a person must have a, 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 um, the possibility to challenge the detention before a court uh, and the remedy must entail an analysis of legality, proportionality, etc. So, uh, in principle, we assume that all, all uh, uh, member states would have such a remedy in place, but that might not be the case. In a case like that, for example, I could imagine that the whole, uh, you know, the, the acquis of this case law could, could become applicable in domestic cases, but uh, it, it has to be, I think it's not uh, um, uh, yes or no? <laughs> so, yes, it could, depending on the case. <laughs> yes, it could, depending on the case. Um, I just come back to the two conditions. First, first, the relevant case must fall under Title V, Title V of uh, the treaty, so uh, the, the, the space of uh, liberty, uh, security, uh, freedom, freedom, security, and justice. So that is, that, that is the, the first answer to your question. Uh, and then comes the second, the second answer is, is there some urgency? Of course, if there is detention, often there is urgency. The detention itself does not say that it's urgency. What is the urgency is the decision on continuing detention or not continuing detention. So that is a general answer, and it depends, uh, uh, as said my colleague, it, it depends on every, every, um, every case submitted to the court. For the time being, half of the PPUs uh, uh, were, uh, in, were um, intended to questions on criminal law, half of the, the PPUs. So, the other half was on other questions, but all, always questions falling under the treaty, uh, the, 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 the articles of the treaty concerning the uh, space of uh, f freedom, uh, security, uh, and justice. So, and of course, um, when, when the national judge asks for a PPU, this question is automatically referred to one of the two chambers, PPU. And this chamber, in a very rapid procedure, decides whether or not there will be PPU or not. But all, always when the judge, national judge, thinks that there is uh, a necessity to have PPU, it will be uh, transferred to this chamber. If uh, this chamber decides there's not PPU, normally the chamber continues treating uh, this uh, preliminary ruling, but on other basis. Sometimes, sometimes, however, Aranyosi Calderaro, for instance, or some other recent cases uh, concerning uh, arrest warrants uh, emitted from Poland, were, um, uh, were transferred to the Grand Chamber. Thank you very much. So we have our two last questions, please. And then one other question of Vanya. So, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, congratulations for your presentations. I, I, ha I have one question in relation to the, the issue of the, well, the relevant case to be referred to the European Court of Justice. And this question is, is in relation to the, uh, the competent authority, who is uh, entitled refer these uh, questions to the uh, European Court of Justice. Um, I am thinking in particular in, uh, in the case of disagreement. Uh, as you already know, uh, when the case of disagreement is between uh, the European prosecutor and a national prosecutor, uh, the general uh, uh, prosecutor is, uh, prosecutor general is uh, the one is the authority who decide in accordance to Article 25, Paragraph 6, and in the case of Spain, it is clear that the Prosecutor General has already decided in a, in a concrete case. And as far as I know, 
there is, there is a need to have a, a context of a, a jurisdictional a level because a judge is, is, the, is the authority, the national authority entitled to refer the case to the European Court of Justice. I don't know if this is an open issue or uh, we can discuss about this or there is any possibility for the Prosecutor General to uh, submit or to refer these questions to the uh, European Court of Justice. In, in the case that this is not a possibility, uh, I have a, a second question, and this question is how can the European prosecutor uh, trigger these uh, uh, proceedings, uh, this process, sorry, and um, uh, how can the, uh, the European prosecutor provoke uh, or submit questions before the uh, national court in order to have this referral of the case uh, towards the European Court of Justice? Thank you so much. Yes, I will start and maybe the colleagues can uh, continue. So, first, as um, it was said before, um, there was huge discussion about the competence of the court. And in the first draft, there was no competence of the court. And now we have this Article 42, which replace somehow uh, Article 267. Nevertheless, we have to refer to a paragraph 2 of Article um, 40, uh, 42, who refers explicitly to Article 267 for the preliminary rulings. And it's very clear, only a court, and uh, the Court of Justice has developed uh, a huge, a huge um, jurisprudence about uh, what is a court and what is not a court, only a court can submit uh, a preliminary ruling. I will, oh, I, I, will, uh, I will give you some, some, uh, some information about the faculties and the obligations of the national courts, which is very important, because each court, each court, each national court is in fact the first instant European court because of effectivity and because of primacy. And that is what is um, written in paragraph one of Article uh, 42. So the national court can decide on itself that European law is applicable if it thinks that the European law is clear. I think that uh, for, for the time being there will be a lot of preliminary rulings because we have no jurisprudence about uh, the, the, the regulation. But, and, uh, so the national, the national judge can refer, but if it is a national judge of, uh, of uh, last instance, he has to refer. And in a very recent, in a very recent case law, which we call SILFIT II, which is, which is called Consorti, et cetera, we have given some informations to the national Supreme Courts uh, what they have to do when they will not refer. So if they do not want to refer, they have to motivate their decision not to refer. So I think the national courts will be eager or sometimes will be obliged to refer. Of course, it depends on how the national court is feed, uh, fed, uh, nourri uh, by, uh, by the different parties at the instance uh, to uh, put forward a question uh, to, uh, to the Court of Justice. And that will be interesting to see uh, how it will be managed. And I cannot give you this answer to that question. Thank you very much. And Vanya? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Uh, I had a, a thank you and a question. A thank you is to the incitement for lawyers to, to try to provoke uh, the intervention of the Court of Justice. I think uh, maybe not all of the lawyers, but some are well aware of that, uh, that importance. I, I interrupt you. I often said, say to when lawyers come to the Court of Justice, that never forget Mr. Bosman. <laughs> yes. Never was very rich playing football. 
but the one who got rich was his lawyer. His lawyer. <laughs> well, in criminal cases, that might not always be the case, but <laughs> depends on, on the regulations on legal aid and how to pay lawyers via frozen assets, for example. Um, let's, let's see, but uh, my question is the following is, just to see how, how sometimes in practice it is, uh, so it, it, this must be a collective effort, a collective effort of the PP European Public Prosecutor, of the national courts, which are the main actor in this field, and of the defense lawyers. But often defense lawyers cannot do anything because, for example, if the EPPO decides to submit to the court the issue whether do I need ex ante judicial authorization in the handling member state uh, for a search, at this moment the accused does not know that the prosecutor wants to have that search in principle, so he will have no standing or any, any impact in the discussion uh, of this case. The second one is uh, and, uh, uh, that often, and I think this is uh, why uh, we need uh, EU regulation on some standards for remedies, for example, I can say from my practice, uh, in Petruhin situations where the Court of Nationality refuses to issue an EAW, uh, but opens a case, and then the uh, person has no access to a court to challenge the decision of the prosecutor not to issue an EAW. Well, if they would issue an EAW, they could challenge the, uh, that decision, but not the non-issuance of, of the EAW, for example. So. I, there are certain areas where it is, of course, we, we, uh, lawyers have to be active and have to push it, but uh, uh, there must be also procedures in place to allow the lawyers to, to do so. So I hope that comes about. <laughs> and Thank my, you. Oh, you had a question. So my question was, in this Austrian case, yeah. is, the, is the accused involved <laughs> in the discussion or not? in the first referral. <laughs> Is he represented? So I don't know. I have <laughs> the... Um so thank you very, very much to uh, our three panelists. Uh, so this closes the last panel of, uh, of the day. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I will now um, invite Professor John Vorvalo to present uh, the conclusions of this uh, conference. So of course, uh, John does not need to be uh, introduced. Everyone uh, knows him uh, quite well. Uh, but as you know, John is professor in uh, Utrecht University and also at the College of Europe in, uh, in Bruges. Uh, he published, of course, extensively on the uh, EPO, on all aspects of, uh, of uh, EPO. Um, and as was previously mentioned uh, already earlier uh, this morning, I think, he is one of the main founding fathers and mothers of this uh, of of this uh, EPO. Um, he indeed co-directed uh, the 2000 Corpus Juris together with uh, Professor um, Mireille Delmas-Marty. So hence he is, of course, particularly well placed to well, conclude this work and this uh, conference. So please, John, we listen to you. Un grand merci, Anne, pour l'intro. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I look around in this incredible hemicycle and I see so many of you around, so I admire your passion and your patience uh, at, this, uh, at this hour. And this is certainly due to the excellent organization, bravo, Catalin and Panos, and of course to the high quality of all the speakers. Uh, that's also the reason why, uh, in my concluding remarks, I will not clarify or summarize presentations. There is no need for that. So I, was, I will just highlight, I would say, some main features of what we have been listening today and of the, let's say, the, the challenges towards the future. I've heard that the establishment of the EPO is a turning point. A turning point in European integration. The Minister uh, of, Luxem of Justice of Luxembourg said, Nous avons franchi une étape fondamentale et historique. Uh, and indeed, we can say, I think, that uh, 
after 30 years of discussions, not only in the academia, but also in the political arena, uh, I remember the discussions on the necessity of the EPO, the discussions on the insertion of a legal basis into the treaty. Uh, some of, of us remember the Laken Declaration at the time. So, so many discussions, you could say that it is a small miracle that it came, that it came to life. And it's, a, of course, a very happy, a very fortunate miracle. But the negotiations on the proposal, um, someone called it a genuine adventure, <laughs> the whole negotiations were very intensive and also at some points very difficult. Of course, that comes also with a political compromise. And that, I think, is the content uh, of the regulation. That is also reflecting, I think it's very normal, a certain, I would say, power struggle between federalism, the word is taboo, I know, but also, of course, uh, with the member states, and certainly in this, in this very national area, that want too much as possible uh, keep control over investigative and prosecutorial functions in criminal matters. Uh, it reflects a little bit, uh, the, the French has a beautiful word for that, for that le pouvoir régalien de l'état souverain. So that's of course, that's old fashioned in the European integration model, but it, of course it's a power struggle that is present. The regulatory frame is there, the regulation is adopted. Most of the member states have of course also in place uh, I call it still implementation laws between brackets because there was a lot of work to do at the national level, formerly their adaptation laws. Um, and we have uh, now the EPO uh, operational for one year with a quite impressive uh, uh, record, I would say, of cases and also, of course, of activities and also already of results. To quote a little bit the European Court of Human Rights, the Human Court of Human Rights is saying the Convention, the European Convention of Human Rights is a living instrument. And I would say the EPO is a living body. Uh, and I, I will explain you in a second. And the regulatory framework, both European and national, is also a living instrument. Why do I say this? A lot of things are happening, maybe much faster than we ever would have thought. Um, the Commission has launched a study on the assessment of the implementations law in the member states and have indicated in the study already quite some important points of consideration, if I may say. So risks of undermining the objectives and the aims of uh, the whole setting up of the body, the possible uh, added value, and of course the, uh, the aims of uh, effective enforcement in that area. Second, um, we know this has been discussed also today, uh, the college has been very active in uh, the, the EPO College in elaborating, of course, internal rules, internal rules of a procedure, but also guidelines, as we have seen, including recent guidelines on the famous Article 31 and the cross-border cooperation. So there you see also that things are moving. Uh, third, the EPO uh, has flagged, I would say, in a letter to the member states and to the Commission, a series of problems related to the content of the regulation uh, and has asked for what has been called a quick fix. <laughs> that of course will be debate uh, uh, in, in the political arena, but that shows also that uh, the EPO on the ground, working on the files, is discovering, and once again I think it's a very, very natural process, problems that are related to the uh, political compromise in, in, in the regulation. Um, there has been, that also has been mentioned, uh, infringement cases prepared for the courts on the uh, lack of implementation or bad implementation by the member states and of course also in the last session uh, there are uh, preliminary rulings uh, coming up. Uh, the first one is only I think the, <laughs> the first flagging of a whole series of cases that will come. So that's what I call a living instrument and a living body. It's a very dynamic process. So it's just not me that we make a photo and that's what it was today. No, this is really moving very fast and very fascinating from the point of view of, of uh, justice integration, from the point of view of effective enforcement, and also from the point of view of interaction between the European and national level. 
When it comes to the challenges, the title, of course, is Towards Resolving Complexity and uh, Bringing Added Value. I think the complexity, I think it's very normal that, uh, that this is complex. Uh, why? Because this is a no it's a complete novelty, what we have here in place. And the first real operational judicial supranational organ uh, embedded also in the national uh, jurisdiction. So that, of course, creates novel problems and, 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 and complexity. The first thing I would like to say about the challenges, I have not heard, at least not today, a lot of discussions on the necessity or the needs. With this, that discussion we had a lot in the past. So I think it's important to underline that. Um, we all know that just to, when we look at the, uh, the income side of the budget, think about the VAT carousels, that there is a high uh, need to intervene at that level with other solutions than the solutions we had in the classic horizontal cooperation. I'm also quite, uh, personally, I'm quite um, confident that there is a great necessity when it comes to the expenditure side. If you look at the recovery and resilience facilities, so the future generation programs and subsidies uh, linked to the green transition, the digital transformation, the, the health and the social cohesion, and so on and so on, of course there will be many problems of abuse. Uh, in the procurement area, in the subsidies area. So the need will only there increase, in my opinion. Second point, when it comes to the design as such, I think, of course, and it's also very natural, one of the big tensions is between the supranational level and the embeddedment in the national legal orders. I haven't heard today, rightly so, or maybe the problems are not visible yet, but I have not heard discussions or doubts about the design of the central office. You know, the central office has become quite complex with many uh, uh, organs, I would say, but I have not heard any criticism or uh, challenges on that point. So most of the discussions are about the relationship between the central office and uh, the national level, and then especially, uh, of course, a lot on the position of the EDPs uh, related to their capacity to perform, related to their independence, and, and, and so on and so on. And here I would say member states still have to consider a lot of things, because when we look at other areas of, in, of supranational investigations, and I'm referring here mostly to the market regulatory authorities with law enforcement powers. Uh, think about the uh, DG competition, think about the European Central Bank, think about ESMA. Um, there the member states, not always <clears throat> with great uh, enthusiasm, but at least they have accepted that central offices are performing or investigating administrative irregularities and imposing administrative sanctions while doing also the job in the national jurisdictions, applying European law. When we come to the judicial area, <laughs> that's another story. And you see clearly that in the regulation, member states have tried to bring it down as much as possible to the national territory, to the national applicable law, setting aside the single legal area. So it's a very different position. And uh, you could say, yeah, in the criminal matters, it's about punitive sanctioning, but also in the administrative area, it's a lot about punitive sanctioning. So why this tremendous difference? By the way, the negotiations on the, uh, the anti-money laundering authority, which of course is a little bit different, but there you see that uh, at least when it comes to the European powers of the new authority, it would be in a regulation. Um, on the European level. So also there you see that it goes in the line, of course the negotiations still have to start really on, on the content, but it goes in the line of the, of the ECB, ESMA, et cetera, et cetera, and not in the line of the EPO. So the EPO is a rare, it's a strange animal in that sense when you compare. And this shows the sensitivities of the member states when it comes to that area. My second point on that is that I have heard a lot about the EDPs and their position. But of course, there are a lot of other authorities at the national level that have responsibilities in relation to the EPO. I would call it the chain of command, if I may say. Uh, all, the, all the other judicial authorities, 
also quite a lot of administrative authorities that are active in this field. Think about customs, think about tax authorities, etc., etc. Strange enough, I haven't have heard anything, uh, at least today, on that. Personally, I would be astonished that there are no problems there so on steering the, cha the chain. But that's uh, just, uh, <laughs> I'm just flagging that point. Um, I think the second block of of issues and challenges is certainly on, it has been insisted, that a lot of speakers have insisted on that, on the need for legal certainty and clarity and consistency on the applicable law. And I think that's very important for the, let's say, for the effective enforcement, but also for the due process, uh, for the application of fundamental rights, both, uh, on the, both, both sides of the coin. This has to do with the substantive law, and it has to do, of course, with the procedural law. The substantive law, mm, I think here we have, we have quite some issues. Of course, one is related to the form that has been chosen, the directive. That's also, it's an astonishing choice. I don't think that this will change in the very near future, maybe in the discussions of 2025. But of course, it has a lot of consequences when it comes to the applicable law, as it is to a harmonization process by the member states. So that's a, a political choice that, uh, that has to be maybe considered again in 2025. This, of course, is related to then the interpretation of the offenses, uh, the hardcore, the connected, the intrinsically linked, and all this type of stuff. Um, there is also, we have not been discussing that today, but of course, there is, uh, we know that there is some pressure, political pressure, coming from the Commission and coming from some member states about the scope of offences. Uh, so would it be, must it be limited to PIF, PIF plus or PIF non plus, uh, or also to other transnational uh, crime in the area of freedom, security and justice. Uh, this, com this of course will come up again for sure, and it's also related to the, uh, I would say to the added value of the EPO in the PIF area, to the extent that they're able to show that they're performing, of course this discussion will become more important. Second, um, the procedural law. I've heard a lot of discussions today on the uh, investigative powers, but not on the investigative powers as such. That's also maybe astonishing because uh, we know, of course, that in the Commission proposal that there was at least a harmonization of the a set of the investigative powers. They disappeared. So now they depend uh, to a large extent with some exceptions uh, um, on, on the national applicable law. I haven't heard any, any um, criticism on that choice in the sense that there would be a lack of investigative measures uh, at the national level. Or that there would be uh, an unequal playing field between them. Personally, I have my doubts on that, but at least it was not mentioned. So the main, the main focus was on the related procedural safeguards. Uh, which can be safeguards uh, at the national level. It can be, of course, procedural uh, safeguards related to coercive measures. It can be a lack of remedies. And, of course, also in the cross-border cooperation, I come back to that. So let's say that the rights of the suspects related to this, uh, the use of the investigative measures. What has not been discussed, and I think it's obvious because it was not in the program, that I look a little bit at the organizers, um, is the choice of jurisdiction. <laughs> So the forum choice. Uh, this, I think, will uh, also in the coming years uh, be a very important topic uh, for challenges, because we know that, uh, that, of course, there is a construction in the relation uh, in the regulation uh, to keep it as national as possible, and that also, also means that the remedies uh, uh, has to be used at the national level, and the, the, the national courts are really put there in a very difficult position when they have to decide about not if they are competent, have jurisdiction or not, but who would be the most appropriate jurisdiction in the area of freedom, security and justice. So I think that is really that a challenge, but uh, I will not criticize the, the, the speakers uh, for that because that was not a topic on the conference. My last point on the procedural side um, is on the, uh, the evidence issues. It is very clearly that uh, with a lack of harmonization of the investigative measures, and, and a lack of harmonization in the field of evidence, at least very limited uh, in, in the regulation, 
that uh, this topic will, uh, will of course, uh, be on the, on the table, on the plate of the national courts. Uh, and that, at a certain extent, also this will arrive um, <laughs> through the left or the right side at, at, at the Court of Justice. Uh, let's hope that, meanwhile, um, there is some progress on the harmonization side, uh, based on, at least based on Article 82. I know that the Commission is, uh, is preparing something, in, in, <laughs> but uh, I think there is a strong need there because uh, the problems, uh, of course, will, uh, will pop up. A couple of words on the cross-border cooperation. I think that's, uh, and it also has been very clear today, that's a very tricky one. Um, because I would say personally, if you set up an EPO regime, um, it should go beyond the existing forms of cooperation when it comes to effective enforcement. So it would be strange that it is something like a, a, a joint investigation team or that it would be just the same as the mutual, uh, as the mutual uh, recognition instruments like the EIO or something like that. It should go beyond that. Of course, going beyond that in a sui generis system that is laid down in the regulation, which is very informal and very unclear in legal terms, both, let's say, for the, for the, in, for the uh, prosecutors, but also certainly for the, uh, for, the, for the suspects, that is, of course, that's an open box. And, um, I'm referring back to the, uh, to the guidelines of the college on Article 31 and the motivation to come in. It's quite, yeah, reading that the college is saying we have here a double problem. We have the problem of having a system of cooperation that is lower than the level of the EAO, of the European Investigation Order, and at the same time we risk to violate uh, minimum safeguards that are imposed by the recent case law of the Court of Justice. Yeah, so that's at least, it's a strong appeal uh, to elaborate a system. It might be sui generis, but it gives more legal clarity for the enforcers and better protection, legal safeguards for those who are enforced. That's the least what I can say about it. So uh, there is certainly here a need to elaborate a more precise system. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I don't know, I haven't seen the letter uh, of the uh, EPO on the, on, the, on the quick fix of the regulation. So I don't know if this point is in, but I think uh, if it's not in, it will certainly uh, pop up also in the, in, the, in the near future. When it comes to the um, non-participating and third states, I would think the non-participating states, um, I think Fabio have said that very clearly also, there is a sincere cooperation obligation, there is the union loyalty, etc., etc. I think that's not the most difficult one. They just have to apply it. And if they don't, the commission can trigger, of course, uh, uh, procedures before the Court of Justice. I think the third states is, is much more complicated because in fact, here we have this novelty that we have a competent authority in judicial cooperation that is not belonging to the classic state structure. And that's, of course, completely new. Uh, and, and so it's a way of finding, be it directly recognizing the authority or through the member states, to bring them in, in the existing instruments with the, with the third states. Of course, it's not only limited to effective enforcement, so to recognize that they are a competent authority, let's say for letters, uh, robotry or things like that. But it's also, and that's related also to the external dimension and, uh, and the EU as a global actor when it comes to, um, to fundamental rights, it's also extending in that cooperation, of course, the fundamental rights side. Uh, this has to do with data protection, with flow of information, but also, of course, when they, are, when they would cooperate in letters robotry. So I would say it's not only expanding the sword of justice, but also the shield of justice. And that might be also problematic in these uh, negotiations with third states. Finally, um, but no, I still have two points and then, uh, and then I can conclude. Um, I would say it's very obvious, and I think that's also very clear from all the contributions today, that this effective enforcement goes together with due process and, uh, and application of all fundamental rights. 
And the lack of harmonization in the regulation in this uh, is, of course, a problem. Um, the example of the lack of remedies, the prescription of remedies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think also that this will come up through the agenda of the Court of Justice. And the Court of Justice will be obliged by the questions through the preliminary rulings to go further than what they have been doing today. And today they have, in fact, the transnational application of the Nibis and Idem clauses. That's very well elaborated. But when it comes to the classic, uh, let's say, rights uh, of the defense and the fair trial rights uh, related to 47 and 48 of the Charter, Still today, the, the case law is very, I would say, domestic of the Court of Justice. So this transnational dimension is not very visible yet. I think through the preliminary rulings, the Court of Justice will be obliged to consider that and to give full or more full effect to the transnational dimension of that. I also, I, I will finish with the Court of Justice. Why? Because today there has been a lot of appeal on the Court of Justice, even by the Apple. <laughs> that's quite astonishing. So asking, praying for legal clarity. So that's in fact also saying to the legislator, you left us alone. Uh, at the same time, the legislator has limited the possibilities of the court to come in. And the legal presumption that many decisions of the EPO are national decisions and that you have to challenge them before national courts is, of course, a limitation to the Court of Justice. Of course, the court and also the preliminary rulings have been limited when it comes to the content in the regulation. Nevertheless, uh, it's quite sure that uh, the Court of Justice will be asked to, um, to rule in the, in the context that they're able to, to be asked. And, and we know that, of course, the Court of Justice, seeing the tradition of the Court of Justice as the guardian of the treaty, uh, will come in and, and will come up, of course, with very interesting rulings. So I have no doubt on that. The questions that I have heard today is about the interpretation of the substantive law, or competence issues, uh, supranational national. I'm sure choice of jurisdiction, not directly, but will come up for sure. And then, of course, the application of the fundamental rights uh, related to, to many decisions of the EPO being at the uh, supranational or transnational, uh, what I say, the transnational dimension of the, of the fair trial rights. Last words, ladies and gentlemen, I'm quite sure that also in the coming years, EPO will remain a gold mine. Uh, for justice integration in the area of freedom, security, and justice. And you can, can give that very different interpretations, of course. And I'm also quite sure that the added value of the EPO is not limited uh, to the field of uh, PIF. It's, uh, it's elaborating a, a, a judicial model uh, for effective enforcement in a transnational setting, as I said, including the SWORD function and including the SHIELD function, so the fundamental rights in our common area of freedom, security, and justice. And I would say to the organizers, it may be a good idea in the preparation of the evaluation of, in 2025, the official evaluation or assessment of the added value of the EPO, to have every year a conference like this one. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, John, for these very kind uh, concluding uh, words. We shall see how fast the living body is actually evolving, uh, and we will certainly organize more conferences in Luxembourg on the EPPO. But before we look to the next conference, we have still a next day of this conference. So I would like to conclude today's event by thanking to all of the chairs and the speakers and also the participants for the lively discussion and for being patient and staying 
with us during the whole day, as well as our online audience uh, for having accepted that sometimes uh, we were running a bit late in the panels. So thank you very much uh, for today, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the second day of the conference. Thank you very much.